The brilliant life of Royal Raymond Wright The history of medicine has always been the history of alternative medicine, for every new idea, every new theory, every new method of healing has come not from within the bastions of conventional medicine, but rather from outside the current convention. Being the hippopoto monstrosity that medicine is and always has been, its members do not like being told how to do their jobs by outsiders nor do they appreciate learning that something might exist beyond the scope of their education, which cost them dearly. Pasteur's idea that germs caused disease was ridiculed for years. Penicillin was actually discovered in the mid-1800s by a medical student, but because he was only a medical student it was written off as a curiosity. Even after its formal discovery, penicillin sat shelved four years before being tested. Dr. Semmelweis committed suicide in a mental institute after years of trying to get physicians to wash their hands after performing autopsies instead they ran down the hall to deliver a baby and kill the mother. And what about this guy by the name of Lawrence Burton? He wasn't a physician, but rather a scientist. In 1966, under the aegis of the American Cancer Society, he arranged for an audience of 70 scientists and some 200 science writers and performed for them a demonstration using mice with visible tumors. He injected each with a solution and in just 45 minutes the tumors had shrunk 50%. An hour and a half later, the tumors had practically disappeared. Newspapers around the world ran the story of Dr. Burton and his cancer cure on their front pages. Eight years later he opened a cancer clinic in New York where, for some cancers, he realized a better than 50% cure rate, higher than any other physician or clinic in America. Two years later, due to pressure from the FDA, he was forced to close his clinic and move his entire operation to the Commonwealth of the Bahamas where today he still has better rates of success with certain cancers, better than any other clinic in America. For the address and phone number, go here www.moeldeer.org web link of all of these stories about the frustrated efforts of alternative thinking winning its way into mainstream medicine, the most interesting and most terrifying is that of Dr. Royal Rife. You see, Dr. Rife had discovered a very inexpensive means of curing not only cancer, but some of the most dreaded diseases in society today such as the Ebola virus and AIDS. His research was destroyed, his associates harassed and some even killed, and after years of hounding he died of an overdose administered to him in Grossmont Hospital, in San Diego, California. Reif was probably one of the most brilliant not to mention persistent scientists ever to have walked upon this planet. He won 14 awards from the government for his research and was given an honorary medical degree from the University of Heidelberg. When the technology didn't exist, Reif invented it. Financed by millionaires like Henry Timken, Reif invented the universal microscope with 5,682 parts. It was a miraculous machine that could see things smaller than waves of light which was then and is still today thought to be impossible. Reif was the first to see a live virus. Today's electron microscopes see viruses, but they destroy them in the process through the bombardment of electrons. While examining bacteria and viruses, Reif noticed that each one gave off a distinct light or color pattern. In the late 60s it was discovered that every living cell actually gives off light and the healthier the cell the healthier the light. Conversely the sicker the cell the weaker the light. But this research by Reif was done in the 20s using technology Reif himself invented. So Reif began to experiment with instruments he invented that oscillated at the frequencies he determined from the organisms bacteria and viruses and he discovered that by playing back their own pattern of oscillation, slightly modified, he could destroy them without affecting the tissues around them. In other words, Reif could kill a particular virus or bacterium using light rays alone, light rays that were absolutely harmless to the host animal, but deadly to the microbe. Now comes the really interesting part of Reif's work, he discovered a virus that caused cancer. And he discovered a cure. Please accept this for a second until I can fill you in on a few things. There are many possible causes of cancer, from carcinogens to bacteria to viruses to parasites to even forms of light rays not visible to the naked eye. However, to prove that something is a cause of a disease, certain rules must be followed and these rules, originally set out and have been slightly modified today. Can there be more than one cause to a disease? Yes, 
if by following the rules you can prove two or more causes. Today there are those who feel that HIV is not the cause of AIDS simply because HIV has never been proven according to the rules to be the culprit. Rife proved, using Koch's theorem, that his virus caused cancer. And then he cured it. Rife named his human cancer virus Cryptocytes primordial's primordial hidden killer. He injected his virus into 400 lab animals creating 400 tumors. Then, using equipment he had painstakingly designed and tweaked, he exposed the diseased animals to a modified form of energy that was unique to the Cryptocytes primordial's virus, and destroyed all the tumors. You can read all about this in The Cancer Cure That Worked. Rife diligently worked for decades isolating patterns, modifying them, and playing them back killing microbes that caused disease. When Rife went public, the University of Southern California sponsored a special medical research team to evaluate this new therapy on the terminally ill. After 130 days, every patient recovered with no side effects to the treatment. The head of the AMA hopped a train from Chicago to visit Rife in San Diego. Pictures were taken, the story ended up on the front page of the San Diego Evening Tribune, Rife was on his way to a Nobel Prize in Medicine. Today you would be hard pressed to find any reference to Rife in history books. Contact a newspaper for a specific date or story and they will probably tell you that that one is missing from their archives. It is as if Rife and his work have been utterly expunged from the annals of history. His microscope did not exist. His instruments did not exist. His research did not exist. The man himself did not exist. The AMA wanted a cut. Drug companies pressed for more proof before allowing his instruments to be used. It seems that when a medical device wants FDA approval, each and every use must be evaluated at a cost of hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, keep in mind that Rife had built his microscope and instruments and had worked for decades studying and destroying microbes all before 1930. From 1934 to 1939 doctors all over America used the Rife machines to cure disease and all over America doctors were being pressured to stop this practice. Offices were broken into and their machines were confiscated. With the backing of the AMA an engineer working with Rife, filed suit against Rife, and this was the beginning of the end. The unending court battles wore Rife down, and the more depressed he got, the heavier he drank and then came the unexpected, the terrifying conclusion, his microscope was stolen and soon afterwards his laboratory went up in flames and his records and research burnt entirely. The Burnett Lab in New Jersey where Wright's work was being independently validated burned to the ground. Dr. Milbank Johnson, a supporter of Wright's and one of the people who had worked to validate Wright's research was poisoned. Dr. Neems who was duplicating Wright's work just 40 miles from Wright's own lab was killed in a mysterious fire that consumed his lab and research papers. Wright's closest associate was given a grant for $200,000 and quickly vanished. People who had worked with Rife suddenly denied knowing him. Rife sunk further and further into depression and alcoholism. By 1940, Rife's work had been wiped out entirely. Every time he tried to pull himself back on track to reduplicate his research, he was hounded and harassed and finally his life ended in a hospital by an overdose that was not self-administered. No one has yet been able to rebuild Rife's microscope. Many of Rife's associates have come forward in the past two decades, and some have re-engineered Rife's equipment for creating these light waves. The frequencies at which certain bacteria and viruses are killed are once again being compiled. However, without a powerful enough microscope and Rife's perspicacity and all the while battling the powers that be thriving drug companies backed by the power of the FDA it could take years to reduplicate Rife's work. Sadly, all work in this area today is performed underground. We do not have medical freedom in our Constitution or in the Bill of Rights. Go look. There is no guarantee of medical freedom. One person proposed that medical freedom be a right granted each citizen of these United States when the Bill of Rights was being written, but he was dismissed as some kind of a nut. Who would ever restrict medical freedom? There is a movement currently underfoot that would change all this. Talk to your representative in Washington about it. The new law would allow you to try, experimentally, any cure or instrument as long as it has been proven safe. In other words, 
If it doesn't cure you, it won't harm you. You won't go bald, upchuck every piece of food you chew, or peel away layers of skin. If it does no harm when properly applied or administered, then allow people to use it. Talk to someone. Talking is still your right. The Cancer Cure That Worked, 50 Years of Suppression by Decky and John C. Fox The Cancer Cure That Worked, 50 Years Suppression by Barry Lines with John Crane In 1934, Mr. Royal Life and his associates opened two small clinic in California and 16 cases of cancer. Sworn affidavits medical experts testified to the complete remission of hopeless cases within four to six weeks. Virtually every patient treated by Wright's frequency instrument as he called it was cured with no adverse side effects. Since that time millions of people have died from viruses that Mr. Reif convincingly destroyed over 50 years ago. Who was this man? What can his work teach us today, as we face the worldwide spread of AIDS? And why is this information being suppressed? A detailed account or Wright's inventions and discoveries is the subject of the cancer cure that worked. This startling book documents events from 1913 to the time of Wright's death in 1972. Reif was an optical engineer and technician of great skill. His first success was the building or the universal microscope in the late 1920s. With it he was able to view the living cancer virus a feat our modern high-powered electron microscope still cannot do. His microscope used many quartz prisms and one lenses placed to compensate for losses of refraction due to air. This enabled him to view far tinier particles than had ever been seen before. Although the biologists or his day were impressed with the power of this invention both the medical community and the optical physicists would have little to do with Rife. That there were no principles in physics to explain how the universal microscope worked was enough reason for them to reject Rife's ideas. What Rife saw, as did the other microbiologists who later used his instruments, was astounding and shook the established theories to their roots. The medical community at large, however, did its best to suppress the work or Rife and his co-workers and to harass them personally. Acceptance, however, was not what interested Rife. He could see what others would not. Using the universal microscope he observed cancer viruses as they changed their size and form. He discovered, that exposing a virus to certain frequencies of radio waves killed it quickly. Years or experimentation led to Wright's invention of the frequency instrument, a device that produced the exact frequencies needed to destroy various viruses. In 1934, at the clinic in California, diseased people were exposed to the exact same frequencies that had been seen through the microscope to destroy the virus causing their illness. Treatments lasted only three minutes. The person would wait three days before another exposure giving the lymph system time to cleanse the dead virus from their bodies. Unlike the chemotherapy treatments currently in use, Rife's therapy was 100% effective and engendered no adverse symptoms. Unfortunately the American Medical Association opposed the use or this incredible device. Physicians who defied this official stance and continued to use the frequency instrument had their licenses to practice medicine revoked. Individuals known to make use of the universal microscope had their equipment confiscated or destroyed. Yet, 53 years after the arrival of Wright's frequency instrument, hundreds of thousands or people still die each year of diseases he cured. What keeps us blinded? The onset of AIDS now threatens virtually the entire human life stream. Perhaps the time has come for individuals to look for new answers on the horizon and to temper our dependence on the authority of medical professionals. Reading the Cancer Cure Tie Worked is a good start. Its contents will profoundly affect you, and as you turn the final page, you will see your world anew. The book's three-page bibliography and numerous reproductions add punch to this already powerful story. It is not too technical, nor is it philosophical. Facts are well presented in a manner that intends to educate, not overwhelm the reader. The chapter on AIDS ties together Wright's ideas and today's theories especially the provocative relationship between cancer and AIDS. The ideas of Alan Cantwell, MD, one of the leading scientists in the forefront or AIDS research, are included here, supporting and updating Wright's work. To see Wright's work recreated with, today's sophisticated technology is the author's vision.
what modem integrated circuits and computer analysis could do to streamline and further improve the frequency instrument is a thrilling possibility. It is time to explore the horizon upon which Mr. Wright's cure for cancer floats like an illusion. By Decky and John C. Fox The background to the John Crane trial is told by Barry Lines by 1960. Crane had written and copyrighted a manual which explained how the frequency instrument was to be used in the experimental treatment of various diseases and on different parts of the body. By that year, 90 instruments were distributed for research and verification on notarized contracts. And then the medical authorities struck. They raided Crane's office, took over $40,000 in his machines, frequency instruments, and one large Rife ray tube instrument along with engineering data, research records and reports, pictures off the wall, private letters, invoices, tape recordings, and electronic parts all without a search warrant. They smashed all the research which had been put together over ten laborious years. As in 1939, they visited the doctors who were experimenting with the machines and forced them to abandon them. They also pressured ordinary citizens who had begun experimenting on a personal basis. These visits were made by teams of investigators. One woman was scared so bad that she has been in a sanitarium driven entirely out of her mind. Her husband cursed them out and told them to get off his property and has threatened to exterminate them should they return. His wife has undergone shock treatments and two months of hospitalization. The records and materials seized were not allowed to be used by Crane in his own defense during his trial. Roy Reif almost 73 and incapable of suffering the abuse of another trial at his age, went into hiding in Mexico. His deposition was not permitted to be introduced at the trial. Neither were the medical and scientific reports from the 1930s and 1940s. Nor were medical reports from Dr. Stafford in Ohio. Dr. Kush's letters were also declared inadmissible. No medical or scientific report which indicated the frequency instrument worked as represented was permitted to be introduced at the trial. Crane was left naked with only the patients who had been cured or helped. The trial was held in early 1961. After 24 days, and despite the testimony of 14 patients who told how the frequency instrument cured ailments and diseases which orthodox medicine could not alleviate, Crane was found guilty. The only medical opinion offered by the state of California came from Dr. Paul Shea who had been given a frequency instrument by the public health department for two months before the trial. Shea admitted he never tried the frequency instrument on anything or made any tests to evaluate it. He simply examined it and decided that it had no curative powers and didn't lend itself to investigative use. Also, and most disturbing, the foreman of the jury was an AMA doctor. Everyone else was carefully screened to see that they had no medical knowledge, no electronic knowledge, and didn't read any newspapers supporting alternative healing. The verdict was a foregone conclusion. Crane was sentenced to 10 years in jail. Following appeals, two of the three counts against Crane were reversed in the California Supreme Court because no specific criminal intent had been proven. But Crane still spent three years and one month in jail. The cure for cancer had been effectively suppressed again. During the trial, James Hannibal, age 76, testified. Blind in one eye, he'd been treated by the frequency instrument. After several applications, his cataract disappeared just as cataracts had dissolved in many of Dr. Milbank Johnson's patients during the 1935-37 clinics. Other witnesses at Crane's trial testified to the curing of chronic bladder irritation, and the elimination of a throat lump one-half of the size of an egg. Also cured were fungus growths on hands, fissures in the anus, pyorrhea, arthritis, ulcerated colon, varicose veins, prostate troubles, tumorous growth over eyes, colitis, pains in the back, and heart attacks. One man testified that for 17 years he had a growth the size of an egg on his spine. After treatment, it had disappeared. After Crane was imprisoned, so much pressure was put on Dr. Stafford in Ohio that he gave up medicine and became a salesman. Another doctor in Salt Lake City had his frequency instrument sabotaged and then was hounded by the Orthodox medical authorities to such an extent that he committed suicide. Such were the lengths to which the anti-Rife forces were willing to go in order to prevent the testing and use of this breakthrough technology. 
Barry Lyons Royal Raymond Rife edited by Jeff Rents July 2, 11 Rife's Universal Virus Microscope No. 3 Imagine, for a moment, that you have spent more than two decades in painfully laborious research, that you have discovered an incredibly simple, electronic approach to curing literally every disease on the planet caused by viruses and bacteria. Indeed, it is a discovery that would end the pain and suffering of countless millions and change life on Earth forever. Certainly, the medical world would rush to embrace you with every imaginable accolade and financial reward imaginable. You would think so, wouldn't you? Unfortunately, arguably the greatest medical genius in all recorded history suffered a fate literally the opposite of the foregoing logical scenario. In fact, the history of medicine is replete with stories of genius betrayed by backward thought and jealously, but most pathetically, by greed and money. In the 19th century, Semmelweis struggled mightily to convince surgeons that it was a good idea to sterilize their instruments and use sterile surgical procedures. Pasteur was ridiculed for years for his theory that germs could cause disease. Scores of other medical visionaries went through hell for simply challenging the medical status quo of day, including such legends as Röntgen and his X-rays, Morton for promoting the absurd idea of anesthesia, Harvey for his theory of the circulation of blood, and many others in recent decades including, W. F. Koch, Ravici, Brzezinski, Nessens, Priori, Livingston Wheeler, and Hoxie. Orthodox big money medicine resents and seeks to neutralize and or destroy those who challenge its beliefs. Often, the visionary who challenges it pays a heavy price for his heresy. So, you have just discovered a new therapy which can eradicate any microbial disease but, so far, you and your amazing cure aren't very popular. What do you do next? Well, certainly the research foundations and teaching institutions would welcome news of your astounding discovery. Won't they be thrilled to learn you have a cure for the very same diseases they are receiving hundreds of millions of dollars per year to investigate? Maybe not, if it means the end of the gravy train. These people have mortgages to pay and families to support. On second thought, forget the research foundations. Perhaps you should take your discovery to the pharmaceutical industry. Certainly it would be of great interest to those protectors of humanity, right? But remember, you have developed a universal cure which makes drugs obsolete, so the pharmaceutical industry just might be less than thrilled to hear about your work. In fact, the big shots might even make it certain that your human disease ending technology never sees the light of day, by preventing it from becoming licensed by the regulatory agencies. Now, assuming your amazing cure is an electronic instrument, the only cost of using it is electricity. And it is absolutely harmless to patients, who can recover without losing their hair, the family home, and their life savings. So, with your technology, there is no longer any reason for people with cancer to pay over $300,000 per patient, to become deathly ill from chemotherapy, radiation treatments, and the mutilation of surgery. It sounds like you won't find many friends and support among practicing oncologists, radiologists, and surgeons, doesn't it? You might try the hospitals and big clinics. But how thrilled are they going to be about a therapy administered in any doctor's office? Which reverses illness before the patient has to be hospitalized. Thanks to you, the staffs of these institutions will essentially be out of work. Well then, how about the insurance companies? Surely, they would be delighted to save the expense of hospitalization, at least the companies which haven't invested in hospitals, where the staff is now sitting around waiting for someone to break a leg or be in a car accident and the ones who don't lose policyholders as a result of your invention. And the companies which are trying to divest their pharmaceutical stock. Oh well, forget the insurance companies, too. It looks like you just might have a little problem with the medical establishment, no? Probably the only friends you'll have will be the patients and those progressive doctors who see change as an opportunity, rather than a threat to their established money-making monopoly. Those people will love you. But they don't call the shots. What follows, now, is the story of exactly such a sensational therapy and what happened to it. In one of the blackest episodes in recorded history, this remarkable electronic therapy was sabotaged and buried by a ruthless group of men. It has re-emerged in the underground medical alternative health world only since the mid-80s. 
This is the story of Royal Raymond Reif and his fabulous discoveries in electronic instruments. If you have never heard of Reif before, prepare to be angered and incredulous at what this great man achieved for all of us only to have it practically driven from the face of the planet. But, reserve your final judgment and decision until after you have read this. Of course, some may regard this as just an amusing piece of fiction. However, for those who are willing to do some investigating on their own, there will be mentioned several highly respected doctors and medical authorities who worked with Rife as well as some of the remarkable technical aspects of his creation. However, in the final analysis, the only real way to determine if such a revolutionary therapy exists is to experience it yourself. The medical literature is full of rigged double-blind clinical research tests, the results of which are often determined in advance by the vested corporate interests involved. If FDA and other regulatory and licensing procedures and guidelines are observed, it is your privilege to experiment with this harmless therapy. So let's now turn to the story of the most amazing medical pioneer of our century. Royal Raymond Reif was a brilliant scientist born in 1888 and died in 1971. After studying at Johns Hopkins, Reif developed technology which is still commonly used today in the fields of optics, electronics, radiochemistry, biochemistry, ballistics, and aviation. It is a fair statement that Reif practically developed bioelectric medicine himself. He received 14 major awards and honors and was given an honorary doctorate by the University of Heidelberg for his work. During the 66 years that Reif spent designing and building medical instruments, he worked for Zeiss Optics, the U.S. government, and several private benefactors. Most notable was millionaire Henry Timken, of Timken Roller Bearing fame. Because Reif was self-educated in so many different fields, he intuitively looked for his answers in areas beyond the rigid scientific structure of his day. He had mastered so many different disciplines that he literally had, at his intellectual disposal, the skills and knowledge of an entire team of scientists and technicians from a number of different scientific fields. So, whenever new technology was needed to perform a new task, Reif simply invented and then built it himself. Reif's inventions include a heterodyning ultraviolet microscope, a micro-dissector, and a micro-manipulator. When you thoroughly understand Reif's achievements, you may well decide that he has the most gifted, versatile, scientific mind in human history. By 1920, Reif had finished building the world's first virus microscope. By 1933, he had perfected that technology and had constructed the incredibly complex universal microscope, which had nearly 6,000 different parts and was capable of magnifying objects 60,000 times their normal size. With this incredible microscope, Wright became the first human being to actually see a live virus, and until quite recently, the universal microscope was the only one which was able to view live viruses. Modern electron microscopes instantly kill everything beneath them, viewing only the mummified remains and debris. What the Reif microscope can see is the bustling activity of living viruses as they change form to accommodate changes in environment, replicate rapidly in response to carcinogens, and transform normal cells into tumor cells. But how was Reif able to accomplish this, in an age when electronics and medicine were still just evolving? Here are a few technical details to placate the skeptics. Reif painstakingly identified the individual spectroscopic signature of each micro, using a slit spectroscope attachment. Then, he slowly rotated block quartz prisms to focus light of a single wavelength upon the microorganism he was examining. This wavelength was selected because it resonated with the spectroscopic signature frequency of the micro based on the now established fact that every molecule oscillates at its own distinct frequency. The atoms that come together to form a molecule are held together in that molecular configuration with a covalent energy bond which both emits and absorbs its own specific electromagnetic frequency. No two species of molecule have the same electromagnetic oscillations or energetic signature. Resonance amplifies light in the same way two ocean waves intensify each other when they merge together. The result of using a resonant wavelength is that microorganisms which are invisible in white light suddenly become visible in a brilliant flash of light when they are exposed to the color frequency that resonates with their own distinct spectroscopic signature. 
Reif was thus able to see these otherwise invisible organisms and watch them actively invading tissues cultures. Reif's discovery enabled him to view organisms that no one else could see with ordinary microscopes. More than 75% of the organisms Reif could see with his universal microscope are only visible with ultraviolet light. But ultraviolet light is outside the range of human vision, it is invisible to us. Wright's brilliance allowed him to overcome this limitation by heterodyning, a technique which became popular in early radio broadcasting. He illuminated the microbe usually a virus or bacteria with two different wavelengths of the same ultraviolet light frequency which resonated with the spectral signature of the microbe. These two wavelengths produced interference where they merged. This interference was, in effect, a third, longer wave which fell into the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. This was how Reif made invisible microbes visible without killing them, a feat which today's electron microscopes cannot duplicate. By this time, Reif was so far ahead of his colleagues of the 1930s that they could not comprehend what he was doing without actually traveling to San Diego to Reif's laboratory to look through his virus microscope for themselves and many did exactly that. One was Virginia Livingston. She eventually moved from New Jersey to Wright's Point Loma San Diego neighborhood and became a frequent visitor to his lab. Virginia Livingston is now often given the credit for identifying the organism which causes human cancer, beginning with research papers she began publishing in 1948. In reality, Royal Rife had identified the human cancer virus first. In 1920, Reif then made over 20,000 unsuccessful attempts to transform normal cells into tumor cells. He finally succeeded when he irradiated the cancer virus, passed it through a cell-catching ultra-fine porcelain filter, and injected it into lab animals. Not content to prove this virus would cause one tumor, Reif then created 400 tumors in succession from the same culture. He documented everything with film, photographs, and meticulous records. He named the cancer virus Cryptocytes primordiales. Virginia Livingston, in her papers, renamed it Progenitor Cryptocytes. Royal Rife was never even mentioned in her papers. In fact, Rife seldom got credit for his monumental discoveries. He was a quiet, unassuming scientist, dedicated to expanding his discoveries rather than to ambition, fame, and glory. His distaste for medical politics which he could afford to ignore thanks to generous trusts set up by private benefactors left him at a disadvantage later, when powerful forces attacked him. Coupled with the influence of the pharmaceutical industry in purging his papers from medical journals, it is hardly surprising that few have heard of Rife today. Meanwhile, debate raged between those who had seen viruses changing into different forms beneath Rife's microscopes, and those who had not. Those who condemned without investigation, such as the influential Dr. Thomas Rivers, claim these forms didn't exist. Because his microscope did not reveal them, Rivers argued that there was no logical basis for belief in this theory. The same argument is used today in evaluating many other alternative medical treatments. If there is no precedent, then it must not be valid. Nothing can convince a closed mind. Most had never actually looked though the San Diego microscopes. Air travel in the 1930s was uncomfortable, primitive, and rather risky. So, the debate about the life cycle of viruses was resolved in favor of those who never saw it even modern electron microscopes show frozen images, not the life cycle of viruses in process. Nevertheless, many scientists and doctors have since confirmed Reif's discovery of the cancer virus and its pleomorphic nature using dark field techniques, the Nessens microscope, and laboratory experiments. Reif also worked with the top scientists and doctors of his day who also confirmed or endorsed various areas of his work. They included, E. C. Rosenau, S. R. Longtime Chief of Bacteriology, Mayo Clinic, Arthur Kendall Director, Northwestern Medical School, Dr. George Duck internationally renowned, Alvin Ford famous pathologist, Rufus Klein Schmidt President of USC R.T. Hammer Superintendent, Paradise Valley Sanitarium Dr. Milbank Johnson Director of the Southern California AMA Waylon Morrison Chief Surgeon, Santa Fe Railway George Fisher Children's Hospital, NY 
Edward Kopp's Metabolic Clinic, La Jolla. Carl Meyer Hooper Foundation, SF. M. Zeit Chicago University. And many others. Reif ignored the debate, preferring to concentrate on refining his method of destroying these tiny killer viruses. He used the same principle to kill them, which made them visible, resonance. By increasing the intensity of a frequency which resonated naturally with these microbes, Reif increased their natural oscillations until they distorted and disintegrated from structural stresses. Reif called this frequency the mortal oscillatory rate, or MOR, and it did no harm whatsoever to the surrounding tissues. Today's Reif instruments use harmonics of the frequencies shown on the display screen. The wavelength of the actual frequency shown 770 Hz, 880 Hz, etc. is too long to do the job. This principle can be illustrated by using an intense musical note to shatter a wine glass, the molecules of the glass are already oscillating at some harmonic multiple of that musical note. They are in resonance with it. Because everything else has a different resonant frequency, nothing but the glass is destroyed. There are literally hundreds of trillions of different resonant frequencies, and every species and molecule has its very own. It took Reif many years, working 48 hours at a time, until he discovered the frequencies which specifically destroyed herpes, polio, spinal meningitis, tetanus, influenza, and an immense number of other dangerous disease organisms. In 1934, the University of Southern California appointed a special medical research committee to bring terminal cancer patients from Pasadena County Hospital to Rife's San Diego Laboratory and Clinic for treatment. The team included doctors and pathologists assigned to examine the patients, if still alive, in 90 days. After the 90 days of treatment, the committee concluded that 86.5% of the patients had been completely cured. The treatment was then adjusted and the remaining 13.5% of the patients also responded within the next four weeks. The total recovery rate using Reif's technology was 100%. On November 20, 1931, 44 of the nation's most respected medical authorities honored Royal Reif with a banquet billed as the end to all diseases at the Pasadena estate of Dr. Milbank Johnson. But by 1939, Almost all of these distinguishing doctors and scientists were denying that they had ever met Reif. What happened to make so many brilliant men have complete memory lapses? It seems that news of Reif's miracles with terminal patients had reached other ears. Remember our hypothetical question at the beginning of this report, what would happen if you discovered a cure for everything? You are now about to find out at first, a token attempt was made to buy out Reif. Moore's fish buying who had acquired the entire stock of the American Medical Association by 1934, sent an attorney to Rife with an offer you can't refuse. Rife refused. We many never know the exact terms of this offer. But we do know the terms of the offered Fishbein made to Harry Hoxie for control of his herbal cancer remedy. Fishbein's associates would receive all profits for nine years and Hoxie would receive nothing. Then, if they were satisfied that it worked, Hoxie would begin to receive 10% of the profits. Hoxie decided that he would rather continue to make all the profits himself. When Hoxie turned Fishbein down, Fishbein used his immensely powerful political connections to have Hoxie arrested 125 times in a period of 16 months. The charges based on practice without a license were always thrown out of court, but the harassment drove Hoxie insane. But Fishbein must have realized that this strategy would backfire with Rife. First, Rife could not be arrested like Coxy for practicing without a license. A trial on trumped-up charges would mean the testimony supporting Rife would be introduced by prominent medical authorities working with Rife. And the defense would undoubtedly take the opportunity to introduce evidence such as the 1934 medical study done with USC. The last thing in the world that the pharmaceutical industry wanted was a public trial about a painless therapy that cured 100% of the terminal cancer patients and cost nothing to use but a little electricity. It might give people the idea that they didn't need drugs. And finally, Reif had spent decades accumulating meticulous evidence of his work, including film and stop-motion photographs. No, different tactics were needed. The first incident was the gradual pilfering of components, photographs, film, and written records from Reif's lab. 
the culprit was never caught. Then, while Wright struggled to reproduce his missing data in a day when photocopies and computers were not available, someone vandalized his precious virus microscopes. Pieces of the 5,682-piece universal microscope were stolen. Earlier, an arson fire had destroyed the multi-million dollar Burnett Lab in New Jersey, just as the scientists there were preparing to announce confirmation of Wright's work. But the final blow came later, when police illegally confiscated the remainder of Wright's 50 years of research. Then in 1939, agents of a family which controlled the drug industry assisted Philip Wayland in a frivolous lawsuit against his own partners in the Beam Ray Corporation. This was the only company manufacturing Rife's frequency instruments Rife was not a partner. Hoyland lost, but his assisted legal assault had the desired effect, the company was bankrupted by legal expenses. And during the Great Depression, this meant that commercial production of Rife's frequency instruments ceased completely. And remember what a universal cure meant to hospitals and research foundations? Doctors who tried to defend Rife lost their foundation's grants and hospital privileges. On the other hand, big money was spent ensuring that doctors who had seen Rife's therapy would forget what they saw. Almost no price was too much to suppress it. Remember that, today, treatment of a single cancer patient averages over $300,000. It's big business. Thus, Arthur Kendall, the director of the Northwestern School of Medicine who worked with Rife on the cancer virus, accepted almost a quarter of a million dollars to suddenly retire in Mexico. That was an exorbitant amount of money in the Depression. Dr. George Dock, another prominent figure who collaborated with Reif, was silenced with an enormous grant, along with the highest honors the American Medical Association could bestow. Between the carrots and the sticks, everyone except Dr. Kush and Dr. Milbank Johnson gave up Reif's work and went back to prescribing drugs. To finish the job, the medical journals, support almost entirely by drug company revenues and controlled by the AMA, refused to publish any paper by anyone on Rife's therapy. Therefore, an entire generation of medical students graduated into practice without ever once hearing of Rife's breakthroughs in medicine. The magnitude of such an insane crime eclipses every mass murder in history. Cancer picks us off quietly but by 1960 the casualties from this tiny virus exceeded the carnage of all the wars America ever fought. In 1989, it was estimated that 40% of us will experience cancer at some time in our lives. In Rife's lifetime, he had witnessed the progress of civilization from horse and buggy travel to jet planes. In that same time, he saw the epidemic of cancer increase from 1 inch 24 Americans in 1905 to 1 inch 3 in 1971 when Rife died. He also witnessed the phenomenal growth of the American Cancer Society, the Salk Foundation, and many others collecting hundreds of millions of dollars for diseases that were cured long before in his own San Diego laboratories. In one period, 176,500 cancer drugs were submitted for approval. Any that showed favorable results in only one-sixth of one percent of the cases being studied could be licensed. Some of these drugs had a mortality rate of 14-17 percent. When death came from the drug, not the cancer, the case was recorded as a complete or partial remission because the patient didn't actually die from the cancer. In reality, it was a race to see which would kill the patient first, the drug or the disease. The inevitable conclusion reached by Reif was that his lifelong labor and discoveries had not only been ignored but probably would be buried with him. At that point, he ceased to produce much of anything and spent the last third of his life seeking oblivion in alcohol. It dulled the pain in his acute awareness of half a century of wasted effort, ignored, while the unnecessary suffering of millions continued so that a vested few might profit. And profit they did, and profit they do. In 1971, Royal Wright died from a combination of Valium and alcohol at the age of 83. Perhaps his continual exposure to his own Wright frequencies helped his body endure abuse for so many years. Fortunately, his death was not the end of his electronic therapy. A few humanitarian doctors and engineers reconstructed his frequency instruments and kept his genius alive. Rife technology became public knowledge again in 1986 with the publication of The Cancer Cure That Worked, by Barry Lines, 
and other material about Royal Rife and his monumental work. There is wide variation in the cost, design, and quality of the modern portable Rife frequency research instruments available. Costs vary from about $1,200 to $3,600 with price being no legitimate indicator of the technical competence in the design of the instrument or performance of the instrument. Some of the most expensive units have serious technical limitations and are essentially a waste of money. At the other extreme, some researchers do get crude results from inexpensive simple, unmodified frequency generators, but this is just as misguided as spending too much money. Without the proper modifications, the basic frequency generator gives only minimal and inconsistent results. Please recall that the actual destruction of the viruses and bacteria, etc. is not accomplished by the frequency displayed on these cheap generators, but by certain shorter harmonics of that particular frequency which are often blocked by the crudity of a cheap and rudimentary instrument itself. This very problem led Rife to ultimately abandon the ray tube design in favor of today's version. The newer technology applies the frequencies and their harmonics to the body through the use of handheld, footplate, or stick-on electrodes. Proper frequency exposure and flushing of the body with large amounts of clean, pure water is critical to achieve the kind of results Rife got. These procedures are fully explained in the manuals of the best units on the market. So, unless you would be satisfied with sporadic results for minor conditions, it is suggested you use only the highest quality equipment and only the proper, proven procedures in your personal research. If you do, you may discover that nothing can approach what can be achieved through the application of these safe, time-tested frequencies many for over 65 years and all without drugs, surgery, or radiation. One day, the name of Royal Raymond Rife may ascend to its rightful place as the giant of modern medical science. Until that time, his fabulous technology remains available only to the people who have the interest to seek it out. While perfectly legal for veterinarians to use to save the lives of animals, Wright's brilliant frequency therapy remains taboo to orthodox mainstream medicine because of the continuing threat it poses to the international pharmaceutical medical monopoly that controls the lives, and deaths, of the vast majority of the people on this planet. www.rents.com has the greatest health discovery in history been suppressed? www.medicaltruth.com web link Royal Raymond Rife, Jr. May 16, 1888, August 11, 1971 did a revolutionary microscope, invented in the 1920s, reveal a method of curing all types of germ-caused diseases? Can this technology, using radio frequencies, arrest most cancers, and actually cure them? Will this technology stop the dreaded AIDS virus, and halt the spread of Lyme's disease? butterfly lupus, and other so-called incurable diseases? The story of Royal Raymond Rife, genius scientists, can be likened to the most fascinating mystery. He was trained for six years by the Carl Zeiss Optical Company in Germany. He also worked for the Secret Service, U.S. government. He became the inventor of powerful microscopes, leading to the discovery of a beneficial phenomenon dealing with viruses. Rife received the backing of Mr. Timken, of the Timken Roller Bearing Company, who supplied funds to establish a laboratory in San Diego to finance his research. Rife reasoned that if he was going to find a cure for diseases such as cancer, it was important to be able to see the live virus that caused the disease. In 1920, Royal Rife designed the first of several highly advanced microscopes, recognized as the most powerful in the world, and the only one that could be used to see viruses alive. Wright's microscopes had resolutions and magnifications far more powerful than others of his day or even today. Wright's Universal Microscope 1933, magnified 31,000 times. Other microscopes of his day magnified only 3,000 times. The Wright Universal Microscope but Wright found that making a microscope with extreme magnification was not sufficient to see a colorless virus. Staining them with existing aniline dyes was unsuccessful because the virus was too small to absorb the colloidal particles. Rife noted that the different frequencies of light cause certain microorganisms to illuminate light up in their own resonant colors. So he invented a system of rotating prisms to select the appropriate light frequency color, essentially staining the specimen with light. 
Extrapolating from this resonant effect of light, he experimented with electromagnetic radio waves and discovered that for each type of virus, there was a particular resonant frequency that would cause it to burst into pieces and be destroyed. He subjected test animals in his laboratory to lethal doses of pathogenic germs and found that he could invariably save their lives by subjecting their bodies for a few minutes to the electrical energy of the properly chosen frequency. Therefore, before the year 1930, he had built his first microscope and demonstrated that he could electronically kill pathogenic microorganisms. The success demonstrated that any germ-created disease in man, animal or plant, could be quickly and painlessly eradicated. This was electronic therapy, the health technology of the next century. Can anyone imagine a more important discovery for mankind? It ensured the virtual end to disease. And at little cost, we might add. A primitive form of this technology is used today by the medical profession to treat certain types of leukemia. The patient's blood is pumped from the body and exposed to ultraviolet light. Unfortunately, this AMA-approved treatment does not treat the bone marrow, where blood cells originate. Also, it is painful and expensive. Wright's method did access the whole body, inside and out. It electrocuted the viruses and thus cured the so-called incurable diseases. Wright's method was totally harmless to the body, and extremely inexpensive. Wright's success attracted the attention of many doctors and scientists. Dr. Arthur Kendall a noted bacteriologist, contributed his key medium which enabled the filterable virus portions of bacteria to be isolated and to continue reproducing. Dr. Milbank Johnson was a strong supporter of Rife's work and arranged a dinner in honor of Rife and Kendall, attended by more than 30 of the most prominent people in the medical field. Dr. Johnson set up a clinic where Rife treated 16 terminally ill cancer patients with his frequency instruments, and, after three months, the staff of five medical doctors and Dr. Alvin Ford, MD, pathologist for the group, pronounced 14 of the subjects clinically cured. Dr. James Kush used Wright's frequency instrument for 22 years with continued success. He reported one case of a Mexican boy with osteomyelitis of the leg. The doctors had to scrape the bone every week, which was painful. After two weeks of treatment with the frequency instrument, the boy was completely healed with no reoccurrence. Rife's discovery was so revolutionary, it promised to eliminate all germ-created disease. And therein lay the basis for the suppression of his marvelous discoveries and inventions. The contributing factors to this suppression were scientific rivalries, institutional arrogance, one-man rule of the AMA, and vested interests of pharmaceutical companies. Yet, in the years from 1934 to 1939, many doctors cured cancer and other diseases using Rife's frequency instruments. Then, at the end of this period, extreme pressure was brought against the doctors to stop using this method, and their machines were confiscated. In 1939, an engineer working with Rife to improve his instrument for commercial manufacture by the newly formed company, Beam Ray, brought suit against the company. This engineer obtained the powerful backing of the AMA, and the ensuing trial had a debilitating effect on Rife, leading eventually to alcoholism and depression. For all practical purposes, his aggressive research was over. Two prestigious journals described Rife's revolutionary microscopes, the Journal of the Franklin Institute published an article, The New Microscopes in February, 1944. The Smithsonian Institution published the same article in its annual report of the Board of Regents, year ending June 30, 1944, and republished it in 1945. The text is available in John Crane's book. In 1950, John Crane became Rife's partner and worked to improve the frequency instrument and to document Rife's work. In 1958, he made a smaller frequency instrument that attached directly to the body. Doctors began using this smaller, lower-cost, frequency instrument with success. Again, the health authorities surfaced and threatened the doctors, forcing them to shut down. Crane's office was raided and all machines, documents, and research records were removed, all without a search warrant. The only way to investigate the Rife technology today is through personal research and experimentation. Notice due to FDA regulations and various state laws, no medical claims can be made for the Royal R. Rife technology. 
all of the information expressed herein must be considered theoretical and unproven and for experimental research only. Electrical and Frequency Effects on Pathogens by Brian McInturf, Akaturf at MINDSPRING.com In the early 1900s, Royal Rife discovered that certain lower life forms could be devitalized by subjecting them to certain frequencies produced by an electrical apparatus. He used a combination of AC and DC power to do so. He used a powerful dark field microscope, another device he perfected, which allowed him to watch the effects of his frequency generator on live viruses, bacteria, paramecium, and other potential pathogens. He watched as they were devitalized in a number of ways, either losing their motility, pleomorphing into a different and hopefully non-pathogenic form, or actually bursting. Unfortunately, most of his work and the exact design of his frequency generator were lost. This story is detailed in a book called The Cancer Cure that worked by Barry Lines. In a small clinical study during Rife's time, his frequency generator reportedly had a 100% cure rate for the types of cancers that were investigated, sarcomas and carcinomas. He also had a perfect cure rate for other serious diseases of the time, like tuberculosis. The tale of how this work was almost lost to mankind due to fledgling pharmaceutical companies and the American Medical Association is a story for the conspiracy theorists. Wright's dark field microscope was also an innovation far ahead of its time. It allowed him to view even the tiniest viruses while they were still alive by staining them with light, unlike today's electron microscopes for which the sample must be fixed which kills the pathogen being viewed. With this microscope, he saw and reported instances of pleomorphism, which is when an organism mutates, as when a bacteria mutates to a fungal-type lipiform. This was also reported by Bill Humps, another early microscopy pioneer, but is still considered anathema to the conventional medical establishment, even though alternative modern researchers working with dark field microscopes have clear proof that it occurs and are willing to show anyone who cares to look. The exploration of this phenomenon and that of frequency and other electrical effects on pathogens will one day rock the scientific and medical establishments. I will not hold me breathe until this happens, however. There is little profit, and hence motivation, in developing electrical modalities to treat disease, especially with devices that one can build oneself. It will only come about when so many people know about this treatment, use it, and are more successful using it than with conventional modalities that it is the preferred method to treat disease due to cost, safety, and efficacy. This will come through bit and piece research financed by those who actually need the treatments for themselves and for diseases that conventional medicine has little luck in treating. I have no doubt that this would have never happened had it not been for the Internet and its facilitation of instant and censored worldwide communications. One factor that may speed progress greatly in this field is the vast amount of commercial applications that exist for this technology which are outside the government-protected field of internal medicine. There is a rather expensive pimple zapper which uses a single sharp electrode in one hand and the box in the other advertised which claims to locally kill bacteria which can cause eruptions. There is a salmonella detector made for egg processing lines which stimulates eggs with the resonant frequency for the bacteria de clark synchrometer, but with a laser. If it detects resonance, the egg is kicked out as contaminated. Other potentially very profitable applications are as a safe pesticide in homes and perhaps farms and as a disinfectant. Lately, James Bear has been working to recreate Rife's work, and has a book and video showing how to build a generator which approximates Rife's. His video shows different pathogens succumbing to the effects of his generator, usually bursting or hemorrhaging from the field effects from the transmitter, which is 5 or more feet away. The bare device generates a 27 mhzac waveform with a CB and combines with a DC waveform at varying frequencies. The waveform excites a plasma tube from which the power is transmitted. The high frequency penetrates the body efficiently, but the antipathogenic action is thought to be mostly the harmonics caused by the DC portion. Bear's Rife device will not generate high enough frequencies to match those discovered by Hilda Clark in the DC portion to kill pathogens directly. He must use the harmonics of the frequency generator, and as such he produces a DC waveform which produces enough harmonics to generate them. 
This is an inexact science at this time, and due to fluctuations in construction, equipment, tube variations, operating technique, results differed from those building and using the devices, although most admit when they follow BEAR's instructions to the letter, they have the best results. Once the device is constructed, cautious experimenters test it on cultures of bacteria, molds, paramecium, etc., to more assure the device produces a useful wave. The people working with Rife Bear generators report that it is easy to tell when a frequency generator is causing harmful effects since pain will be felt. They have done experiments on lab rodents and reported that they will not tolerate harmful frequencies without trying to escape. Even so, incautious experimentation with high voltage devices can cause damage or even death, so it is critical that one thoroughly understands the ramifications of dealing with these types of bioelectronics. The Rife Bear generator is one of the few types of frequency treatments where the subjects do not come in contact with the device, and some report it works as much as 100 feet away killing fungus. Other methods that people use to apply frequency to the body include coils, pads, headholds, and other contact applicators. Coils of wire can be stimulated with a frequency and produce a field which will penetrate the body, and some use this method to treat Lyme disease. Pads or handholds can be used to apply voltage directly to the body. One person reported that he caused possibly permanent nerve and lymph node damage to himself by applying voltage using a wire coil attached to a function generator, amplified to 60 volts, and at tapeworm frequencies as published by Clark. He says he had a tapeworm in a lymph node which bubbled up when subjected to the field, killing it but damaging his lymph node. Human body cells have a resonant frequency at about 1000 khz, and any strong DC modulated signal over 330 khz produces harmonics of significant amplitude in this frequency range. AC signals do not produce these harmonics, so are probably safer to use, but also do not work nearly as well when used in a frequency in specific manner. Huldy Clark uses an AC frequency generator with handholds to kill pathogens in the body. Using a device she developed called a synchrometer, she determined the resonant frequencies of most potential pathogens in the body and proceeded to kill them with an AC frequency generator. This list is published in her book called The Cure for All Diseases. The only problem with this method is that the pathogen that is causing an illness must be accurately identified before treatment, so that the correct frequency can be used. To run through the entire list of pathogens and dial in the frequencies for all of them for a minimum 3 minutes each requires many hours. Clark then came up with a zapper. It is a single frequency generator which produces DC square waves at about 30 khz. The lowest frequency given on her list of pathogens is about 80 khz and goes up to 900 khz. Yet, she reports that the DC wave kills many different pathogens in the body. She once speculated that this was from the positive offset DC voltage on the body, but I thought it more likely that the bugs were still dying from frequency effects from the harmonics produced by a zapper's square wave. A zapper produces an imperfect 30 khz square wave. A square wave is composed of an infinite number of higher frequency AC waves. The AC wave's frequencies and power distribution is analyzed using Fourier transforms. A perfectly symmetrical square wave produces major odd harmonics, that is, AC frequencies at 1, 3, 5, 7, 9 times its frequency, and the power available in those harmonics decreases as the multiplication factor increases. A perfect 30 khz zapper produces power at 30, 90, 150, 210, 270 khz. It also produces minor even harmonics. However, no zapper built to Clark specs produces a perfect square wave. It produces an unsymmetrical square wave. Most of the ones I have built produce around 16 14 ratio, staying at 8 volts for 16 microseconds, then dropping to 0 volts for 14 microseconds. These values are approximate. There is also usually a spike on the positive going pulse. These imperfections however, add to a zapper's effectiveness. It means that rather than just producing harmonics on the odd multiples, it produces harmonics all over the place. 
it is impossible to analyze theoretically for me anyway and tell just what AC frequencies are being produced. Add to this another uncertainty factor in that no two zappers are like when using cheap parts, like from Radio Shack, which have a wide tolerance. I have seen zappers built with the same parts in the same board layout produce different frequencies, one at 28 khz and one at 35 khz, for example. This leads to a great deal of variability between zappers. For example, the frequency effects of one zapper might be very good at treating salmonella and not touchy coli, while another one built with the same parts might be highly effective against E. coli and not touch salmonella. There is too much variability. I have one zapper which seems to work best for flu, but will not work against colds, and another that performs best for colds. Robert Beck is another researcher in the bioelectronic field. His zapper is a low-frequency bipolar device originally designed to treat HIV. At this writing, it uses a 27V signal at 4 Hz, although, like Clark's zapper, frequency is stated not to be important. Beck reports that his device does not kill HIV directly, but merely keeps them from reproducing, which effectively treats them. Even with the high voltage of Beck's zapper, I think it is unlikely that there is enough power at the resonant frequency of HIV to kill it, given the very low frequency. Then again, maybe there is, since viruses are so small, perhaps it only takes a milliwatt or less at the correct frequency to destroy them. And, last I read, Beck's device killed 100% of HIV in 100% of subjects although this is a far cry from curing AIDS. But perhaps there is something other than frequency effects that devitalize HIV from Beck's machine. There are also now being built frequency guns which produce a non-adjustable set of frequencies and are aimed at a specific part on the body and are modulated by using colored cones on the output. In the few anecdotes I have seen in their use, they appear to be somewhat successful in treating cancerous tumors. One person reported that it did nothing to treat his multiple sclerosis, however, but this is understandable given Clark's assertions on the causes of Ms. I have corresponded with a person who has used frequency generators a great deal in treating illness. He has used homemade ones, commercial function generators, standard and modified zappers. I think he stumbled onto a likely reason the zapper and other frequency devices work. DNA or NA are polar molecules and are thus susceptible to frequency effects. Each DNA molecule has a resonant frequency. In general, the simpler the life form the lower the resonant frequency of the being according to Elda Clark. Every cell in a living being has a DNA molecule half in sperm and ova and since the DNA for each species are the same size, they have the same frequency. When the cells are subjected to their resonant frequency at sufficient power, they are destroyed. A zapper with a non-symmetrical waveform provides a limited amount of power in the resonant frequency of each molecule which contains DNA or NA, which is every living cell. When there are a large amount of the same type of molecule, like in the human body, which is composed of quadrillions, the amount of energy transmitted to each is so small that none are damaged although they could be due to localized effects of more power being available closest to the electrode site, for example. However. This assumes that there is enough power in the frequency of those cells, and Clark states that human body cells have a frequency of above 1 mHz. So, if one stays in the lower frequencies and limits power, there is not enough power in the harmonics at 1 mHz and above to do damage to a human body. If there are a small number of some other type of RNA DNA, as from a minor infection of bacteria, the amount of energy available in that resonant frequency may be enough to destroy the DNA. However, if one has an excess amount of, say, large parasites in the body, the amount of energy is not enough to harm them. The power can be cranked up enough to destroy them, but without knowing the exact frequency at which the pathogens will destruct, it can be risky since the body could be damaged. There is another effect from a zapper or other PAV device that may as important as the frequency effects, however. According to the same guy's speculation, a zapper, or any square wave frequency device, produces hydrogen peroxide in the blood due to its chemistry. Peroxide has antipathogenic effects. But this is only produced in the blood. Still, 
it would be better to produce it in this manner than ingest it, since consuming more than a few drops can reportedly adversely affect beneficial gut bacteria and not be transmitted to the bloodstream intact. He says he can taste the peroxide in his mouth when zapping at high voltages. Perhaps this is the main benefit from using a zapper and any frequency effects are minimal. After making this post, someone who was involved in the colloidal silver manufacturing business wrote that he suspected that many of the same principles of making colloids also apply to using a zapper. Colloidal silver is made with a zapper type device and silver wire or plates. He explained that oxygen is formed on one electrode, and hydrogen on the other, as well as the H2O2 and H30, so these could have an effect. In my experience, zappers are effective for blood-borne pathogens but not in the nasal cavities, intestines, or other places inside which there is no blood contained. The same limitation probably applies to all pad or contact devices. Whether it is from the production of chemicals or actual frequency effects, they need the conductive blood to work systemically although there might still be some local effects that could be put to use. I think Clark's synchrometer is probably only effective in detecting pathogens with blood exposure as well. These same limitations apply to variable frequency generator pad devices, but at least if a bug can be identified the exact AC frequency can be used without having to rely on harmonics. They can also be used with rife frequencies for indeterminate pathogens. Bare rife generators are the most effective for treating the entire body and not just the blood, but are most valuable for diseases that are well researched and discussed. Even if a pathogen can be identified as causing a malady, experimentation with a microscope is necessary to determine the correct frequencies to use unless they have been previously determined. The devices lack the ability to use the pathogen frequencies Clark published so harmonics must be used, which makes it an even less exact science because of variations in equipment. Small variations in construction and usage methods can make them ineffectual and they should be well tested and the operators well trained before using them for treatment. I often recommend zappers for use since I am convinced of their safety. I think that high-powered variable frequency tube devices are better at treating illness, but do not recommend their use except by those who research and experiment cautiously because of the possibility of damaging oneself or others. Also, the severity and type of disease should be taken into account. See my article called Zapper Tips for Suggestions to Get the Most Out of a Zapper. Addendum, I have now experimented with a bare rye plasma tube generator for a number of months. The potential impact that this device will have on the treatment of illness is on par with if not more than all the prescription drugs thus far patented. Combined. Reproduced from www.medicaltruth.com web link Royal Raymond Rife and the Cancer Cure That Worked. Extracted from the book The Cancer Cure That Worked. By Barry Lines Marcus Books. P.O. Box 327, Queensville, Ontario, Canada Nexus Magazine, October-November 1993 More than just a cancer cure, Rife's discovery pointed to a new understanding of what we have mistakenly termed the germ theory. Nexus Magazine, October-November 1993 Extracted from the book The Cancer Cure That Worked By Barry Lines Marcus Books, P.O. Box 327, Queensville, Ontario Canada in the summer of 1934 and just California, under the auspices of the University of Southern California, a group of leading American bacteriologists and doctors conducted the first successful cancer clinic. The results showed that a. cancer was caused by a microorganism. b. the microorganism could be painlessly destroyed in terminally ill cancer patients. and c. the effects of the disease could be reversed. The technical discovery leading to the cancer cure had been described in Science magazine in 1931. In the decade following the 1934 clinical success, the technology and the subsequent, successful treatment of cancer patients was discussed at medical conferences, disseminated in a medical journal, cautiously but professionally reported in a major newspaper, and technically explained in an annual report published by the Smithsonian Institution. However, the cancer cure threatened a number of scientists, physicians, and financial interests. A cover-up was initiated. Physicians using the new technology were coerced into abandoning it. 
The author of the Smithsonian article was followed and then was shot at while driving his car. He never wrote about the subject again. All reports describing the cure were censored by the head of the AMA American Medical Association from the major medical journals. Objective scientific evaluation by government laboratories was prevented and renowned researchers who supported the technology and its new scientific principles in bacteriology were scorned, ridiculed, and called liars to their face. Eventually, a long, dark silence lasting decades fell over the cancer cure. In time, the cure was labeled a myth he never happened. However, documents now available prove that the cure did exist, was tested successfully in clinical trials, and in fact was used secretly for years afterwards continuing to cure cancer as well as other diseases. Bacteria and viruses in 19th century France, two giants of science collided. One of them is now world-renowned Louis Pasteur. The other, from whom Pasteur stole many of his best ideas, is now essentially forgot near Behump. One of the many areas in which Pasteur and Behump argued concern what is today known as pleomorphism he occurrence of more than one distinct form of an organism in a single life cycle. Behump contended that bacteria could change forms. A rod-shaped bacterium could become a spheroid, etc. Pasteur disagreed. In 1914, Madame Victor Henry of the Pasteur Institute confirmed that Behump was correct and Pasteur wrong. But Badhop went much further in his argument for pleomorphism. He contended that bacteria could devolve into smaller, unseen forms what he called microzema. In other words, Badhop developed and the basis of a lifetime of research theory that microorganisms could change their essential size as well as their shape, depending on the state of health of the organism in which the microorganism lived. This directly contradicted what orthodox medical authorities have believed for most of the 20th century. Laboratory research in recent years has provided confirmation for Behop's notion. The seemingly esoteric scientific squabble had ramifications far beyond academic institutions. The denial of pleomorphism was one of the cornerstones of 20th century medical research and cancer treatment and early 20th century acceptance of pleomorphism might have prevented millions of Americans from suffering and dying of cancer. In a paper presented to the New York Academy of Sciences in 1969, Dr. Virginia Livingston and Dr. Eleanor Alexander Jackson declared that a single cancer microorganism exists. They said that the reason the army of cancer researchers couldn't find it was because it changed form. Livingston and Alexander Jackson asserted, the organism has remained an unclassified mystery, due in part to its remarkable pleomorphism and its stimulation of other microorganisms. Its various phases may resemble viruses, microcochi, diphtheroids, bacilli, and fungi. The American Medical Association The American Medical Association was formed in 1846 but it wasn't until 1901 that a reorganization enabled it to gain power over how medicine was practiced throughout America. By becoming a confederation of state medical associations and forcing doctors who wanted to belong to their county medical society to join the state association, the AMA soon increased its membership to include a majority of physicians. Then, by accrediting medical schools, it began determining the standards and practices of doctors. Those who refused to conform lost their license to practice medicine. Morris Fishbein was the virtual dictator of the AMA from the mid-1920s until he was ousted on June 6, 1949 at the AMA convention in Atlantic City. But even after he was forced from his position of power because of a revolt from several state delegations of doctors, the policies he had set in motion continued on for many years. He died in the early 1970s. A few years after the successful cancer clinic of 1934, Dr. R.T. Hammer, who did not participate in the clinic, began to use the procedure in Southern California. According to Benjamin Cohen, who observed the entire development of the cancer cure from idea to implementation, Fishbein found out and tried to buy in. When he was turned down, Fishbein unleashed the AMA to destroy the cancer cure. Cullen recalled, Dr. Hammer ran an average of 40 cases a day through his place. He had to hire two operators. He trained them and watched them very closely. The case histories were mounting up very fast. Among them was this old man from Chicago. 
He had a malignancy all around his face and neck. It was a gory mass. Just terrible, just a red gory mass. It had taken over all around his face. It had taken on one eyelid at the bottom of the eye. It had taken off the bottom of the lower lobe of the ear and had also gone into the cheek area, nose and chin. He was a sight to behold. But in six months all that was left was a little black spot on the side of his face and the condition of it was such that it was about to fall off. Now that man was 82 years of age. I never saw anything like it. The delight of having a lovely clean skin again, just like a baby's skin. Well he went back to Chicago. Naturally he couldn't keep still and Fishbein heard about it. Fishbein called him in and the old man was kind of reticent about telling him. So Fishbein whined and dined him and finally learned about his cancer treatment by Dr. Hammer in the San Diego clinic. Well soon a man from Los Angeles came down. He had several meetings with us. Finally he took us out to dinner and broached the subject about buying it. Well we wouldn't do it. The renown was spreading and we weren't even advertising. But of course what did it was the case histories of Dr. Hammer. He said that this was the most marvelous development of the age. His case histories were absolutely wonderful Fishbein bribe a partner in the company. With the result we were kicked into court operating without a license. I was broke after a year. In 1939, under pressure from the local medical society, Dr. R.T. Hammer abandoned the cure. He is not one of the heroes of this story. Thus, within the few, short years from 1934 to 1939, the cure for cancer was clinically demonstrated and expanded into curing other diseases on a daily basis by other doctors, and then terminated when Morris Fishbein of the AMA was not allowed to buy in. It was a practice he had developed into a cold art, but never again would such a single mercenary deed doom millions of Americans to premature, ugly deaths. It was the AMA's most shameful hour. Another major institution which staked its claim in the virgin territory of cancer research in the 1930-1950 period was Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Established in 1884 as the first cancer hospital in America, Memorial Sloan Kettering from 1940 to the mid-1950 South was the center of drug testing for the largest pharmaceutical companies. Cornelius P. Rhodes who had spent the 1930s at the Rockefeller Institute, became the director at Memorial Sloan Kettering in 1939. He remained in that position until his death in 1959. Rhodes was the head of the Chemical Warfare Service from 1943 to 1945, and afterwards became the nation's premier advocate of chemotherapy. It was Dr. Rhodes who prevented Dr. Irene Diller from announcing the discovery of the cancer microorganism to the New York Academy of Sciences in 1950. It also was Dr. Rhodes who arranged for the funds for Dr. Casp's New Jersey laboratory to be cancelled after she announced the same discovery in Rome in 1953. An IRS investigation, instigated by an unidentified, powerful New York Cancer Authority, added to her misery, and the laboratory was closed. Thus the major players on the cancer field are the doctors, the private research institutions, the pharmaceutical companies, the American Cancer Society, and also the U.S. government through the National Cancer Institute organizing research and the Food and Drug Administration the dreaded FDA which keeps the outsiders on the defensive through raids, legal harassment, and expensive testing procedures. The man who found the cure for cancer in 1913, a man with a love for machines and a scientific curiosity, arrived in San Diego after driving across the country from New York. He had been born in Elkhorn, Nebraska, was 25 years old, and very happily married. He was about to start a new life and open the way to a science of health which will be honored far into the future. His name was Royal Raymond Rife. Close friends, who loved his gentleness and humility while being awed by his genius, called him Roy. Royal R. Rife was fascinated by bacteriology, microscopes and electronics. For the next seven years including a mysterious period in the Navy during World War I in which he traveled to Europe to investigate foreign laboratories for the U.S. government, he thought about and experimented in a variety of fields as well as mastered the mechanical skills necessary to build instruments such as the world had never imagined. By the late 1920s, the first phase of his work was completed. 
he had built his first microscope, one that broke the existing principles, and he had constructed instruments which enabled him to electronically destroy specific pathological microorganisms. Reif believed that the minuteness of the viruses made it impossible to stain them with the existing acid or aniline dye stains. He'd have to find another way. Somewhere along the way, he made an intuitive leap often associated with the greatest scientific discoveries. He conceived first the idea and then the method of staining the virus with light he began building a microscope which would enable a frequency of light to coordinate with the chemical constituents of the particle or microorganism under observation. Reif's second microscope was finished in 1929. In an article which appeared in the Los Angeles Tunes magazine on December 27, 1931, the existence of the light staining method was reported to the public. Bacilli may thus be studied by their light, exactly as astronomers study moons, suns, and stars by the light which comes from them through telescopes. The Bacilli studied are living ones, not corpses killed by stains. Throughout most of this period, Reif also had been seeking a way to identify and then destroy the microorganism which caused cancer. His cancer research began in 1922. It would take him until 1932 to isolate the responsible microorganism which he later named simply the BX virus. The early 1930s and 1931, the two men who provided the greatest professional support to Royal R. Rife came into his life. Dr. Arthur I. Kendall, Director of Medical Research at Northwestern University Medical School in Illinois, and Dr. Milbank Johnson, a member of the Board of Directors at Pasadena Hospital in California and an influential power in Los Angeles medical circles. Dr. Kendall had invented a protein culture medium called K-medium after its invention which enabled the filterable virus portions of a bacteria to be isolated and to continue reproducing. This claim directly contradicted the Rockefeller Institute's drive Thomas Rivers who in 1926 had authoritatively stated that a virus needed a living tissue for reproduction. Rife, Kendall and others were to prove within a year that it was possible to cultivate viruses artificially. Rivers, in his ignorance and obstinacy, was responsible for suppressing one of the greatest advances ever made in medical knowledge. Kendall arrived in California in mid-November 1931 and Johnson introduced him to Rife. Kendall brought his key medium to Rife and Rife brought his microscope to Kendall. A typhoid germ was put in the key medium, triple filtered through the finest filter available, and the results examined under Rife's microscope. Tiny, distinct bodies stained in a turquoise blue light were visible. The virus cultures grew in dye key medium and were visible. The viruses could be light-stained and then classified according to their own colors under Rife's unique microscope. A later report which appeared in the Smithsonian's annual publication gives a hint of the totally original microscopic technology which enabled man to see a deadly virus-sized microorganism in its live state for the first time. The electron microscope of later years kills its specimens then they were examined under the Rife microscope where the filterable virus form of typhoid bacillus, emitting a blue spectrum color caused the plane of polarization to be deviated 4.8 degrees plus. When the opposite angle of refraction was obtained by means of adjusting the polarizing prisms to minus 4.8 degrees and the cultures of viruses were illuminated by the monochromatic beams coordinated with the chemical constituents of the typhoid bacillus, small, oval, actively modal, bright turquoise blue bodies were observed at 5000 x magnification in high contrast to the colorless and motionless debris of the medium. These tests were repeated 18 times to verify the results. Following the success, Dr. Milbank Johnson quickly arranged a dinner in honor of the two men in order that the discovery could be announced and discussed. More than 30 of the most prominent medical doctors, pathologists, and bacteriologists in Los Angeles attended this historic event on November 20, 1931. Among those in attendance were Dr. Alvin G. Ford, who 20 years later would indicate he knew little about Rife's discoveries, and Dr. George Dock who would serve on the University of Southern California's Special Research Committee overseeing the clinical work until he, too, would go over to the opposition. On November 22, 1931, the Los Angeles Times reported this important medical gathering and its scientific significance, scientific discoveries of the greatest magnitude 
including a discussion of the world's most powerful microscope recently perfected after 14 years effort by Dr. Royal R. Rife of San Diego, were described Friday evening to members of the medical profession, bacteriologists and pathologists at a dinner given by Dr. Milbank Johnson in honor of Dr. Rife and Dr. A. A. Kendall. Before the gathering of distinguished men, Dr. Kendall told of his researches in cultivating the typhoid bacillus on his new key medium. The typhoid bacillus is not filterable and is large enough to be seen easily with microscopes in general use. Through the use of medium K, Dr. Kendall said, the organism is so altered that it cannot be seen with ordinary microscopes and it becomes small enough to be ultra-microscopic or filterable. It then can be changed back to the microscopic or non-filterable form. Through the use of Dr. Wright's powerful microscope, said to have a visual power of magnification to 17,000 times, compared with 2,000 times of which the ordinary microscope is capable, Dr. Kendall said he could see the typhoid bacilli in the filterable or formerly invisible stage. It is probably the first time the minute filterable virus organisms ever have been seen. The strongest microscope now in use can magnify between 2,000 and 2,500 times. Dr. Reif, by an ingenious arrangement of lenses applying an entirely new optical principle and by introducing double quartz prisms and powerful illuminating lights, has devised a microscope with a lowest magnification of 5,000 times and a maximum working magnification of 17,000 times. The new microscope, scientists predict, also will prove a development of the first magnitude. Frankly dubious about the perfection of a microscope which appears to transcend the limits set by optics science, Dr. Johnson's guests expressed themselves as delighted with the visual demonstration and heartily accorded both Dr. Rife and Dr. Kendall a foremost place in the world's rank of scientists. Five days later, the Los Angeles Times published a photo of Rife and Kendall with the microscope. It was the first time a picture of the supermicroscope had appeared in public. The headline read, The World's Most Powerful Microscope. Meanwhile, Reif and Kendall had prepared an article for the December 1931 issue of California and Western Medicine. Observations on Bacillus typhosis in its filtrable state described what Reif and Kendall had done and seen. The journal was the official publication of the State Medical Associations of California, Nevada and Utah. The prestigious science magazine then carried an article which alerted the scientific community of the entire nation. The December 11, 1931 Science News Supplement included a section titled, Filtrable Body Seen with the Rife Microscope. The article described Kendall's filtrable medium culture, the turquoise blue bodies which were the filtered form of a typhoid bacillus, and Wright's microscope. It included the following description, the light used with Dr. Wright's microscope is polarized, that is, it is passing through crystals that stop all rays except those vibrating in one particular plane. By means of a double reflecting prism built into the instrument, it is possible to turn this plane of vibration in any desired direction, controlling the illumination of the minute objects in the field very exactly. On December 27, 1931, the Los Angeles Times reported that Reif had demonstrated the microscope at a meeting of 250 scientists. The article explained, this is a new kind of magnifier, and the laws governing microscopes may not apply to it. Or Reif has developed an instrument that may revolutionize laboratory methods and enable bacteriologists like Or Kendall, to identify the germs that produce about 50 diseases whose causes are unknown. Soon Kendall was invited to speak before the Association of American Physicians. The presentation occurred May 3 and 4, 1932 at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And there Dr. Thomas Rivers and Hans Zinser stopped the scientific process. Their opposition meant that the development of Rife's discoveries would be slowed. Professional microbiologists would be cautious in even conceding the possibility that Rife and Kendall might have broken new ground. The depression was at its worst. The Rockefeller Institute was not only a source of funding but powerful in the corridors of professional recognition. A great crime resulted because of the uninformed, cruel and unscientific actions of Rivers and Zinser. The momentum was slowed at the moment when Rife's discoveries could have broken out and triggered a chain reaction of research, clinical treatment and the beginnings of an entirely new health system. 
by the end of 1932, Rife could destroy the typhus bacteria, the polio virus, the herpes virus, the cancer virus and other viruses in the culture and in experimental animals. Human treatment was only a step away. The opposition of Rivers and Zinser in 1932 had a devastating impact on the history of 20th century medicine. Zinser's bacteriology, in an updated version, is still a standard textbook. Unfortunately, there were few esteemed bacteriologists who were not frightened or awed by Rivers. But there were two exceptions to this generally unheroic crowd. Christopher Bird's article, What Has Become of the Rife Microscope? which appeared in the March 1976 New Age Journal, reports, in the midst of the venom and acerbity the only colleague to come to Kendall's aid was the grand old man of bacteriology, and first teacher of the subject in the United States, Dr. William H. Popsy Welch, who evidently looked upon Kendall's work with some regard. Welch was the foremost pathologist in America at one time. The medical library at Johns Hopkins University is named after him. He rose and said, Kendall's observation marks a distinct advance in medicine. It did little good. By then Rivers and Zinser were the powers in the field. Kendall's other supporter was Dr. Edward C. Rosenbaum of the Mayo Clinic's Division of Experimental Bacteriology. The Mayo Clinic was then and is today one of the outstanding research and treatment clinics in the world. The Washington Post of January 6, 1987 wrote, to many in the medical community, the Mayo Clinic is the standard against which other medical centers are judged. On July 5-7, 1932, just two months after Kendall's public humiliation, the Mayo Clinic's Rosenau met with Kendall and Rife at Kendall's laboratory at Northwestern University Medical School in Chicago. The oval, modal, turquoise blue virus were demonstrated and shown unmistakably, Rosenau declared in the proceedings of the staff meetings of the Mayo Clinic. July 13, 1932, Rochester, Minnesota. The virus for herpes was also seen. On August 26, 1932, Science magazine published Rosenau's report, Observations with the Rife Microscope of Filter Passing Forms of Microorganisms. In the article, Rosenau stated, There can be no question of the filterable turquoise blue bodies described by Kendall. They are not visible by the ordinary methods of illumination and magnification. Examination under the rife microscope of specimens, containing objects visible with the ordinary microscope, leaves no doubt of the accurate visualization of objects or particulate matter by direct observation at the extremely high magnification calculated to be 8,000 diameters obtained with this instrument three days after departing from Rife in Chicago, Rosen a road to Rife from the Mayo Clinic after seeing what your wonderful microscope will do, and after pondering over the significance of what you revealed with its use during those three strenuous and memorable days spent in Dr. Kendall's laboratory. I hope you will take the necessary time to describe how you obtain what physicists consider the impossible as I visualize the matter. Your ingenious method of illumination with the intense monochromatic beam of light is of even greater importance than the enormously high magnification. Rosenau was right. The unique color frequency staining method was the great breakthrough. Years later, after the arrival of television, an associate of the then deceased Rife would explain, the viruses were stained with a frequency of light just like colors are tuned in on television sets. It was the best non-technical description ever conceived. BXE virus of cancer Rife began using Kendall's Kia medium in 1931 in just his search for the cancer virus in 1932. He obtained an unulcerated breast mask that was checked for malignancy from the Paradise Valley Sanitarium of National City, California. But the initial cancer cultures failed to produce the virus he was seeking. Then a fortuitous accident occurred. The May 11, 1938 Evening Tribune of San Diego later described what happened, but neither the medium nor the microscope were sufficient alone to reveal the filter-passing organism Rye found in cancers, he recounted. It was an added treatment which he found virtually by chance that finally made this possible, he related. He happened to test a tube of cancer culture within the circle of a tubular ring filled with argon gas activated by an electrical current, which he had been using in experimenting with electronic bombardment of organisms of disease. His cancer culture happened to rest there about 24 hours with the current on the argon gas-filled tube, 
and then he noticed under the microscope that its appearance seemed to have changed. He studied and tested this phenomenon repeatedly, and thus discovered cancer virus filter passing, red-purple granules in the cultures. The BX cancer virus was a distinct purplish red color. Reif had succeeded in isolating the filterable virus of carcinoma. Reif's laboratory notes for November 20, 1932, contain the first written description of the cancer virus characteristics. Among them are two, unique to his method of classification using the Reif microscope, angle of refraction 2 minus 3 tenths degrees. Color by chemical refraction purple red The size of the cancer virus was indeed small. The length was 1 15th of a micron. The breadth was 1 20th of a micron. No ordinary light microscope, even in the 1980s, would be able to make the cancer virus visible. Reif and his laboratory assistant E.S. Free proceeded to confirm his discovery. They repeated the method 104 consecutive times with identical results. In time, Reif was able to prove that the cancer microorganism had four forms, 1. BX carcinoma. 2. BY sarcoma archer than BX. 3. Monoclicoid form in the monocytes of the blood of over 90% of cancer patients. When properly stained, this form can be readily seen with a standard research microscope. 4. Critomyces pleomorphia fungi identical morphologically to that of the orchid and of the mushroom. Reif wrote in his 1953 book, any of these forms can be changed back to BX within a period of 36 hours and will produce in the experimental animal a typical tumor with all the pathology of true neoplastic tissue, from which we can again recover the BX microorganism. This complete process has been duplicated over 300 times with identical and positive results. Reif had proved pleomorphism. He had shown how the cancer virus changes form, depending on its environment. He had confirmed the work of Behamp, of Kendall, of Rosenau, of Welch, and an army of pleomorphous bacteriologists who would come after him and have to battle the erroneous orthodox laws of Rivers and his legions of followers. Reif said, in reality, it is not the bacteria themselves that produce the disease, but the chemical constituents of these microorganisms enacting upon the unbalanced cell metabolism of the human body that in actuality produce the disease. We also believe if the metabolism of the human body is perfectly balanced or poised, it is susceptible to no disease. But Rife did not have time to argue theory. He would leave that for others. After isolating the cancer virus, his next step was to destroy it. He did this with his frequency instruments over and over again. And then he did it with experimental animals, inoculating them, watching the tumors grow and then killing the virus in their bodies with the same frequency instruments tuned to the same BX frequency. Reif declared in 1953, these successful tests were conducted over 400 times with experimental animals before any attempt was made to use this frequency on human cases of carcinoma and sarcoma. In the summer of 1934, 16 terminally ill people with cancer and other diseases were brought to the Scripps Ranch. There, as Rife and the doctors worked on human beings for the first time, they learned much. In 1953 when Rife copyrighted his book, he made the real report of what happened in 1934. He wrote, with a frequency instrument treatment, no tissue is destroyed, no pain is felt, no noise is audible, and no sensation is noticed. A tube lights up and three minutes later the treatment is completed. The virus or bacteria is destroyed and the body then recovers itself naturally from the toxic effect of the virus or bacteria. Several diseases may be treated simultaneously. The first clinical work on cancer was completed under the supervision of Milbank Johnson, Maryland, which was set up under a special media research committee of the University of Southern California. Sixteen cases were treated at the clinic for many types of malignancy. After three months, 14 of these so-called hopeless cases were signed off as clinically cured by the start of five medical doctors and Dr. Alvin G. Ford, MD, pathologist for the group. The treatments consisted of three minutes duration using the frequency instrument which was set on the mortal oscillatory rate for BX or cancer at three-day intervals. It was found that the elapsed time between treatments attains better results than the cases treated daily. 
This gives the lymphatic system an opportunity to absorb and cast off the toxic condition which is produced by the devitalized dead particles of the BX virus. No rise of body temperature was perceptible in any of these cases above normal during or after the frequency instrument treatment. No special diets were used in any of this clinical work, but we sincerely believe that a proper diet compiled for the individual would be of benefit date, December 1, 1953. Other members of the clinic were Waylon Morrison, Chief Surgeon of the Santa Fe Railway. George C. Doc, M.D., internationally famous. George C. Fisher, M.D., Children's Hospital in New York. Arthur I. Kendall. Dr. Zeit, M.D., Professor of Pathology at Chicago University. Rufus B. von Klein Schmidt, President of the University of Southern California. Dr. Kushan, Dr. Carl Meyer, Ph.D., Head of the Department of Bacteriological Research at the Hooper Foundation in San Francisco, were also present Dr. Kops of the Metabolic Clinic in La Jolla signed all 14 reports and knew of all the tests from his personal observation. In 1956, Dr. James Kush made the following declaration, I would like to make this historical record of the amazing scientific wonders regarding the efficacy of the frequencies of the Royal R. Rife frequency instrument. When I was told about Dr. Reif and his frequency instrument at the Ellen Scripps home near the Scripps Institute on X some 22 years ago, I went out to see about it and became very interested in the cases which he had there. And the thing that brought me into it more quickly than anything was a man who had a cancer of the stomach. Reif was associated at that time with Dr. Milbank Johnson, Maryland, who was then president of the Medical Association of Los Angeles a very wealthy man and a very big man in the medical world he biggest in Los Angeles and he had hired this annex for this demonstration over a summer of time. In that period of time I saw many things and the one that impressed me the most was a man who staggered onto a table, just on the last end of cancer. He was a bag of bones. As he lay on the table, Dr. Reif and Dr. Johnson said, just feel that man's stomach. So I put my hand on the cavity where his stomach was underneath and it was just a cavity almost, because he was so thin. His backbone and his belly were just about touching each other. I put my hand on his stomach which was just one solid mass, just about what I could cover with my hand, somewhat like the shape of a heart. It was absolutely solid. And I thought to myself, well, nothing can be done for that. However. They gave him a treatment with the rife frequencies and in the course of time over a period of six weeks to two months, to my astonishment, he completely recovered. He got so well that he asked permission to go to Al Centro as he had a farm there and he wanted to see about his stock. Dr. Rife said, now you haven't the strength to drive to Al Centro. Oh, yes, said he. I have, but I'll have a man to drive me there. As a matter of fact, the patient drove his own car there and when he got down to Al Centro he had a sick cow and he stayed up all night with it. The next day he drove back without any rest whatsoever oh you can imagine how he had recovered. I saw other cases that were very interesting. Then I wanted a copy of the frequency installment. I finally bought one of these frequency instruments and established it in my office. I saw some very remarkable things resulting from it in the course of over 20 years. W shown that there exists a crucial natural interaction between living matter and photons. This process is measurable at the cellular bacterium level. Other research has demonstrated that living systems are extraordinarily sensitive to extremely low energy electromagnetic waves. This is to say, each kind of cell or microorganism has a specific frequency of interaction with the electromagnetic spectrum. By various means, Rife's system allowed adjusting the frequency of light and pinging on the specimen. By some insight he learned that the light frequency could be tuned into the natural frequency of the microorganism being examined to cause a resonance or feedback loop. In effect, under this condition, it can be said the microorganism illuminated itself. Rife extrapolated from his lighting technique, which we may be certain he understood that specific electromagnetic frequencies would have a negative effect on specific bacterial forms. There can remain no doubt that Reif demonstrated the correctness of his hypothesis to himself and those few who had the courage to look and the perceptual acuity to see. The same new discoveries in biophysics not only explain Reif's principle of illumination. 
they also explain as process for selective destruction of bacteria. The latter phenomenon is similar to ultrasonic cleaning, differing in delicate selectivity of waveform and frequency. Recently, researchers whose findings have been suppressed, have caused and cured cancer in the same group of mice by subjecting them to certain electromagnetic fields. Wright's work was far more sophisticated. He selected specific microscopic targets, and actually saw the targets explode. A body of recognized scientific evidence now overwhelmingly supports the original cancer theories articulated and demonstrated by Wright 50 years ago. This includes modern AIDS research. Requiem for Royal Life The Hubbard Interviews, Part 1, Robert Page Flying Saucers, Secret Notebooks, and the Military Industrial Patent Complex. Interview with Robert Page by John Hubbard and Christopher Bird abridged, edited, and annotated by Sean Montgomery 8-10-6 Robert Page grew up near Dr. Wright's laboratory. He became Wright's friend and confidant. From a letter to John Hubbard from Chris Bird written prior to this interview, this guy Robert Z. Page is a real find. He is a long-time Navy expert on pest control and knows his parasitology, microbiology etc. Has lots of awards for his work on the wall of his den. He is also a Captain USNR. I hope to spend some more sessions on what he knows and has experienced. Christopher Bird is visiting page age 57 at the time of this interview at his home in Springfield, Virginia. They are together when John Hubbard telephones from Buffalo, New York. It is spring 1976. A ringing telephone is answered. Hubbard, may I speak with a Mr. Robert Z. Page, and is there a Mr. Christopher Bird there please? Page. Mr. Bird is here and I'll put him on this phone and I'll go upstairs and take another one. Hubbard, oh, you're Mr. Page? Page, yes. Bird, hello John. Well I've learned a lot already. Well, this guy really knows his onions, and he'll get on the phone here in a few minutes and say a few words to you about what he has been telling me, but one of the keys to the whole rife microscope thing is the method of illumination and he page has patented the same as Rife's, or a very analogous method, and for the last 10 years he has had absolutely no success in marketing it because of pressures all over the place. Hubbard, well, that's strange. That's very odd. Page, well anybody that wanted to could make that thing and put it up for sale. If you were dependent on any of the existing companies that produces for anything that you need, any of the companies like Bausch & Blum, or American Optical, or Zeiss, or any company that exists because they make and sell microscopes, then you are out of luck. If you have an optical company that can give you what you need without doing that, then you are okay. If you have a company that makes lenses strictly for cameras and not for microscopes then they would probably make it for you. One thing this won't do is show you very much in a section of tissue, well, it does to some extent. Page is speaking of his own patented microscope color illumination system which is based upon Wright's monochromatic approach to illumination. Note, the term monochromatic, which will be used throughout this interview, means, a singular color of light. White light is full spectrum light and contains all colors simultaneously. Monochromatic light is narrow spectrum light and contains any one color of light singled out, and it works beautifully well with particulate matter. What I have done with it is to add some features in addition to the monochromatic oblique illumination that Roy Reif used, to make it a more useful thing. You can widen out your band of light, take something beyond monochromatic, and it looks green, or it looks red, or it looks violet, but it's a much wider beam and it doesn't give you this resonant frequency which is akin to spectroscopy on a microscopic scale summary of a bridged passage page slips into a disjointed bout of technical description concerning adaptations that can be made to his patented system. Then a lengthy technical discussion concerning different microscopes that have been patented, but that are not produced because they threaten the market. Then page. Continuing now I don't know whether you remember the pictures in Life magazine back in 1951, late 1951. Roman Vishniak? He had a color system for microscopy and he refused to tell anybody what it was all about because he was a professional photographer and he was afraid somebody would find out how he took these pictures. If they could take pictures he wouldn't be able to sell his. But it was a several page color spread. 
He used light from oblique angles to color his specimens with phase contrast. Bird, you made the point in an earlier conversation that after Rife solved the illumination problem, he then solved the problems of spherical and chromatic aberration, would you tell us a little more about that? Page, well yes, to get away from spherical aberration, which is the worst offender there, ordinarily, you go to parabolics. Again, no more circle of elimination. Hubbard, he built parabolic lenses? Page, yes sir, he learned to grind them himself. Hubbard, oh! Who did this? Page, Rife. Hubbard, emphatically he built parabolic lenses? Page, well, you know, an awful lot of astronomers grind their own lenses. Hubbard, yes, I know, but, did Rife say that there were parabolic lenses in his illuminator? Page, well, he told me that he had learned how to grind parabolic lenses and if that's the way he solved his no, not in his illuminator, in his microscope. Hubbard, in his microscope. Page, not in the illuminator, no. That's a fairly simple, straightforward thing. Bird, to Hubbard and Mr. Page told me that Rife went to Holland and he learned how to grind parabolic lenses in Holland. Page, it may have been Germany. Bird, Germany then. It was Germany, Ed okay, so he got rid of that aberration that way, and the other aberration he got rid of with mirrors? Page, first he went to quartz like everybody does, and he wasn't satisfied with he told me he wasn't satisfied with quartz. And so he solved this problem. And I said, you use mirrors, huh? And he gave me a funny look, and then he laughed Hubbard, interrupting well now, when did you first meet Rife? Page. Oh I don't remember. It was years ago in my childhood. I don't even remember. Bird, well now John, getting that part of the story, I already have an hour of it on tape, so why don't we just stick to the technology and ask him the questions while he is on the phone, and I'll send you the other part of it with everything that Mr. Page can recollect. Hubbard, well, I'm particularly interested in how Mr. Page got introduced and what did he do? Page. My parents knew him rife for a number of years. For a while I live across the street from his laboratory. Hubbard, oh, I see. Page, this goes back years and years and years, and I was a child. Hubbard, all right, now, did you personally look through his number three his big universal microscope? Page, no, I never looked through it. Wright produced a series of five different microscopes, Identified by numbers 1 through 5 in the order of their construction, the number 3 Rife microscope is the universal microscope the big one completed in 1933, ed. Hubbard, did you personally look through his number 4 microscope? Page, no. Hubbard, did you yourself see any pictures, which Rife had made with the big microscope? Page, yes. A Bacillus coli is a huge thing. It was B. coli back then and it was a huge sausage, and inside it were all kinds of structures, and he was telling me what he thought they did. But they were not in any books any place, they were never in anybody else's illustrations. Nobody else had seen them. Hubbard, now, did he tell you when he made these pictures of the typhoid bacillus? What year did he make the picture in? Page, well, the particular that I was talking about was not a typhoid, it was a bacillus coli. Most of us carried it around in our intestines. He had a number of pictures. I think he had one of the typhoid bacillus, but it wasn't as interesting, and it was a little bit smaller, as I remember. He had a bunch of these hung on the walls in the hallways in his laboratory, pictures of a number of things. Hubbard, all right, now then, have you personally looked at the report in the Smithsonian Institute where Seidel shows a picture that was reported as a typhoid bacillus? Page, no. Hubbard, you haven't. Bird, I can make that picture available to him and I shall do it before I leave for the Midwest. Hubbard, all right. I would like for you to tell me then later, Mr. Page, if this is what you think is the same image of what you thought was the Bacillus coli. Page, well, he probably had some, he had photographed a great many things, and this particular one though he said this was the B. coli. He was telling me what the differences in some of these new structures that he had seen were, based on their chemistry. Hubbard, 
Let me ask you this, had there been a fire? Had there been a fire in his laboratory in the time that you were around? Page, fire? Fire? It doesn't ring a bell. Bird, what the professor is asking, Mr. Page, is that there are no pictures left and he made movies as well, and all of the pictures, and all of the movies have gone, and disappeared, or been stolen, or been burned, or been something or other. Page, well I don't think they were lost in a fire. Now there may have been a fire because somebody wanted a fire sale, that sort of a thing. This I don't know. Or possibly to destroy something. His laboratory was not burned down. It was used after. In fact he sold it, and the person that was using it was a chemist who worked for the outfit that makes Southern Comfort whiskey. The guy was working on essences. And that's all he worked on, the man that was in the laboratory that was bought for him from Roy Rife. Hubbard, well now, let's go back a minute. You say you were a child across the street from Rice? Page, no, I wasn't a child living across the street from him. I knew him when I was a child, but I live across the street from his laboratory, not across from his house. His house was on another street, sort of diagonally through a couple of vacant lots. They are not vacant lots now of course. But that was after World War II. My parents bought part of the Bridges estate when it was put on the market. The Bridges estate was owned by the wealthy Amelia Timken Bridges, Rife's main benefactor. Rife's first laboratory was located above the garage on the Bridges estate. Rife's second laboratory, built near the Bridges estate, is the one to which Paige is referring, and I helped my folks build a home there after World War II. My wife and I helped them weekends and evenings while I was going back to school and as soon as the second bedroom was finished we moved into the house. That's when I was living across the street from him for the second time. Hubbard, what I am trying to get at Mr. Page, is as much as possible of the history of the photographs that were made with this microscope. This is crucially important. So as far as you know then, there was no fire destruction in Rife's laboratory up until the time you met him? Page, well, I met him when I was a child, and he had a lot of these pictures then. Hubbard, a lot of them. Do you mean 10? Or 20? Page, oh gee, I don't know. He had, well, just in his hallway there was probably, oh, a dozen and a half, something like that. Bird, and these were blown up just to put on the walls of the hallways. Page, yeah. But there were other pictures too in some of the other rooms. I remember one room in which he had one pretty good sized area, but there was something in there, racks for storage batteries. But that has nothing to do with the microscope. Hubbard, let me ask, when did you leave the neighborhood where Wright's laboratory and his home were? Page, oh, let's see, 1947. Then, I never really came back to live there anymore, but I guess because my folks live across the street from him there, it was their home, where I lived for a short period of time I'd stop to see him every time I'd come into town. Hubbard, when is the last time you saw him then? Page, I guess the last time I saw him was when I was back as a hospital patient. I'd come back from Korea and I was a hospital patient in San Diego. That was pretty much 1952. Hubbard, had Mr. Crane joined Rife at that time? Page. I don't associate that name with anything specific. But the last time I saw Roy Rife was at his home on Zola Street. He opened his garage and showed me some of his units, that had nothing to do with microscopy, that he was selling for junk parts for radio hams to come pick up the parts and use them. He had the ghosts of three of them left at the time that I saw them. That's the last recollection I have of seeing Rife. Bird, those were the ray devices. Page. Yeah. They looked like small diathermy cabinets on Wills and Hubbard, he was taking them apart and selling them? Page, well he preferred to sell whole units. If somebody only wanted part of one, why then he would cannibalize one that had already been cannibalized to some extent? He was just trying to get the money off them. His eyes were shot, he couldn't see much of anything anymore. He had already gotten rid of his microscope and all the equipment and everything else, and he sold his laboratory, and he was running out of money to live, and he could hardly see what he was doing. Hubbard, 
he could hardly see. And this was in 1952? Bird, you remember Professor that he was going to Dr. Heisner there to try to get his eyesight back? Hubbard, yes. So, the time that you last saw him Mr. Page he was really not alert and able to work was he? Page, he couldn't see. His eyes looked red and they were a little runny. He told me how much trouble he was having with them. The light outside bothered him. When we went out the door and down the steps he had a little problem with the steps, and we got out to the garage and he showed me the units and I said I wanted to buy one. Bird, Mr. Page told me, Professor Hubbard, and this comes directly from Ben Cohen, that he would work for hours and hours without moving, getting these things to illuminate. Page, he used a big microscope on a hydraulic device. It was a barber chair without the chair on it. Hubbard, oh! Which scope? Page, that was the big one. The eyepieces came straight out from the top of the thing, and then he had one above that for photography. The only way he could rest his back or his neck was to jack this thing up or down a little bit. He would sit there for hours and hours at a time taking one picture. That's why I was kidding him one time, I said, why didn't you drive those things? You know? And he thought for a while and he said, I don't know, I never thought about it. Hubbard, having a motor drive on his focusing unit? Page, right. And that was right after he told me that he was the brightest man in his whole generation and probably two or three generations each side of it. Hubbard, he said what now? Page, it was just less than a minute after that, I think, that he had told me that he was probably the brightest man the most brilliant man, in his generation, and perhaps a generation or two each side of his. Laughs I said, so why didn't you ever think of driving those things mechanically? Bird. It was not just driving the microscope but also the prisms. Page, yeah, that it was, the prisms to illuminate it because he would spend hours he'd turn one prism just slightly, revolve it just slightly, and then he would slowly go through 360 degrees with the second one. Then, he'd move the first one again, very, very slowly. Anytime he would come to anything that would light up suddenly under the microscope he would stop. Bird. When he rotated the prisms, he'd get a certain kind of monochromatic light, depending on where the prism was, and then he could light up not only a specimen, but part of a specimen, to reveal something in it that no one had ever seen. Hubbard, well Chris, this is what is most important for me to find out from Mr. Page. On the big universal microscope there are two sets of facing prisms that were rotatable through an axial cable to the right page. Well I thought each of those one set was immediately above another. Hubbard, one set was immediately above another. Page, I didn't know he had sets of prisms, I thought he only had two prisms. Bird, you may be talking about another microscope? Page, well this cable device and all, that you are talking about, yeah, he had the simple knobs out in front, that took him hours and hours to rotate these things. Hubbard. This is the universal microscope that I am talking about. Was this the one he was looking through? Page, a very large barrel? Stainless steel? A beautiful looking thing bird, I think it's the number 5 microscope. Hubbard, well, number 5 was in England. Bird, no, it didn't go to England till 1940. Hubbard, what year are you talking about now Mr. Page? Page, oh gee, um, well, I could have been looking at the thing before the war and talking about it afterwards. Hubbard, well if he was looking through the microscope before the war, it could have been the universal. If it was after the war it could have been the number 4, or number 5 before the number 5 went to England. But I think that number 5 went to England in 1940, so that would mean that it would either be number 3, the universal, or number 4. Page, well the last one that he had, that I saw him with was a very large barreled, stainless steel housing, and that's what made me think of mirrors because it looked like a short section of a telescope barrel. Hubbard, did he have numerous attachments on the side? Page, no this one was fairly simple. At this time Hubbard had already been to Crane's house and had examined the universal number 3 in the number 4 Rife microscopes, Ed Hubbard, okay, now then, let's go back then. So now we are dealing with number 4 then. 
Now the number 4 only has but one set of prisms on it, between the illuminator and the substage condenser there is one set of prisms. The prisms rotate in opposite directions to one another. Page, yep. Hubbard, and that set of prisms is only about as thick as your finger. Do you remember? There are some numbers on the sides. Page, a finger and a half. Hubbard, a finger and a half. Okay. Now, there was some numbers on the side of that prism. But you say he would rotate this prism very slowly? Page, yes, by turning the knobs out front. It was way back in the back of this thing, he couldn't reach around to it. Bird, he rotated the prisms John, in order to get the monochromatic illumination, to shift through the spectrum and select what he wanted, to illuminate the specimen whatever it was. This was the key to the unique illumination system in Wright's microscopes. He used light to stain the sample to illuminate structure instead of the dyes and stains of standard light microscopy. The result was that instead of looking at dead microbes normal microbiology, he was able to image them at much higher resolution while they were still alive and functioning, at page, to slowly shift all the way through the spectrum you'd turn one prism just a touch, and then you'd go through the other one, slowly. 360 degrees. You'd turn the first prism a touch more, then go through the other one 360 degrees. And do it again and again and again. It would take him hours. Hubbard, that would be very time consuming. If he was using number 4, he was using the rotation of the prisms below the substage, and then he may have been rotating the stage itself. Page, he had other controls for the stage. He could move his stage. Yes, but that wasn't directly related to this. But what he was doing with those prisms was just going through the spectrum. Bird, that was the key to it. Page, it was just like spectroscopy on a microscopic scale. You use oblique illumination, and you shift through the spectrum. And that's all he was doing. And that's why he could hypothesize as to what the particular structures that he saw were doing, based on their chemistry. Hubbard. How did he relate chemistry of the organisms to the spectrum? Page, Spectroscopy Hubbard, but you can relate certain elements, and you can, with infrared microscopy, relate molecular structure but with visible light, you cannot make deductions about chemical structure with except for elemental analysis, with visible light. Page, well, I don't know, but that's what he was doing. I've had no experience in spectroscopy, but that's what he was doing completely. Now, he had put an awful lot of organisms with an awful lot of internal structures under his microscope, and he had a pretty good idea what some of those structures were doing. And they lit up in a particular part of the spectrum, and something else lit up in that same particular part. He was basing it on that. Hubbard, do you know whether he ever mentioned ultraviolet emission from his tungsten illuminator? Page, well, he had gotten away from tungsten. Hubbard. What was he using as an illuminator when you knew him? Page, he was using carbon arcs. He built his own rods. He was not happy that he had to build his own carbon rods, but he said that he could not find good, clean carbon rods. They were all contaminated and they were all ruining his research. And he gave up on using tungsten long before that. Hubbard, now, Chris, I could not find, when I was out there, there being John Crane's house in San Diego, and I did not see any carbon arc machines. Bird, that's why you are talking to Mr. Page. Page, he rife showed me some of his rods and he said he built them. Now is the man a charlatan, was he lying? I don't know. Eventually he completely sold me, because it was not just the microscope, there were an awful lot of things involved. It involved the rife ray and some physicians that had worked with him at the time two different ones who happened to be very good friends of my parents. Bird, who were they? Page, a couple of doctors in San Diego. They are both dead at the present time. Bird, was one by the name of Kush. Page, I don't know anybody named Kush out there in San Diego. No. They had both been contributing some of their own time at the Paradise Valley Sanitarium. Bird, oh, that was Dr. Hammer, was he one of them? He was head of the Paradise Valley Sanitarium. Page, that's not one of the ones that I recall. They were not there permanently, 
they were giving some of their time. Paradise Valley, as I remember, was a free clinic and they had so-called hopeless cases of syphilis and TB and probably some other things. They were sent there to die. If they couldn't afford to die in a regular hospital someplace, then they'd go to Paradise Valley. It was sort of a charity clinic more or less at the time. And they were donating some of their time there and they got involved in some tests. Hubbard, well, Mr. Page, let me come back now you never really got to spend much time looking, yourself, through one of Wright's microscopes at any specimens, did you? Page, I told you, I never did. I could understand what he was doing. But never when I was there visiting him, was the scope being used. Hubbard, it was not being used when you had visited him? Page, no, there were other things going on at the time, but there was never any scope being used. Now, I just handed two gentlemen a copy of a patent but I am not using the illuminator at the present time. But it exists. Hubbard, how old were you, in your early teens, your middle teens, or your late teens when you first met Rife? Page, oh, before my teens I am sure. My folks had known him for years. Hubbard, so you were a child really? Page, yes sir. He was one of these people you would see off and on and off and on and off and on. Bird, what's your age now Mr. Page? Page, 58, I'll be 58 inches June. Bird, so in 1953 you were a young man graduating from college, or out of the Navy. Page, in 1953, well, I got out of the Navy the first time in 1943. I had been recalled to active duty. The Navy caught me working for the Army at Fort Benning, Georgia, and the Navy sent me out with the Marines as punishment I guess. Laugh summary of abridged passage A bit of personal history from Page. Then, below back to Rife and a discussion about microtomes, which are the slicing machines pathologists used to section tissue samples, similar to the cold cut slicer at the deli. Being a pathologist, Hubbard is particularly interested in Rife's specimen preparation techniques, which are believed to be among the most inventive ever devised. Hubbard, let me ask you some other questions Mr. Page, did Dr. Rife ever look at red blood cells, white blood cells? Did he ever look at any leukocytes? Or did he ever look at any algae when you were there? Page, he had looked at algae, we had discussed it. We discussed insects. We discussed fungi. I can say that he had looked at red blood cells. He gave me a bunch of slides that had sections, very thin sections of different types of cancer. Hubbard, how did he make his sections, his thin sections you say? Page, as I remember he had a huge sledge microtome. Hubbard, a huge sledge microtome? Page, yeah, the old sliding blade, you know, it looked like a straight razor but it was much larger than that, a great big heavy thing. Hubbard, now Chris, this is important. That is one of the most important new observations that we have gotten. Page, I remember it was huge. It was much bigger than the sledge microtome I used in college and I used the biggest one that San Diego State had at the time. It was the department head's pet. Hubbard, now the sledge microtome that I am thinking of, that is huge, the blade moves in the horizontal. Page, yes dropping downward very slightly as it moves in the horizontal, on a slight angle downward, not perfectly horizontal. Is that the size you are talking about? Hubbard, well, pretty much so, was the blade about a foot long? Page, let me see. I'd say longer than a foot. I'm guessing about 14 or 15 inches. Hubbard, was this a microtome that you had ever seen used to cut sections of brain? Page, well I don't know that it would cut across a complete human brain. No. It wasn't in one slice. If you were cutting from the top down you would have to have a very thin section that you would have cut off the top because the thing, on a slight angle, would have had to have been longer than I believe it was. If you just took a block of the brain tissue, then yes, this would probably do a real good job. But I don't know what he used for embedding media. Hubbard. You don't know what he used for embedding media? Page, no sir, I don't know. He may have used paraffin with rubber in it. Latex? Hubbard, let me ask you, did you ever see him using a microtome, 
actually cutting with it? Page, no sir, I have never personally seen him doing any of the things that he claimed to have done. I have only seen him when he was relaxed, or when he was unrelaxed but unhappy about something. I've never seen him at work in his laboratory. I have visited his laboratory but he stopped what he was doing to talk with me for a couple of hours at a time. But I wasn't watching him work at the time. I have been in his laboratory several times with a white coat. Hubbard, let me ask you, as a child now, do you remember if there was a woman working there in his laboratory who was the daughter of a Dr. Kendall? Renowned bacteriologist Dr. Arthur Kendall worked with Rye for several years beginning in 1931. Together, they developed a technique that revealed nascent life cycles of the typhoid bacillus. They published their findings in California and Western Medicine Medical Journal. Commentary on their article was titled, Has a New Field Been Opened in Bacteriology? It is believed that Kendall's daughter worked in Rife's lab for a short period, and confirmation of this is what Hubbard is getting at, Ed Page, no sir, just offhand, I don't recall. Hubbard, do you recall any women working there in his laboratory? Page, there were people. I have seen a woman in the laboratory. There were three or four other people sometimes when I was there. Now, I guess she must have been working there. But I can't swear to that. Hubbard, this was as a child that you saw these people working in his laboratory, didn't you? Page, yes, pre-teenage, and early teenage, and I don't recall seeing people in there in my late teens. I just don't recall. I could have. Hubbard, were there any people working around him when you were in your late twenties? Page, my late twenties let's see there was somebody around there, yes sir. A man, slightly built, rather thin. Taller than Rife Hubbard, did you know a Dr. Kendall? Page, no sir. Hubbard, did you ever see any notebooks or records, which Rife was keeping of his observations? Page, yes sir. One very thick notebook was placed in my hands, and I put it on a little table in his garden. Hubbard, Chris, can you show Mr. Page your copies of those frequency data sheets that I copied? I wish you could show them and see if he can identify those as being in Rife's handwriting. Bird, but I can't do it now because they are at home and I am down with Mr. Page in Springfield. Hubbard, at a later time than Mr. Page. Bird, could you identify Roy Rife's handwriting Mr. Page? Page, I doubt it. It was very small. It was rather precise in that he would make every letter very clearly. Now. It seems to me that there were two or three letters which he made differently from most people, but very quickly you started reading and you can follow it right along and it becomes routine and familiar to you. Hubbard, but Rife did keep notebooks? Page, oh yes sir. He kept one very convincing and very complete notebook and he handed it to me and said, this is my life, my whole life, right here. Hubbard, now Chris, if we could get a hold of that notebook. Page, that would be interesting wouldn't it? You see I had it, he was giving it to me. Hubbard, he gave it to you? Page, yes sir, he gave it to me. And then I made a mistake. It's one of the mistakes that I regret more than any other I've made, and I've made a lot of them. I'll cut this story very short do you remember hearing in the 40s, reading in the newspapers, about some flying saucers, or something, coming over from Russia? Hubbard, well, I remember flying saucers have been in the newspapers at various times page, well, this started a flying saucer scare, whether they were flying saucers, or low flying rockets, but they were controllable. People from the little villages in some of the free countries in Western Europe, they were a few miles from the Russian border and they would interview everybody in the village, you know, and their stories were all almost alike. There would be just enough differences to account for human fallibility. But these things would come over, they would fly in formation, they would loop and turn and so forth, and then they would go back into Russia. And there'd be stories in the newspapers. And it was a nice pleasant day and I was sitting out there in Rife's garden, and we had some tea that his wife made for us. And he was telling me, don't put sugar in it, it's not good for you, and I was putting it in anyway, cause I don't think it's very good without it. I don't like it without it. But. This was after he had given me the notebook, 
and we were sitting there chatting, and he kept asking me about them flying saucers, what do you think about these? Well, the papers say they are Russian, I don't know. Well, what do you think they are doing? And I said, well, I don't know, maybe they're spying on us. Do you think they might have weapons underneath? And I said well, they might not have the bomb yet, so. Do you think they could probably get it someday? They probably could, if we've got people smart enough to build one, they could build one. But maybe they put something else in it. And Reif said, well, what else would they put in it? I said, well, they might put the Reif Ray in there. And he just beamed all over, you know, and he said, why, that would be wonderful. And I said, yeah, you could fly around a city, you know, just circle a city. And he said that would be wonderful, we could heal everybody. He was almost trembling, like a little child, so elated. And I said, yeah Roy, we could tune it to hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a main component of red blood cells. Page was jokingly suggesting to Rife that the beam ray machine could be used as a beam weapon to kill human beings by targeting red blood cells with their determined specific resonant frequency instead of targeting the designated pathogenic organisms for which the machine was designed, Ed and his face kinda went blank, and then he got kinda grey, and he began to tremble and shake, and he ran over, and he was screaming at me, you can't do things like that to people. Don't you know that you can't do things like that to people? And he picked up a rake and started after me. And I vaulted over the wall. And he told me never to come back and he was shouting at me. Somehow I think he ought to have been swearing at me, but I don't think I had ever heard Roy swear. I went back later but I was never able to get my hands on it, I never saw the notebook after that. Hubbard, this is very strange. This is the only time you ever saw Rife get so upset, wasn't it? Page, I have seen him become provoked when he would start to talk about these idiots in the medical profession and in the universities because they couldn't repeat the things that he had done, as precisely as he had done them then they didn't believe that they had really been done by him. He would become upset with people but this is the only time I had seen them really become emotionally violent. Bird. How could they possibly repeat the experiments if they didn't have the equipment? Page, well, they would come in and work with him, he would tell me, and he would tell them to do this and this and this and this, some of them could do it while they were in his lab. Then they would go to some place else. And he said, well, they were always sloppy. He said, I distill all my water seven times. And I do this and I do that and I do the other thing. And he said they are sloppy they don't use pure chemicals. And he would go on and on. But, ah oh, that was the only time I had seen him really angry. Hubbard, so, after this peculiar reaction to your comments about the use of widespread rife radiation and you had to climb over the fence to get away from him? Page, I didn't climb over it, I bolted over it. Laughs Hubbard, and he was after you with the rake. He wasn't just joking, he was really angry. Page, Yes sir. He was not joking. He was smaller than I was, I thought I could have taken the rake away from him, but I figured that it made a lot more sense to just get out of his reach. Hubbard, but he offered to give you his notebook? Page, he had handed it to me. I set it down on the table. Hubbard, and when you saw him again, did you ever ask him for that notebook? Page, I asked him for it. I asked him where it was, but he said, Somebody else has it. Hubbard, he said somebody else has it? Page, that was it. He didn't apparently want to discuss it very much. Hubbard, gee, that's a very peculiar reaction. Page, I could tell some long stories about that notebook and what might have happened to it, and what's happened to me because of it, and a few things that involve the FBI and military intelligence, but I'm not going to go over it. Comments, Page is most loaded of sentences. Page's interview is important because it forces us to ask the oddly overlooked, but very large question, would the so-called military-industrial complex MIC be interested in Rife's work inventions know-how? Or, more to the point, have they been interested in it, and, are they interested in it? Serious contemplation of this idea forces many other questions, 
Would the MIC be interested in acquiring advanced optics technology, something that would provide an extreme advantage in strategic superiority in espionage operations vis vis advanced telescopes, spy satellite camera optics, and forensic microscopes? Would the MIC be interested in acquiring an advanced energy weapon apparatus and concept? Would the MIC be interested in a device that can selectively kill any species of microorganism with an invisible, tomb ray that can be fired from any distance and cover a variable target area? Wouldn't that sort of thing be kind of useful as a defense against a bio-warfare attack? Anthrax, no problem tune up the machine poof, poof, poof no more anthrax. Would the MIC be interested in the above described device if it could also double as the ultimate weapon against enemy personnel? Instead of tuning and targeting the device to kill microorganisms, it theoretically can be power and frequency modified to attack vital cellular structure within the human body. Anybody under the raid suffers the fate of their red blood cells exploding, or their hypothalamus turn to mush in an instant, or their central nervous system fried like a transformer blowing up or any other collapsible physiological system could be targeted. Have the MIC sat around tables and thought about all the awful things one could do with such a weapon both viscerally and economically? Have they thought it through and decided it's for them? Let's develop it before the enemy does or in case the enemy does. Let's use it secretly and be miles ahead of everyone without them even knowing it. Or, have they decided to put it on the stack in the room in the warehouse in the storage facility where they keep all the scary stuff that the world isn't ready for? The stuff that threatens the complex part of the military-industrial guy's crazy world of hawks and doves, mine's bigger than yours, and I'm not telling. The main question is, once appraised of the potentials available with Rife technology, both optical and beam ray, would the MIC be able to resist either exploiting it, or at the very least, controlling its exploitation? In the early 1950s, Robert Page was engaged in the Navy as a scientist tackling the problem of pest control, a very large and multifaceted dilemma for the armed forces. They had been having no success in several quarters, and finally, exasperated and desperate, he turned to Wright who he thought could help this vis the beam ray machine, the ultimate pest control device. In a letter dated November 3, 1953, Page implores Wright to lend his expertise in technology to their cause. After a long explanation of their problem and a lengthy begging of Wright's association and help, Page writes, Would you be willing to help us? Would you furnish the basic design or the one used in the small cabinets that you had in 1946-1947, and give us some of the frequencies we need to test the equipment? There is little that I can offer in return for your help, but I will make three solemn promises. First, that I will do all I possibly can do to keep the rife ray from being used as a weapon to destroy man. Second, I will do all I can to ensure that if there is any financial gain that it will go to you, or to a Royal Rife Ray Research Foundation. Third, that I'll do everything that I can to ensure that you get the credit for the development. You are in a unique position. You can offer a second time a wonderful gift to your fellow man. We need you. Please help us. Bob. End letter. Rife was a drunk by the time he read this plea, if he read it at all, Ed Hubbard, continuing well, look Chris, you'll follow up on that angle, won't you? Bird, well, whatever Mr. Page wants to say. I'll listen. Hubbard, well, look, I'll leave that part of it with you to follow up on getting the notebook. Mr. Page, it's extremely important. Let me tell you now everything hinges on these pictures which have been published in the Smithsonian Institute report. There is so little left, if we could get a hold of his original notebooks, if we could get a hold of... Page, I could tell you some of the things that were there in the notebook, now, not the specific details of how he did what, but are you at all conversant on the subject of his charts? They were like the periodic charts for elements, his charts were for microorganisms. Have you heard about them? Hubbard, no I haven't. Bird, nor have I Page, he built a chart that was sort of like the periodic chart and there was even 7 or 9 or 13 families, it was either 9 or 7, I believe. All the pathogens fit into one or another of these columns. All the pathogens getting down below worms and so forth. Viruses, 
bacteria of various types, and fungi of various types, and on up through an evolutionary type ladder. And, he claimed he could breed the mutations or, not mutations that he could breed changes by changing the media, and other growing conditions in addition to the media bird, that we have. Page, but, all human pathogens fell onto this chart. And that the key to each of these columns, which would have a very small virus at the bottom and a pretty good size fungus at the top, that within that column there was a single T protein. Bird, and these pathogens in a single column could transmute one into another depending on the medium? Page, but they remain true to this one protein, they always have this one protein in them. Now this is what he saw with his microscope. Now if you take a step beyond this, and of course all the time he was looking for a cure for cancer that his mother died of when he was a child, but if you take a step beyond this thing then he could tell himself. Well, gee, if I could just destroy seven proteins or nine proteins or whatever it was without hurting the human body, then I could wipe out all disease. Hubbard, let me ask you also Mr. Page, did Rife have any interest? Now Chris, this might seem very strange, but have reason for it did Rife have any interest in paintings? Visual art? Did he ever buy any paintings? Was he ever in contact with any artist? Page, you are tickling something way back in the back of my head but I can bring it forward. Sorry. Hubbard, did he have any interest in watercolors or oil paints? Page, well back at this particular point in my life I could be confusing it with one of my aunts having an interest in this. I can't say yes, I'm afraid. Hubbard, as far as you know did Rife ever have any contact with a painter, an artist painter? In the interests of scientific rigor, Hubbard is here trying to eliminate the unlikely possibility that the photomicrographs published in the Smithsonian Institute article might be fraudulent, possibly paintings, Ed Page, if I knew I don't recollect. I know that he liked nice things. His home was always very neat and very nice. Hubbard, the photographs of the organisms that he had did he have those enclosed in picture frames? Page, yes sir. Hubbard, he did? All right. Page, with glass in front. Hubbard, with glass in front of them, and frames on the sides? Page, yes. Hubbard, did he have most of his microphotographs so enclosed? Page, well, the ones that were hanging on the walls, in the hallway and in some of the rooms. Hubbard, you have no idea whatever happened with those, do you? Page, no sir, I don't. Now, all of the ones that I saw were black and white. They were none in color. One reason I was particularly sorry when he had gotten rid of his microscope was, because, when, I had been kidding him about the thing you know. Why didn't you ever drive it mechanically? Summary of a bridge passage suddenly Page is distracted by a rustling of papers and a murmur from Bird. He begins referring to a diagram. Followed by Page digressing with a somewhat confusing story about a crude system for projecting colors from black and white film that his father had shown him. Then Bird suggests another story for Page to tell to Hubbard Bird, I want you to tell the story to Professor Hubbard that you told me, right over again. There's a reason for this. Page. Which story was that? Bird, the company that you took the equipment to in Washington. Page, to make a long story fairly short, I went to visit this company, I called them first and they suggested I bring this illuminator unit out. I took my microscope and my illuminator out. And I showed them the illuminator. There were three gentlemen there that owned this small company, one was the president, the other one maybe both others were, I guess, the vice presidents. They were all three optical engineers. The recollection that I have is that each of the three of them had at one time worked for Bausch and Lum and had, at another time, worked for American Optical. I could be wrong, maybe not all three of them had worked for both companies. Hubbard, do you remember their names? Page, I've got the names of one or two of them written down in my correspondence. I took the unit out. They were very much interested. I was out there several times. I was interested in getting a fairly inexpensive medical unit, make it available. I'm talking just about the illuminator. All you needed if you had a clinical microscope is a substage condenser that will take a dark field stop, 
and then you are in business. If you can't use it for true monochromatic light you can at least use it for what amounts to interference coloration and for phase microscopy. You can use a field of any color you want with contrasting illumination. You can see things that you can't see without it. You can see living tissue without having to stain it. You can see inside the cells. You can see all kinds of things. You don't have to have a phase microscope or an interference coloration microscope. I was interested in seeing this unit get into clinical laboratory use and also to get into schools. In schools you could have a relatively cheap student unit made out of plastic, after all, my unit is made out of plastic, parts of it. I made it myself. And there is no reason why something like this couldn't go on the market fairly inexpensively. And it was either the second or third time that I was out there they told me that they had decided that the first unit that they would like would be a very expensive research unit, the optics would be all quartz. And I forget now what they were going to charge then, but that was a number of years ago, 18 or 19 I guess, and at that point in time they were going to charge what I thought was a terrible price. They said, well, it would be a pure precision instrument. It would be a wonderful thing for the whole research society and the world at hand. And they could recoup all their costs of design and manufacture. Then, in two years or less they promised me that they would then be ready to start production of the clinical units and to be followed very quickly by the production of the very inexpensive student units. I was thinking of the student units in particular there because I thought, well shoot, if I decide it could work for the government well, then as a hobby at least, I could start producing an awful lot of pictures and selling them, because students in various courses in microbiology and parasitology and I would like to have these because they can see structures and know when they really are they can see organisms really for the first time. Or they can see life in full color. This is a fascinating thing. You can see a rotifer sit there and try and gobble up an algae cell. I just like to watch them for hours. Anyway, the cells sell the pictures, if they are pretty good pictures. But, the guy called me up, oh I guess it was less than a week after I had been there the last time, and they had been discussing it. One of them kept saying, they won't let us make this. They will not let us make this. Finally I said, who is it that won't let you make this? Well, Bausch and Lum won't let us make this. And the other two were saying, if this was American Optical they would stop us, but Bausch and Lum won't stop us, they are not that kind of people. Well, the bread and butter item that this company produced, I don't remember what it was, but I do remember that it contained a small telescope tube of some kind that Bausch and Lum manufactured and if they had to go to another producer to get this, they would have to go to an awful lot of expense. They would lose their market in the meantime, and so forth, and they might go bankrupt. Well, they never told me that Bausch and Lum stopped it. The man called me up and he said, I'm sorry but we cannot make your microscope. And I said, did they stop it? And he said, I'm sorry, I cannot answer that. Hubbard, from Page, those two companies got a great deal of their money from the sale of microscopes. Right in this immediate area, everybody worth his name as a researcher has three microscopes. He's got a research clinical type scope. He's got a good interference coloration scope. He's got a good phase microscope. And two of those came from one of those producers and the other came from another one. Or maybe one of them is a Zeiss, or maybe one of them is from Nippon Kogaku or something, but at least two out of the three came from those two American companies, and both of those companies they told me are run by their sales division. Hubbard, oh, I am sure of this. No American manufacturer of microscopes is going to put anything out on the market, which would cause it to lose money substantially. That's for sure. Page, with this, if you have a good research medical type scope you do not need to have a phase microscope to go along with it. You do not need to have an interference coloration microscope. Hubbard, well, now Mr. Page, for me to form any opinion about your illuminator or any system of microscopy you have, I would have to examine it and preferably I would want to use my own specimens page, well, Professor Hubbard, I'm not trying to sell you on my microscope. I was simply using this to explain the Rife unit, its basic thesis of illumination, is one that other people can use. 
If someone wants to use my illumination system they can make it themselves. I have told a lot of people how to make it. I don't keep it secret. It is patented. The patent is about to expire if it hasn't already. Summary of a bridge passage discussion dealing with Page's patent, the number, the time until expiry, his intent on what to do with it. A lot of paper shuffling. Most of the documents and data they are referencing can be found at rife.org in the related patents section. They continue Hubbard, the question that I am trying to resolve for myself is the lateral resolution that is shown in these photomicrographs in the Smithsonian Institute report. The lateral resolution here on that section of the spore is nothing short of fantastic, nothing short of fantastic, in the most strict sense of the word, fantastic. That is how I would have to describe the resolution seen in their page, the only thing you've seen like that is in electron microscopy, isn't it? Hubbard, it's better than the electron microscope. Page, okay, I'll go along with that. Hubbard, now, the whole thing for me is whether or not there could have been some fraud involved in the production of these photographs. Let me ask you, was there ever anything as a child, or in your associations out there with Rife that would have made you even suspect that Rife would have been fraudulent? Page, no sir. Now, he was either one of two things. He either was as he saw it, one of the greatest minds of his time, or he was a complete charlatan. And if he was a complete charlatan he was even more brilliant. Hubbard, he certainly was fooling a lot of people for a lot of time if he was a charlatan, wasn't he? Page, he couldn't continue to do this. So he would have had to be even more brilliant because he would have had to fool everybody. Hubbard, now, Mr. Page, I will, of course, be interested in reading your patent. And Chris I will probably be in touch with you and Mr. Page at a later time after I get to digest and work over a few more things here. Page, I give Chris two other patents also, just to bring out a point. There are many ways to use this type of illumination, which Rife had. These other two pertain to, I've given all three of these to the Navy, the other two pertaining to the quick detection of pathogenic organisms, in the air and in the water. These also require the use of the so-called resonant frequency that we talked about, the resonant light frequency that would illuminate the particular dominant processes in them. Everything I had was taken away. Hubbard. What's that, everything you had was taken away? Page, yes, taken away and locked up and after that I couldn't even talk to people about it. And finally a friend of mine up in Fort Detrick pulled some strings and got it shaken loose. Now a co-inventor on one of these, he was a naval reserve officer also, we both made captain at the same time, he was in the Civil Engineers Corporation and I was in the Medical Services Corporation. We figured this thing might have some value in the brewery industry but it was never used. Hubbard, this is a very strange story Mr. Page. Summary of a bridge passage another exchange of patent numbers and dates for the other patents. They continue Page, now when I say that all of these papers were taken away from me, those other two devices, they said they had potential use in biological warfare detection equipment. Hubbard. Were you developing any of the work in a naval laboratory or was this in your own personal laboratory? Page, in my home. Hubbard, incredulously in your home? Page, the early one, the microscope one, I built not even in this house but in an apartment where I lived. Hubbard, and you did all of the research work on this biological detection system in your home for these patents? Page, I have a bunch of other patents too. Hubbard. But let me make it very plain and to the point, you did certain work, you did all of this work, exclusively in your home, with this Jack Terrell, developing a biological detection system, and subsequently after you made the patent application, or was it after the patent was granted, that the papers were taken from your home? Page, the papers were not taken away, we had to deliver them. We were told, bring them in. Bring them in, this is classified Hubbard. Who told you to do this? Page, the Navy. Hubbard, the Navy told you to do it. Page, and we were happy to comply. Hubbard, well, you were on active duty, or were you inactive? Page, no, we both worked for the Navy as civilians. Hubbard, and what type of work were you doing at that time for the Navy? Page, biology. Hubbard, 
Microbiology? Page, no, I didn't say micro. Hubbard, just as biologist. Page, I have worked as a microbiologist sometimes for the Navy but I am doing about the same thing I was doing then, UMMM Hubbard. Now, let me ask you this, in your opinion, could it be legally claimed that the inventions that you and Mr. Terrell worked on, that these inventions came out as a result of your professional activities for the Navy? Page, well, generally yes, we gave them to the Navy. Hubbard, well now, the thing is Mr. Page, what I am trying to get to is whether or not the inventions were really a consequence of your association with problems encountered in your work with the Navy. Page, that was with my work at that point in time, my work in uniform at some other time. Hubbard, it is customary, of course, for many corporations to require employees to sign over rights for patents. Page, well that's not why this was given to the Navy. This was given to the Navy in the hope that they would go for the patent and it wouldn't cost us the money. The Navy works in three different ways here. If somebody is working in a Navy laboratory, they are assigned to work on a particular thing, they can work on it, they make an invention and the invention is patented. The invention is the property of the federal government. It is always issued to an individual, so the inventor's name appears on it, but the individual has to sign all rights over to the federal government. If a person works in a government laboratory, and they come up with an idea all their own, and they go to their boss and they say they'd like to work on this, and he says, no. We are too busy on Project XYZ. Can I come in at night and work on it? Well, that's up to you, if you want to then you've got a key. Well, can I use any of the facilities here? Well, yes, you'll be using the building. Now, depending on how this is interpreted, if he uses materials, as well as electricity and so forth, then they may require that it becomes the property of the federal government. On the other hand, they may be a little bit lenient and they may say that he may have it, that they will obtain the patent, that it will be in his name, but that the federal government to use it, or to buy it, royalty free. That is still a public service type patent but it does not preclude the patent owner, and in this case, the individual who owns the patent, it does not preclude this owner from charging royalties to other manufacturers, or users. But the federal government may use it royalty free or the government might buy something on a royalty-free basis. Now, the third system is, if somebody is working on his own and has no connection with the federal government, he doesn't have to be an employee of the government, but if he has something that he thinks is of value to the government, he may take it then to the government. And in this case I was not only a Navy employee, and one of the people at the patent branch of the Office of Naval Research was a friend of mine, he was in my research reserve unit, so I took it to him, and several other patents later on. But, in these cases when the patents were issued they were to me. Now I would not have to have been working for the government, I could have been a total stranger taking this to some patent branch place like O&R. But I think this would be of some value to the federal government. I think that for the government this should be a royalty free patent, and to the federal government, I'd like to retain rights of my own. Does the Navy have enough interest in this to go for a patent? Then it's up to the Navy to say yes or no, to study the thing and say, yes, we have enough interest in this, we'd go for a patent, and we will do that, just sign all of these papers. So those are the three different systems they use in government inventor instance. Interested readers should look up what the Military Secrets Act allows government to do with NO and government inventors who come under their radar at Hubbard, Mr. Page, let me go back to Rife. Did you ever hear Rife say that any of the prisms had been stolen from his big universal microscope? Page, well, the only prisms that I know of he had on the far side of it and those are the ones that you get at with those little knobs with the cables, the cable mounts. Hubbard. But he never said anything about any of the contents of the inside of his microscope being stolen? Page, no sir. I would sure like to have had it though. I hope to build one something like that someday but with considerable modifications to it. A bit smaller and twice the diameter, and one that would change that resolution by shifting. Now what I had designed may be precisely what he had. I don't know what he had inside that big barrel. Hubbard. Do you remember whether there was a big glass case enclosing his microscopes? 
page, there was a case called the gun cabinet. It's going to be here in this house in two or three weeks, but it will have shelves in it. He had some microscopic equipment in there, I don't remember just what, in there at one time, and another time he had some guns in there. Bird, why is the case going to be in your house? Did he give it to you? Page, no, he didn't give it directly to me. He gave it to my parents, and my dad put shelves back in it. Hubbard, is your daddy alive? Page, no, he's dead. Hubbard, is your mother alive? Page, yes sir. Hubbard, H H H H, did she know Rife? Page, oh yes. Hubbard, did she ever go over to the house? Page, oh she's been there a few times. I can tell you how often. Hubbard, she never had any interest in Rife's inventions did she? Page, no, she didn't understand it. My older brother understood him. He's dead also. Summary of abridged passage A discussion about which of Paige's family might have known Rife, and when. Goodbyes are said. Epilogue This interview continues with Hubbard absent Bird in a follow-up phone call to Paige at a later date. Recorded in the meantime, there was a letter exchange. In one handwritten letter to Hubbard excerpt below, Paige addresses the issue of Rife's apparent numerous personality faults as contributing factors to his professional demise. When the AMA reportedly engineered a lawsuit against Rife's company in 1939, Rife, a former teetotaler, took a stiff drink to calm his nerves prior to his subpoena dates doctor's orders and thenceforth indulged alcohol to ruin his proportions for the rest of his life. Once an alcoholic, he became ineffectual as a scientist and his 25-year run at laboratory research came to an end. August 14, 1976 Robert Page addresses John Hubbard in correspondence. Toward the end of the letter he writes this, John, Royal Raymond Rife was expert in several fields and ahead of the pack in some of them. And this can never be taken away from him. He deserves to go down in the pages of history as one of the great, or at least one of the near great minds of our century. But he will not get this reward because of a personality fault or several of those. 1. I've often had the feeling that he divided all humanity in two groups, those he could trust implicitly, and those to never be trusted. 2. He had nearly complete contempt for the mental abilities of 99.9% .9 of the members of the medical profession and particularly if they were as you are involved in the teaching of medical students. I think this particular attached to the schools more than to faculty members as individuals. He often expressed complete and utter contempt for research faculty types. They would visit his laboratory but could repeat his work only if he stood behind them telling them how and when to take each new step. His contempt for some highly renowned scientists was, I had thought, so widely known that men of small stature would be out to shoot him down. 3. He never checked up on people he should and shouldn't trust. 4. He was never emotionally prepared for any reversals because he never expected any and couldn't really accept them when they came. 5. His basic philosophy in life was to help people through his giant intellect given him for this reason, and when people were ready to jail him for his acts good or bad legal or illegal, he fell apart. Roy enjoyed adulation and don't be all. One way to get it is to do things no one else can do or do things better. I always felt that Roy needed this more than most people do. He got this in varying degrees and from various people for various accomplishments, and this WAS 90% OF his life. And when this was changed to condemnation, it was more than he could take. You spoke of alcohol as Roy's escape. I heard of stronger materials, but I have no real knowledge of this. Certainly he had access to whatever he wanted, through his in-laws, and otherwise. With all of his good points he was only a man and not perfect. He liked drama. He lived to be a little bit mysterious. If he knew that he could create design, build, write whatever someone thing better than anyone else could, he was in seventh heaven. He would turn this into a drama. And if he could show up the medical profession the research part of it, he was happy. John, I've mentioned the medical profession several times in Ray Rife. I shall hasten to tell you that several MDS thought a great deal of Roy of Roy the scientist and of Roy the humanitarian. 
My parents were in a bridge club that included five or six MDS as well as quite a few members of other professions. Some of those MDS thought the world of Roy. They saw his ray completely cure nearly hopeless cases of TB and syphilis. By cure, they meant only destruction of pathogens, not regeneration of tissue and letter passage stronger materials. At end of part 1, Robert Page Requiem for Royal Rife, part 2 The Hubbard Interviews, Ben Cullen on Methods of Genius, AMA Madness, and John Barley Cohen's Hold on Rife by Sean Montgomery 3-30-7 Interview with Ben Cullen by John Hubbard Abridged, Edited, and Annotated by Sean Montgomery from a transcript of a talk with Ben Cullen recorded sometime in the 1950s in which Cullen describes how he befriended Rife. Rife liked to come down to my garage and play his French horn, play his guitar and mandolin and cello. Believe me, he sent the visitors into seventh heaven. Rife started one day playing his French horn. He played operas like Rigoletto and Il Trovatore perfectly. All of the people on the block came down to hear Rife's music in the garage. There must have been 100 people there before he quit. Rife's eyes were just running water because he put his whole heart and soul into his playing. From that time on we became very fast friends. I followed Rife every night. I went out to work with Rife. There was so much we could talk about in each other's language that we communicated well. I was a journeyman and tool and die maker from England and Rife was 100% Scotch. I made a steady pilgrimage to Rife's garage where we set up a shop with machinery to build his microscopes. Rife began to become deeply involved in bacteriology. We would discuss microorganisms. We began to install in his workshop equipment tools and machines. I bought a pretty nice little centrifuge. In 1933, we began to build Rife's third microscope, the big universal microscope. Rife also developed the Rife Ray machine. He had purchased many electronic instruments and was in close contact with Coolidge and Steinmetz of General Electric Company. They shipped Rife thousands of big X-ray tubes radio tubes, and parts for his instruments. Dr. Lee Day Forrest, inventor of the radio tube worked with us weekends to help put the circuits together. From a letter dated May 16, 1977 to journalist Christopher Bird from John Hubbard reporting on his just completed research trip to California. Of course the high points of my trip were the personal visits with Benjamin Cullen, and Henry Siner, and Bernard Gross. What I did first was to go visit with Benjamin Cullen. He is indeed a most remarkable man to me. I taped nearly two hours of an interview with him and I believe he is the most vigorous octogenarian I have ever known. His speech was swift, although the voice was not a strong one. He is incisive and could make recollections stretching back into the distant past or into the very near recent past with equal facility, almost. He was quite busy also. He talked with me for over two hours at his home, and the next morning was flying to meet one of NASA's physicists in the southwest for some discussions on parapsychological phenomena. The following week, when he came back to town he drove in to meet Henry Siner and myself at the Imperial Bank. I have never known a man in his late 80s to drive an automobile. Then again I have never known an 86-year-old man to have a 35-year-old wife, which Cullen does. The following interview was recorded in April 1977 at Ben Cullen's home in Spring Valley, California. Hubbard, do you remember that picture of the spore? The tetanus spore in the Smithsonian Institute report, and that is the one which is particularly important. And you were telling me the last time we talked on the phone that Rife had split a baby's hair in four parts, did he try to put the spore, the tetanus organism, in like this in the four parts? Making clasping motion with three fingers and thumb simulating baby hairs colon, you see what happened was this, first he took the hair and mounted it into a matrix, erect, to hold it straight. Then he mounted in a micro dissector with a very fine, sharply honed blade. And he used a portion of a safety razor blade with which he had cut and honed it down very, very thin. To look at a razor blade ordinarily, it looks like this tracing jagged line in the air with finger even though it is a good edge to shave by. He had to have it so thin that it was almost so thin that he had to be careful not to move it either this way or that way or it would bend. Blown up on a microscope, that is, 
one of these reflectometers or something like that, it was a very, very rugged edge, but nevertheless, by moving it back and forth it cut down through the hair. First, he removed all the outside excess mounting wax that he had. And of course, you can call it a matrix if you wish, holding the hair, it was held in a special vise, a small vise, and he came on down through, and sawed down until he got down to one quarter of an inch of the hair cut down. And then he cut this through and removed that half, which then you have a half round condition for one quarter of an inch. And then he turned that sideways and split that right down from the top to the area where it was cut away to make a half of a hair. Then he fared that off very carefully so as to have no sharp edges, and also, you know, in any machine condition, whether it's a hair or a piece of steel or anything else, you have to have a radius. And how he put that radius in was very, very interesting indeed. He contrived a very, very fine hair with some very extremely fine dust, which he called, let's see. It was something like rouge, and he held this half hair in the matrix. He worked this back and forth with a little reciprocating frame, like this, so that the hair with the impregnated, something like diamond, only he said it was a type of rouge gradually he was able to produce a radius right in at the cut of the hair. Then he feathered the entire balance of the hair off to a point so that there would not be a sharp sudden break off. Then he turned the hair over, after of course he recovered it from the wax, and turned it over, and with some very fine pairs of tweezers. He used about a 12 power glass. He mounted that on a very small chuck, the type of chuck that you can twist to collapse the interior three gripping surfaces so he could get it into a center, something like the old fashioned carpenter's brace or any other type of drill holding chuck, but it was very, very small. He did a splendid job on that. I think he first tried Tobin bronze and he found it was too poor so he went to. He couldn't choose titanium because he didn't have then the tools to work titanium. I think he was able to get, at that time, some annealed chrome molybdenum and he was able to use it so that he could make up a very fine chuck. And so he turned it up in the lathe. He had a jeweler's lathe. In fact he had several lathes. And that little chuck was made up so that the hair could be entered in that chuck and closed up so as to hold it. Now the trick, of course, was to hold it so that the two pieces of the hair, as it was spread as it was pushed down it would spread and of course this is the top side the rounded side, this is the flat side under here motioning. And as it was pressed down, like this, it would open. Now the reason was because the hair naturally has some spring back like any material, and he found that they were sufficient to bring about a gripping of these tetanus bacilli. He tried it with a hookworm bacillus first, and the hookworm, I know he laid a dozen of them in a row, and it was quite interesting, and then after that of course he was working with the tetanus bacillus. So that's what he did. In picking it up after he had put this down, first he had the thing mounted in a very fine multiple leverage manipulator, in other words, by moving his main lever, it would be like a very, very fine vernier, he could move it with say a one half inch and get just a couple of thousandths, or one half a thousandths of movement on this little chuck here. Hubbard, laughs yes, okay. Colin, and then he laid it down like this and opened it. And then he had a means of moving the whole framework like that to the bacillus, and then as he raised it up the two ends of the hair closed on the bacillus but there was insufficient power to crush it. It picked it up but it didn't crush it. Then of course by manipulating the whole thing it laid on a slide until he had enough of them on a slide, and then of course put it on the microscope and took his photographs. Hubbard, how much time was he working on this project? Colin, you mean the entire project? He started when first I met him in 1913. Hubbard, no, just on this bacillus. Colin, oh the bacillus oh, it took him a full 10 days, because, for a long time he would say, I've got to see the entire project in my mind first. So he would go to bed and leave a pad and pencil by his bed. He had an ability, which, you might understand, to call on the same as Beethoven did to get his music, from the other side. At 11, 12 or 1 o'clock, he would wake up with some information and put it down. And by the end of about two or three days, he'd called me up and say, Ben, I got a lot of information. Come over and see it. Of course, 
I always spend more time than I should have, because I always had to get up at 6 a.m. in the morning. I never got to bed here until about 12 or 1 a.m. in the morning. I lost a lot of sleep on that deal. You see he was on Point Loma and I live right out here. I've been out here for 46, 47 years now. Then so, I would go over and it mechanically looked very good. So then he started, and after he had it all fixed up, first there was a micro dissector. He did another little trick too, he dissected. In fact he took a very small human embryo that had been a miscarriage, and he cut it in very fine slices and was able to study so much, and that is another project. Returning to the tetanus bacillus. After he had them all laid out, there wasn't one of them that was mashed in any way, shape or form. Of course, at first, he tried different types of hairs and some of them were too powerful. Two quarters as they came together would take and squash the bacillus. Finally, he said, I think if I can find a young lady, or a baby that had golden brown hair, I am told that that hair is quite tough and yet very springy and yet very fine. So it happened that my daughter Sylvia had that kind of hair. So I took some of it over to him and he used that. So after that, of course, he was wrapped up more, not so much in his micromanipulator as he was in the development of the microscope and also development of some type of ray of very high frequency current which would annihilate any types of cancer virus in his work. And so, he worked a great deal on that. Hubbard, did he ever make any other very thin sections like this section of the tetanus bacillus? Colon, the hookworm and the embryo are the only other two that I remember. Hubbard, do you recall how big this embryo was? Colon, it was, I would say about 5 mm long and stretched out by 2 and 1 half mm, including the overall size of the body, 5 and 1 half to 6 mm long. It was very small, in fact, he was so astounded that such a small embryo would be so perfect. The fingers were formed, and the whole thing. Quite often you find, in an embryo that's aborted, it would be mongoloid for some little time. But this was perfectly formed. In fact there were stools in the bowels and food in the intestinal tract and the stomach. Hubbard, at 5 mm or 5 cm? Colon, I guess I am talking centimeters right now, yes, because it had to be big enough of course, to handle. Hubbard, gesturing this is 5 cm right here. Colon, it would be about double that size. That 5 cm would be double the size of the baby. Hubbard, 2 and 1 half cm. Colon, yes, I know because I saw it laying out there. My remembrance of measurements was not too bad. I used to have a great deal of work in fine maturation in the factories. Hubbard, do you remember what year, approximately it was that Rife cut the section of the tetanus spore? Recall here that Hubbard is referring to the typhoid bacillus photos published in the 1944 Smithsonian and Franklin Institute articles Ed Cullen, it was 1928 and 29, somewhere in that area. Hubbard, 1928 or 1929. He made this picture then not with his big universal microscope but with one of his earlier microscopes, didn't he? Colon, yes he did. Hubbard, oh, well. Colon, it was because that universal microscope was magnified too large for anything like that. You see, he worked in an area the size of a pinhead, and that was large enough to have to play with when it came to the filterable forms. He used one of his earlier microscopes, he had several microscopes. He had one of course that magnified 5,000 times and one that magnified 10,000 times. In fact he made several 10,000 magnification microscopes and one went to Dr. Patterson. I think it was in England through the help of Henry Siner. Hubbard, was it Patterson or? Colin, I may be wrong. It was a Dr. Gonin, who was the physician to the Queen at that time, and Dr. Patterson was in that deal and I can't recall other names too well Cullen is misremembering the name. It is not Dr. Patterson but a Dr. Parsons to whom he is referring, Ed Hubbard, I see. Cullen, the difficulty is that they have all passed on in one way or another. Hubbard, has Mr. Siner been out to see you recently? Henry Siner was another assistant to Rife who worked primarily with the microscope. 
Siner ventured to England in 1938 to assist a British group of doctors mentioned above by Cullen in establishing overseas a laboratory using Rife microscopes and beam ray machines, Ed Cullen, I haven't seen Henry for quite a long time. He has been more wrapped up in high finance. He has been chairman of the board of the Siner Paint and Glass Company and a couple of other activities. We have more or less separated because I remained, and his idea, just a little bit too much of a church mouse to be bothered with. Hubbard, well, they may not be quite accurate. Colin, it may not. Henry is a very fine fellow. I liked Henry very much. I have known him of course for many years and during the last world war it was possible for me to turn a great deal of business to him through what we call outside production or outside order, materials for a conveyor. You see we had cost plus 10, which was of course was a very, very easy way to do anything. We had lots of money. And I could suggest that much of the work that we were scrambling to get together could be produced outside. And Henry got many, many orders for all sorts of chromes and paints of every conceivable description. And as a consequence, Henry made quite a bit of money. And of course their glass company built rapidly after that and then he seemed to be spreading out, and of course had a large number of agencies established in the county and other counties. And then I lost contact with him. Hubbard, well, coming back to the microscopes. This picture here is unusual in that now we have confirmation from the electron microscope. This picture here gesturing to the Smithsonian typhoid bacillus photograph. The dimensions, you see the spacing between these lines here, this corresponds with our so-called unit membrane. And there is space out here, this is the nuclear membrane. Well the distances between these three components here, the distance between these, corresponds exactly with what we know since about 1950-60. Colon, between the lines? Hubbard, yes, between the lines, you see. Colon, what significance do you attach to that? Hubbard, well, you see, the significance is that the methods, the instrument that produced this, was able to produce a resolution which we were not able to obtain except with an electron microscope many years later. Now then, I would like to see this microscope ray constructed, recovered, the principles of it determined, because we would probably be able to work with a material that is still has water in it. We could work with living material. Now we would still have problems of sectioning. Notice that this typhoid bacillus here, this is complete, this is not sectioned. You cannot see as much detail in this as you can in this because this is a thin section. Hubbard is referring again to two of the photos from the Smithsonian article comparing the typhoid bacillus organism photo to the section tetanus spore photo, Ed but this has resolution down in the neighborhood of about 20 angstroms, at least, and nobody had ever been able to do that until the electron microscope came along and until they had methods for making thin sections. Now this, Ben, is the Xerox copy of the article in the Smithsonian Institute report. I had our photographer make a smooth glossy copy of the photomicrographs and this merely will show you what the legend was in the original and you can compare it. Well you see, all you have to do is a little arithmetic, the object size, or, the size of the specimen, times the magnification, is equal to the image size. So if we have the image size we can do the arithmetic and we can go back and figure out what the object size was. Now then, independently, we know what the diameter of tetanus spores are, from both the light microscope the conventional light microscope, and from the electron microscope. So by going back and checking the arithmetic from that source, we can confirm that this is the correct dimension. We also have, that is, we now know independently, the thickness of the spore wall here and the interior of the spore. We can compare this distance with this distance and we get a ratio which is exactly comparable to what we know from modern electron microscopy. I know that this microscope, even though I've got only three pictures to look at, and only this one can I make correct measurements from, I know that this was an extraordinary microscope and I want to get it rebuilt. I have known about this microscope since 1947. I found this report in the Smithsonian Institute report and I wrote to Rive back in 1949 but he never answered me. I kept asking and sending letters and so forth. Colin, at that time, 
It was just exactly 10 years from the time he started drinking and he was mentally pretty well in shock. I couldn't get him to do hardly anything. I tried to get him to provide us with closed circuit television in Lion Aeronautical. I tried to get him to provide us with information and help in our laboratories over at Canberra in regard to metallic crystallography and stuff of that sort. And he could have made a lot of money that way. But every time I got him closeted with a group of engineers and he would start to outline his thoughts and what he could do and they were all sitting on tender hooks, he would excuse himself and go outside. By the time he got back he would be waddling. He had to have that liquor, which of course was the fault of the advice and counsel he received in 1939 during the final wind-up of our case where we were accused by the AMA of doing something they did not like in regard to the application of the Rife Ray for cancer and so forth. And of course that was all a mistake. Of course they had the right kind of help, medical men of repute. But by the time when Rife came on the stage and on the witness stand to testify he went all to pieces. Hubbard, and this was in 1939? Colin, yes. Hubbard, now, I went down to the courthouse and copied all of the records on that trial and I read them on the projection machine, they have them on microfilm down there, and I was just surprised. There would be times when they would want Rife to come to court and from the record there, he wouldn't show up. Colin, no he wouldn't. Hubbard, was that because he would be drunk, or what? Colin, no it wasn't. Rife was a tremendously capable man as long as he could manipulate what he was working with. When it came to being in a court of law, where you're right down to dog eat dog, why, that just unnerved him and he couldn't stand it. Hubbard. What kind of questions would they ask him that would unnerve him? Colin, it wasn't that any questions would be asked to unnerve him, but here he was a man who had spent his lifetime in doing things that others had told him were wonderful, just simply marvelous, his lenses and stethoscope, and his guns, so many, many things that he did. All this he was told by many men from England and from Germany and other places that he was an excellent man in his field. Possibly I am not using the correct nomenclature and verbiage that I should use, but nevertheless, he absolutely felt on top. And when he got into court he became a simple, plain human being. And anything he might say he was afraid might incriminate him, although there was nothing at all that the trial could find that he would be at any time considered culpable in any mistake at all or anything that might have been done. It was all done of course through our corporation, the Beam Rays Corporation. Now, Rife felt completely frustrated because he could not do anything in court except say yes or no and he knew what to say and he was not allowed to say it. If he was allowed to enlarge the least little bit, why, the prosecution would cut him right off and there would be a fight as to whether it should be entered in the record or stricken from the record or what. It so unnerved him that he was just simply scared to death. He was not at all conversant with law. The only law he knew was the law of research and investigation. Hubbard, was there a transcript of this trial ever made, a type transcript of the testimony in the judge's chamber? Colin, I wouldn't be able to tell you that. Bird Comparant would be the man to tell you that. Do you know who he is? He was our attorney at that time. Let me see if I can get his telephone number. Hubbard, all right, thank you. Colin. His telephone number is 284-2666 and the address is 4930 Mansfield, and his name is spelled C-O-M-P-A-R-E-T-B-A-R-T-R-I-N-D. He is of French extraction. Hubbard, he was the attorney for Rife? Colin, yep, and for all of us. Actually we hired him. Rife you see wasn't accused of anything. He wasn't indicted. He wasn't anything. He simply was a witness and in spite of the fact that they had nothing against him and never did find anything against him, he simply went to pieces. Hubbard, that is very, very strange. How old was Rife when his father died? Colin, strange as it may seem I have no knowledge of that. Hubbard, did he ever speak of his father? Colin, he never spoke of his father in the whole time I had known him from 1913 until 1950. Hubbard. That's very strange. But he did speak of his mother quite a bit, didn't he? Colin, not to me. You see he was married to a very lovely Chinese woman, her name was Mamie. She was a member of the Aquin family here. 
She was a very splendid person and of course I am rather partial to Chinese. At one time I must have been Chinese. Perhaps you don't believe in reincarnation, I don't know what your ideas are. Wright's father-in-law was the wealthy and famous Ah Quin, the unofficial mayor of San Diego's Chinatown. His daughter Mamie was one of 12 children who were born and raised in Canton, Ohio and San Diego, Ed Hubbard, I don't have any really. But go ahead. Colin, and so Mamie was a very fine person and everybody just loved her and he always spoke very highly of her. But I never heard him talk of his mother or father in the whole time. And we were together an awful lot, goodness, we were together often times week after week. Every night after I would get away from my work here at the house, first I would come in from factory and then after I did what I could do around the house I always slipped in to do what could be done at the lab. In fact my wife often claimed that she was more a widow than she was married. We were together so much and in that whole time I don't recall that he ever once mentioned his father or mother. Hubbard, did you ever hear him speak anything about his boyhood? Did he ever talk about any of the friends that he had or any fights or any athletics or anything like that? Colin, very little. He was so much more interested in optics and also to get all he could in optics he studied all he could from the Chinese development in optics, plus Zeiss in Westler, Germany and others. Carl Zeiss. Hubbard, but Carl Zeiss was not at Westler, that was Ernst Leitz at Westler, Carl Zeiss was at Jena. Colin, that is strange because all was referred to Zeiss as being in Westler. However, I saw much information, much correspondence from both places. Hubbard, from both places. Did he ever mention the name Hans Lukel to you? Colin, yes he did. Hubbard, and this was one of the people that he studied with? Colin, yes. Hubbard, do you remember if this man was at Zeiss or was at Leeds? Colin, I understood he was at Leeds. Hubbard, do you remember the optics which the microscope objectives which Reif used? Did he use both Leeds optics and Zeiss optics? Or did he only Leeds optics? Colin, as far as I could find, he used only Zeiss in this universal microscope. Now I'm not going to say he used only Zeiss completely because he ground many of his own lenses. He developed a system of grinding his own lenses and I watched him do it. He mounted them, of course, in this 21 bend microscope, which is his universal. I was hoping to work with John Crane who has the microscope skeleton now, and have him let me have it. Hubbard, have you talked with him? Colin, I have talked with him a great deal. Hubbard, what does he say? Colin, well at first about a few weeks ago he said he would let me have it and I would polish it up and get it in shape. And then I said, I would like to have you plan to have it exhibited in the Hall of Sciences. He said he thought of that too. Then he casually mentioned that he was going over to Japan. And today is the 20th. And I expect he has been over there now for about 10 days. Hubbard, oh, he did go to Japan then? Colin, yep, and I haven't tried to find out whether he is home or not to check up on it. I could, of course. Hubbard, well I'll call him Ben, that's alright, just go ahead. But he was going to Japan? Colin, yes to finance one or two of his items. He crane has a type of microscope that he invented himself. It's a rough and ready looking thing to me. But he can throw, of course, onto a screen, a magnification of up to over 400,000 times. But then the resolution is not good. And he says he is going to improve it. Now, he is quite jealous. When I went over the last time, he said, yes, I will let you have it. Now, I called him on the phone and I told him I was about to have our biggest car, which is an LMPLA overhauled, and it would be tied up for some time. But before I did, I could come over and pick it up because it had ample room in the trunk to bring it over here. He said, I'm not going to let you have it, I won't be doing anything about it until I get back from Japan. I said, when do you expect to get back? He said, I don't know. So that was the way we left it. I just simply failed, well, there is nothing that I could help anybody with as long as I can't get the microscope because I could help whoever was still in optics. 
I could outline the types of lenses and prisms and the way that whole thing was worked out through magnification and through interposition of lenses between prisms so as to prevent any spherical aberration at high magnification, or to prevent the crossing of the light rays, which of course they'll do when you get to around 120 mm of focal length. And so I've had so much else to do in other ways so I began to think, well, what's the use? I just didn't feel that I wanted to continue. Hubbard, well, now Ben I know that there are problems here. I came out here a year ago to see John Crane. I'm just being very patient with him and I'm going to try to do one step at a time. I'm going to try to be here through next Wednesday. I have to go back to New York on Thursday. I am hoping that I will be able to contact John before I leave. But let's not be discouraged now if this thing doesn't get firmed up immediately. John has had these microscopes now for about 20 years and he hasn't done anything with them really. Colin, he has a mind that is very fertile but doesn't complete anything he starts. He has a very fine system of monorail high-speed transportation but he simply doesn't push one particular thing long enough to realize its value or to get it into operation. He just scatters his fire and so he has so many things that are going up at the same time. Now with Rife, he would concentrate on a microscope and back to rheology, but to rest his mind he would pick up his French horn and play the most wonderful music, or he would just go out in his racing shell and go out and ride and row rapidly, or his fast bicycle and do 6 miles or 10 miles on his bicycle, something like that, or he would study this multiple engine that he developed which was able to take wonderful photographs at 10,000 feet after sundown. And many things like that that he did. But he always came back to his one love and he completed that to the best of his ability. Hubbard, now, Ben do you know of the whereabouts of any laboratory notebooks or any records that Rife made of the work that he was doing? Colin, John Crane had them all. Hubbard, the story that he Crane has given to me is that the food and drug people removed those records from his home there at the time he was involved in some court actions. Colin, well, I have very little here. I thought I could find some considerable information, but I have very little here. What I do have originated from Crane. I did have a lot of information but after I married Jean we were quite busy taking care of this other place and doing many things that ties up my activities now and as a consequence whatever became of the stuff I don't know. I may come across it sometime because I have a lot of storage outside, but I simply have to make a living. My living comes from counseling and so forth and I have developed a capacity, that is, scientific hand analysis and graphology, scientific handwriting analysis also, and all the means wherein I can advise and counsel people. And I always put everything on tape and it becomes a permanent record for that person for the rest of their life. It is a very important record and a document they should always take of and if possible transcribe it from tape to typewritten form. And of course I have been doing this now for the last 25 years. And this of course happened to be something that provides me with a little additional remuneration. Social Security couldn't take care of my expenses, not by 1 slash 4. Of course I am 86 years of age and I have been retired quite a little while. Hubbard, well, my father. You are just about almost as old as my father. My father will be 89 inches this November. He is still working. Colin, what day in November? Hubbard, 5th of November. Colin, I was born the 2nd. Hubbard, well we have got the same birthday then. I was born on the 2nd of November 1922. Colin, I wondered why you were so persistent. I said you couldn't be a Cancer, you couldn't be Gemini. You could be a Leo, but then I was wondering. Hubbard, well this is very interesting. Let me switch. I am not going about this in the order that I should but. You would of course recognize Rife's handwriting, wouldn't you? In any laboratory notebooks that he had? Do you remember Alice Kendall or Mrs. Alice Calloway, Dr. Kendall's daughter? Colin, I remember the name, yes, I remember Alice Kendall. But I didn't know her very well. I knew Dr. Kendall, he had a chair in Northwestern. Hubbard, yes he was dean of the medical school there for a while and chairman of their microbiology department. Colin, yes, he certainly was well up on microbiology and bacteriology. Also I met Dr. Rosenau too. 
he came up here. But Kendall was a splendid man because he knew so much, and he used of course, Kendall Medium, K Media, to maintain comparative tissue life and for anything we were doing with lung tissue section and any kind of excise material from animals like rats or guinea pigs. Hubbard, where is Rife buried? Do you know? Colin, I guess Bob Beck could tell you that. Hubbard, Bob Beck could tell me? Colin, you know Bob Beck don't you? Hubbard, no, I don't, but I'll find out. Colin, well, his wife is the one that has the telephone number and I don't happen to possess that right now. I know just where he lives and that is something I can give you right now. Bob is a very bright man in many respects but he is a man that indulges himself terribly with smoke in his lungs. He likes to keep his lungs loaded with tobacco smoke. And I have given him about just about another five years before he will pass on of emphysema or lung cancer. I've seen quite a bit of lung cancer working with Rife you know. Rife did quite a little job for the Cancer Institute at one time, and took two years analyzing a massive lung tissue section and that's where I learned all about lungs and stopped smoking. Of course I never did inhale, in the olden days you didn't inhale you just puffed, you got some of the smoke in your lungs, but not too much. It was more or less you lived with the atmosphere pretty well, but when you take it in from the cigarette or cigar or that sort, why it's pretty rich. Hubbard, let me ask you some questions. If I were to show you some drawings, whether you could give me any clues as to a parabolic surface on any of these prisms. When we first talked over the telephone, you indicated that some of these prisms, that Rife had made some parabolic curves on them. Colin, I know what I said, yes, he actually had figured out the parabolas and then ground the lenses to those parabolas. I would have racked my brain considerably to be able to guarantee what I would see because at that time of course I studied them, but you know several things have happened since. Hubbard, I thought I had brought my drawings, copies of drawings John Crane gave me when I was here a year ago and these might possibly help you recall. Now this is not Wright's own drawings, but it is a drawing which Crane signed Wright's name to, and his name to, and there was a Carl R. Brown attorney. Crane tried to patent this later. He told me that they were not successful in getting a patent but he had amended it and he has a patent pending. Now then, this is one of the drawings he gave me. Now, do these prisms bring anything back to your mind? Do you recall if there was a parabolic surface cut on this area here? Colin, this is not for the universal microscope. It doesn't look to me like it's for the universal microscope because he had prisms located at each corner of the bend from one side to the other and they interposed between these lenses, because the prisms themselves, as I recall it, did not magnify. Hubbard, the prisms themselves did not magnify? Colin, did not magnify, simply they carried the image through from one magnification to another on up through from the objective lens to the oculars. Hubbard. Now this does not then look like any of the prism systems in his early microscopes either does it? Colin, it doesn't. There are lenses here that indicate certain types of magnification, but he always interposed a lens between two prisms at each end in the... I can tell you right now for absent father as to what each lens whether it was a convex or concave lens and what the parabolas were of each lens. Actually I was more taken up with the mechanical side. I did what I could to help in doing machine work on any parts that he needed. He had a very nice little machine shop there which I loved very much and I helped of course to do all I could there. When it came to preparing, for instance, for the tube, which was used to propel the rife ray and to do any therapeutic work, then I of course was quite interested. I made up all that sort of stuff. And the basis for the tubes as analyzed the types of gases that we should use to exhaust the atmosphere and interpose the inert gases, and so forth. That was my side, so actually I can't say that I would recognize that layup at all. Hubbard, well now Ben, let me ask you, as soon as your hand is good enough that you can draw again, I would very much like to have from you a sketch giving your recollection of what the prism system and the lens system was that Rife had in his universal microscope as best as you can recall. And then I'd also... I'd like to have your sketches on that section of what you did with tetanus bacillus. Now they don't have to be artistic, but if you could make approximations going step by step. Because, you see, 
It is not only important that this microscope is an unusual thing, but his making the sections, there was nothing like this to come along for at least 30 years more. Colin, well, I can promise you when I can do this. Summary of abridged passage A long talk by Cullen about his Cullen's religious beliefs. Then. Hubbard, continuing. Was Rife very religious? Cullen, not too much, no. He was very psychic. He could draw from the ocean of mind, which I call it, another side, information about many things he couldn't have in his conscious state. As I told you. When he wanted an answer he would put his pad and pencil by his bedside and between 11 and 2 o'clock he always got his answer. Summary of abridged passage A long talk by Cullen about his Cullen's family history. Then. Hubbard, continuing. All right, well let me ask you a few more questions. What motivated Philip Whelan to bring that suit back there that destroyed that company and destroyed everything? What was Philip Whelan like and where is he now? Colin, Philip Whelan was an English Jew. Now, I am very fond of Jewish people, but Philip was definitely the very grasping type, and very cunning. I noticed his cunning when he was working with me. I was turning out all the stuff and of course was also executive vice president of Beam Rays Corporation for quite a while, and Philip had some sneaky ways about him. When the Con Realty Company brothers came down here from Los Angeles at the behest of the head of the AMA, his name was Morris Fishbein, when they came down here to see if they could find out something about us at the direct request of the head of the AMA they found quite a good deal with Dr. James Bikush, who was a very fine physician and surgeon and had been a fellow of the College of Surgeons for 20 years. And Philip was in the office with us, and when they had found what we were doing they said, well we would like to buy into this corporation. Well I said, this happens to be a closed corporation. We haven't requested the Commissioner of Corporations for the privilege to issue stock. That would take a long time if we did. At the present time we are not in a position to actually do that. So one of the brothers acted a little bit belligerent, and he said, well you ought to do something about it. And I said, why? And he said it would be good for you, it might be healthy for you. So I thought, that is strange. And so they left finally. Hubbard. These two brothers? Colin, these two bothers of the Con Realty Company. Hubbard, the Con Realty Company was in Los Angeles? Colin, yes, Los Angeles. They were a German Jewish Realty Company, their name was German Jewish. And they met Philip Oyland. I noticed that Philip was showing considerable appearance of friendliness toward them and I didn't think much about it until later I had found out that they had gotten hold of him and bribed him with a $10,000 check. Hubbard, did you ever see the check? How did you find out about the $10,000 check? Colin, I didn't see the check but I do know this. That it came from many sources and from his own lips later that they paid him $10,000 and he had wished to God that he hadn't ever accepted it. But just like Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus, as soon as he got that $10,000 check then he kicked us into the courts on. Not on bankruptcy but something similar to that. Hubbard, he wanted to get the directors changed. Colin, yes, he wanted to get the whole thing changed. But what happened was this Aaron Sapiro came out from Chicago, the prosecuting attorney, paid by the AMA. Hubbard, how do you know that Sapiro was paid by the AMA? Colin, because he made that statement to Bert Comparet and to others, and of course I was oftentimes in the group and I heard what was said. Hubbard, this would be interesting to go to Comparet. Comparet could probably tell me a lot about this, couldn't he? Colin, yes he could. But there is an Irish judge in that picture. If I recall right it was Judge Radebo. I knew Judge Radebo quite well from another connection. The case ran a year and three days in court. Hubbard, I have seen at least two different judges' names down there in the courthouse. The last judge was a man by the name of Kelly. Colin, yes, Judge Kelly came out here suffering from tuberculosis and moved to Ramona. Judge Kelly I think was the one who issued the final judgment. Hubbard, then there was a Mundo, a Judge Mundo. Colin, yes Judge Mundo did sit in sometimes, but it was mostly Judge Kelly. Kelly was also a pretty fond of John Barleycorn. 
I found that sometimes Judge Kelly was under the influence. Of course, I met him up there in Ramona but he came out here with tuberculosis before I even got acquainted with the Rife. In fact, when I was living in Ramona and just doing mechanical work to kind of keep myself going. The story is too long to go ahead and tell you why I came out here except I was hired to go down to Mexico to run a gold stamp mill for a gold mining company. But, so I met him up there and got acquainted with him and he knew me of course quite well. The same as Radibwa did. But I smelled liquor on him so many times, and I hesitated sometimes to know what to say to him. I didn't know whether he was under the influence of liquor when he was on the bench. So that is the situation there about that. Now, Sapiro was a very cunning man. In fact I think he did what's his name? Bellywell, this wonderful criminal attorney. Hubbard, I don't know anything about criminal attorneys. Colin, that guy is known quite well in the West here. But he Sapiro was giving him quite a run for his money. Presumably Colin means in a trial previous to the Beam Ray trial, and however, in the Beam Ray trial Judge Kelly saw that Fishbein was trying to cause trouble when there was really no trouble there, because, actually, all the information that was brought out in the case was pretty well corroborated by the various doctors, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Rosenau, Dr. Gruner, Dr. Arthur Kendall, and Dr. Cushion so the case simply fell by the wayside. And I praise God it did because they would have given me about 10 years for being the one who was doing all of the organizational work and so forth. It was my corporation to start with. Here Cullen is either exaggerating or he is simply paranoid. At no time was he or anybody looking at serving any prison time due to the Beam Ray's trial, much less 10 years. Their business manager Sierra Hutchinson was found at the trial to be a dishonest businessman that had engaged in illegal stock transfers within Beam Ray Incorporated. It was suggested that the Corporate Securities Commissioner had a case to against Hutchinson and if pursued in a new and different court case he might be successfully prosecuted. These charges against Hutchinson were never pursued. Ben Cullen was involved with Hutchinson in some of these questionable activities. Perhaps his statement with its evident paranoia is founded upon this. Cullen, who was not a director at the time of the lawsuit, was not a defendant and did not appear as a witness at the Beam Ray's trial though he did provide a deposition and was the topic of much of the testimony of others Ed Hubbard, so Philip Whelan really was the tool, in your opinion, he was an agent of other people who were trying to get in and make some money. Cullen, to get control of the corporation at the request of Morris Fishbein. Yes. You see, Dr. Hammer was another doctor. We supplied him with two instruments, down at National City. He passed a large number of cancer cases through that office with two operatives, each was using an instrument, and they simply recovered from cancerous conditions. And of course, what precipitated the whole thing was this old gentleman. I wish I could remember his name, 82 years old, he had a butterfly. You know what they are, it is a superficial cancer. Nothing but a malignant cancer of a papilloma type and it looked like a piece of gory red liver. He was in a terrible mess. Dr. Hammer treated him, and when I saw him before he went back to Chicago there was just a little scab on this side of his face over here, which eventually Dr. Hammer said would fall off. When the AMA sued us, Dr. Hammer was one of our best surgeons in the Paradise Valley Sanatorium at that time, he closed his office and moved up to the Mill Valley up in Upper California. And when anybody asked him about the Rife Ray he didn't know anything about it. He didn't know anything about bacteriology at all. He wasn't a microbiologist, he didn't know anything. Hubbard, well now, this is not the trial of 1939? This is later, wasn't it? Colin, no this is the trial of 1939. Yes, Dr. Hammer had two of the instruments that we built. Hubbard, originally? Colin, absolutely, the original. Hubbard, ones that Rife himself had built? Colin, had helped to design and we had them rebuild them. Hubbard, do you know where any of those original instruments are of Rife's? Colin, I wouldn't know doctor. Hubbard, there would be no way for us to get a hold of the original records or anything? Colin, I have no idea what John Crane would have now. Hubbard, 
Here is the thing Ben, just in the same way that I found that this photomicrograph of the tetanus spore corresponded with what we learned 30 years later, in the same way, some of this material on the treatment of tumors and bacterial diseases may. Now I don't say that I know it yet, I don't, I do not know it, but I suspect that there were some genuine cures in this that we could recognize today and I would like to be able, not now, but in a couple, two or three years, I would like to follow through on this. I would like to see what the records show because if there were biopsies. You see I am a pathologist and I can take a look at some human tissues and very, very frequently I can tell whether it is really cancer, or what kind of cancer it is, or if it isn't a cancer. If it is a benign tumor I can tell what type it is. I can tell a lot of things if I can just get the evidence. But getting the evidence is going to be rather difficult. Colon, that is a problem because, you see, that work was done so long ago. When Benjamin Henderson brought his wife to Dr. Kush to treat, she had one of the worst cases of breast carcinoma I have ever seen. In fact her breast was almost all sloughed off. It looked terrible. But Dr. Kush, with the original laboratory instrument, cleared it up. Hubbard, the original laboratory instrument? The one Rife himself had built? Colon, yes. Hubbard, all right. Colon, then he had a number of cures, oh, a large number. Hubbard, what was the name of that doctor now? Colon, Dr. James B. Kush. I think he died when he was 84. Hubbard, you see it makes a great deal of difference to me, Ben, as to whether Rife himself built a radiation device and a doctor used it, or whether it was one that Hoyland built. Colon, you see, everything that Hoyland did was also being done by all of us at the request and under the supervision of Rife. You see, we simply transferred from the laboratory instrument to the instruments that could be made up into one cabinet. And we had to have Rife's okay with everything we did. Roy worked with us all the time. Hubbard, but after Hoyland came in there he didn't work with you all the time, did he? Colin, not all the time no. Philip Hoyland was given the responsibility of calibrating every instrument, of the oscilloscope and oscillograph. The instruments were calibrated but when we shipped two instruments over to Great Britain, and Henry Siner went over to demonstrate the instrument, Hoyland by that time had simply scuttled the very valuable calibrations and they didn't do any good. Hubbard, yeah. Well, I saw Gonan's letter, I saw the original, and Gonan complained that the instruments were not even wired up properly. Colin, now, that was all Philip Whelan's fault. Hubbard, all right. Colin, Gonan came over you know, I got acquainted with him. He pronounced his name Gonan. Yeah, in some languages you have a long eye in the pronunciation. The laboratory instrument, I had it here one time. My first wife had a growth on her back right down the spine and it was then considered a superficial cancer that was spreading and so I treated it and it dried up and fell off. Now she was in Judge Kenny's court at the time that John Crane and John Marsh were there as criminals 1962, as the case was being heard, she was put on the witness stand and Bert Comparin asked her at that time also he was again the attorney for the defense. He asked her, I understand you had a growth on your spine? She said, Yes. He said, what was it? She said, the doctor called it a superficial cancer. He said, what was done with it? She said, my husband used the Rife Ray laboratory instrument and treated it and it dried up and fell off. And the judge struck that out, wouldn't allow that to be shown in the testimony. That was when Crane was in for the criminal trial. Hubbard, did you go to Crane's trial any Ben? Colin, yes. I was there several times. Hubbard, what do you think was really the cause? Why did Crane really go to jail? Colin, because first he had started to build small, what they call, little black boxes, two little grips to be held in the hands and treat conditions. To change the condition of the bloodstream so that if a person had cancerous virus in the bloodstream, why, it would tend to clear up that condition in the person suffering from that type of cancer. It would be cleared up. Now, he Crane got into a very ridiculous situation. He decided to go ahead and demonstrate and lease and sell these boxes without benefit of medical counsel. He organized a group and started selling them. He would sell them to different people. 
supposedly he was only leasing them, which of course, is what we did with the earlier instruments. They were definitely large instruments and he was advertising it. He got a group together one day in the Grand Hotel down in the basement assembly hall. And where he picked up this guy I don't know but he picked up somebody that tried to make people believe that he had come from Venus. Hubbard, for heaven's sakes. Colin, his name was. It's a peculiar name. Samasan or something like that. And he was trotting around with a regular military uniform with a good will, well-tailored jacket with a sand brown belt, Stetson hat, polished brown leggings and knickers, trotting around all over the place, going to various churches and claiming he was direct from Venus. Prince Sneeze and his name was. And so I went down to this meeting to see what was going on at the Grand Hotel. At the time I was working for the outfit called Norn Car Manufacturing, which is now Ritiker Corporation, manufacturing various types of large receivers, benches, and so forth, or big dishes like 60-foot dishes and 100-foot dishes, and so forth, for various types of signaling devices like they used over here at the Naval Air Station on Point Loma. And so, I was called up on the stage by John Crane. There was about 50 people. One man was making same notes and I definitely picked him out as a deputy district attorney. And this Prince Sneezen made the most outlandish statements I ever heard. He was just simply a charlatan and simply trading on the gullibility of this fellow John Crane. And so after I left there, Crane put me on the spot about asking me certain questions about Rife, which I could say without any more than just simply plain statements of fact. After I left there and went back to my office in this factory here in La Mesa, I simply wrote out my resignation and called him up and told him it was in the mail. And of course, not very much longer before that happened that the district attorney's office made a raid on his property there without a search warrant and took a lot of stuff away. Hubbard, the district attorney did? Or was it the Food and Drug Administration? Colin, no it was someone to do with A. Who would it be? A constable or police or who? I can't be certain. It was the jackbooted thug division of the state of California Food and Drug Administration, and anyway it had to do with the police authorities and they took a lot of his equipment away. And I think I will include one more item however, they did it without benefit of a search warrant. And he tried to sue them but because Maiety definitely Judge Maiety has always been a very, very poor judge always done a great deal of cow tying to the district attorney's office. And whenever he, the district attorney, or the prosecuting attorney would request the testimony would be stricken from the record, why, he always upheld the district attorney. This is a tiresome thing also. In the last day of the 1962 Crane Marsh trial I was in there at 10 a.m. in the morning and it went on through to dinner and lunch, and after dinner we finished up in the evening. They had in there, as a witness, a man who was working for the police department as the chief dispatcher and also their electronic engineer. He also had been used by Dr. Kush to keep the laboratory instrument in calibration. And he knew all this work because I had met him long before, oh many years before, up at the laboratory at Point Loma. I wish I could tell you his name. Bird Comparat could tell you. Now, he went on the witness stand and the prosecution asked him some questions about this black box. They asked, was it any good? He said, no, it was not any good, it was just a fake. And the whole thing went through that way and this of course is what threw both of these men into a 10-year sentence at San Quentin. But of course we got them both out after three years. Hubbard, John Crane was sentenced to 10 years? Colin, yes, 10 years, along with John Marsh. And so, let me see, so this man, as he came off the witness stand, I beckoned him over to me, I said, for goodness sakes, now you knew the value of those little black boxes. They were properly calibrated for certain conditions. I said, why did you lie that way? He whispered to me, I have a job to protect. And I said, for goodness sakes alive, you mean to say you would lie and send a man over the road, to protect your job? He said, I have a family. I said, I don't wish you any hard luck but I can't see you living too long. I am not threatening you. I'm saying that I'm afraid that your perfidy and your unfairness will sneak up on you. And in two years he was dead. A strong, 
healthy man. Now ask Bird compare what his name was if you can. He was a man who was a dispatcher, his voice came over the police radio dispatching various patrolmen and prowl cars and so forth, and also did a lot of electrical work for the police department down at the foot of market. This man's name, which escapes Cullen, is Vern Thompson, Ed Hubbard. What about Milbank Johnson? Do you remember Milbank Johnson very well? Cullen, yes, he was a big, tall, handsome gentleman, very, very knowledgeable and extremely interested in Rife. He wrote a very fine letter one time after he had seen the work that was done at Miss Helen Scripps home on the treatment of a boy with papilloma. Around the neck here a cancer had eaten through so you could see the sinews and see the neck bones, so much of the flesh had dropped off around here. He had to be held up on this side all the time and held down so he could move his neck. Now Milbank Johnson, and Kendall, and Rosenau were there at the time that this work was done and they saw the tremendous value of the Rife Ray instrument because it actually cured that boy's papilloma up to a point where he had some scar tissue for some time but he definitely was saved. He did not die. He was healthy and able to go back to work. Hubbard, how old was he? Colin, about 21. Hubbard, when did Milbank Johnson die? Colin, I don't know. Hubbard, he was on the faculty at the University of California Medical School here in San Diego? Or was it Los Angeles? Colin, at the time I knew him he was a head physician for the Northwestern Insurance Company, or Great Western, I really and truly am a little bit hazy, but both those names should be considered. Hubbard, all right, that gives me a lead. Colin, well, doctor I wish I could stay for a long, long time. Hubbard, well, Ben I'll stop now. End of Colin interview analysis of many of Colin's assertions in the above interview can be found in the linked article entitled Deconstructing Beam Rays Incorporated, Searching for the AMA. Next, The Hubbard Interviews, Part 3, Bertrand Compared on the Beam Ray Trial. The John Crane Trial and Things in Between Copyright 2007 All Rights Reserved Sean Montgomery is a freelance writer, researcher and producer. His video documentary series The Rise and Fall of a Scientific Genius, The Forgotten Story of Royal Raymond Rife can be found at www.zerosmartwa.org reproduced from www.rents.com Deconstructing Beam Rays Incorporated Searching for the AMA by Sean Montgomery 3-30-7 In the interview with Professor Hubbard and Ben Cullen is revealed a grand conspiracy orchestrated by the American Medical Association to stop the proliferation of Rife's beam ray machines. The primary villain in Cullen's conspiracy is Morris Fishbein, the founder of America's corrupt medical status quo. Fishbein spent his entire tenure as chairman of the AMA 1925-1949, obsessively and ruthlessly attacking anything he could successfully label as quackery. He has written massive volumes on the topic. Morris Fishbein also has a recorded history of corruption. He was infamous for using his sway as the powerful AMA chief to buy into or buy out any legitimate medical device, drug or process that crossed his path. Buy into for profit, or, if it competes with already profitable enterprises, buy out to suppress, this was Fishbein's modus operandi. It is difficult to find any information on Morris Fishbein that does not condemn him. Most writing on him is authored by people who are outraged by him, his activities, and his very existence as head of the AMA. There is one glowing report on his life that is over a thousand pages long, but that is his self-written autobiography, which reads like a study in self-aggrandizement. By all other accounts Fishbein was a shameless self-promoter, a propagandist, a salesman, his greed and arrogance knew no bounds. He was never a doctor but he dispensed general medical advice to the nation as if he were God and of course obfuscated the fact that he never practiced medicine, nor could. He soaked doctors, patients and manufacturers of medical devices and drugs across the nation for every penny he could squeeze out of them through fees and kickback schemes, fines, dues, options, advertisement gimmicks, racketeering and misuse of the association journal. The list of Fishbein scams is endless. In short, for the AMA at large, he was a complete embarrassment. 
he was considered by nearly all to be an unfortunate barnacle that had somehow fixed itself to leadership in the association and who was now running the organization as if its only purpose was to support him making piles of money for himself while basking in his own glory. They finally figured out a way to get rid of him in 1949. It must be really embarrassing for the AMA today. They have a website containing a history of the American Medical Association archive. If you go clicking through it you will find that their great leader for 27 years is given hardly a mention. Also hardly mentioned is the fellow who Fishbein replaced in 1925, one George Simmons. Look for George Simmons in the AMA History Archive. He was their leader for 25 years between 1899 and 1925. You won't find much on him either. Not the juicy stuff. You won't find details of his shameless huckstering snake oil salesmanship and outright sexual and criminal misconduct. That stuff was all printed up in the scandal sheets of the day in the major newspapers, but for some reason escapes AMA archives. He printed flyers saying he was a specialist in women's problems and that a limited number of lady patients could be accommodated at his office. George Simmons printed a lot of flyers, making a lot of claims. As head of the AMA he specialized in using his position to aid in the selling of many snake oil type products. The news finally came for Simmons when he was caught secretly dosing his wife's food with psychotic drugs and then trying to make her think she was crazy so she'd be committed to a mental asylum presumably leaving him free to treat his lady patients. His wife luckily figured out that what was happening to her was not sudden onset insanity, but that she was married to the sleazy George Simmons head of the American Medical Association for 25 years, who was poisoning her with medicine. It was a huge scandal. The newspapers ate it up. Simmons' protege was Morris Fishbein. When the heat of the scandal became too intense, Simmons quietly stepped out of the spotlight and allowed his student to take over the post as chairman and president of the association and chief editor of the journal. This position Fishbein quickly consolidated and he soon found that he had the power of a czar and such means at his disposal to reap enormous profits through just about any confidence scheme he could cook up. Again, you won't find that information on the AMA website, but the colorful activities of Fishbein and Simmons did not go unnoticed and are well documented. Or, you could read Fishbein's autobiography for the opposite of what happened. Now. As far as I have been able to find and I have looked Morris Fishbein has never mentioned Rife in print, nor is he quoted mentioning Rife, acknowledging Rife, condemning Rife, beating Rife, or in any way communicating with or about Rife. The only connection between Fishbein and Rife comes from Cullen's conspiracy allegations, an octogenarian with a cancer tumor on his cheek was healed by the Rife Ray in San Diego and then later encountered Fishbein in Chicago. Through this man, Fishbein not only discovered Rife, but saw verification as to the reality and efficacy of this procedure. According to Cullen, Fishbein then dispatched two agents from Los Angeles, the mysterious Kahn brothers, to approach Beam Rays Incorporated and attempt to buy into the company. Beam Rays Incorporated, it is says, declined their offer. So the Kahn brothers then bribed one of Rife's partners, Philip Whelan, with $10,000 to compel him to proceed as their agent or as Cullen calls it, their stooge. Suddenly Hoyland had a high-priced, famous lawyer at his side, one Aaron Sapiro, who Cullen says was paid by the AMA. Together they attempted a hostile takeover of Beam Rays Incorporated through a contrived lawsuit aimed at replacing the board of directors and positioning Hoyland and his gang as the replacements. It is said that concurrent to these activities, the AMA was also visiting doctors who were using beam ray machines in their practice in Southern California and warning them to stop it lest they lose their license, to it they stopped. An epilogue to the story is added concerning Wright's reaction to these events, so shaken and disturbed by what was going on, he became a neurotic. Doctors prescribed brandy as a relaxant. Wright took their advice to the extreme and became a lifelong drinking alcoholic. Cullen told virtually the same story, on tape, to Hubbard in 1976, and to John Crane in 1959. John Crane has repeated it to anyone who will listen. Much of what we hear today about the Beam Rays trial of the AMA comes from Crane and Cullen. Crane got most of his info from Rife and Cullen. Most everyone that knew and loved Rife, 
hated John Crane, except Ben Cullen. Reif is on tape alluding to AMA involvement in his professional demise, but there are no specifics. He is certainly on record condemning the AMA in general. Reif says that, there isn't any AMA. There's an American drug syndicate. They're the ones. And then goes on to name few big pharma companies. Henry Seiner in an upcoming interview in this series an associate of Reif's and quasi-witness to the events, tells virtually the same story as Cullen, but in a very general way, without detail. Bird Comparit, Beam Rays Incorporated as attorney for trial, gives a detailed but incomplete account of the proceedings. He doesn't mention the AMA, Moore's Fish Buying, the Kahn Brothers, a bribe, or attorney Aaron Sapiro's alleged connection to the AMA. Though Comparit does describe a conspiracy engineered by Philip Wayland and a man named C.R. Hutchinson, he doesn't mention any AMA connection. He does describe the Beam Rays trial as simply a lawsuit, a squabble for control of a corporation that seemed to have a cure for cancer. So the extent of the testimony that alleges the AMA was involved in Rife's downfall is limited to Rife, Siner, Crane and Cohen. John Crane met Rife in 1950, ten years after the salient events took place, so any information he contributes must be considered hearsay. Henry Siner was in England in 1938-39 and his statements as to AMA culpability amount to the generalities one would expect from someone reporting events not directly witnessed. Siner repeats the accusation as statements of assumed fact. For example, statements like this, Siner well that was the beginning of the downfall of the whole thing, his drinking problem. And that started out, I believe, when the AMA locked horns with him. He just wasn't emotionally up to taking it. Rife, the ultimate witness to the events, fares no better than Siner in providing us with verifiable information that would shed light on this matter. Broad accusations and wide generalities abound in Rife's surviving testimony. For example, this from Rife's obituary in the Daily Californian newspaper he accused the American Medical Association of rejecting his electronic therapy discoveries and implied the organization had brainwashed and intimidated his colleagues as well as feloniously censored the publication of his work. I certify that the AMA and the Department of Public Health have declared war on Rife's virus microscope institute said the affidavit signed February 7, 1967. This and a few other statements like it, are all we get from Rife. This leaves us with Ben Cullen's account, which details this alleged conspiracy like no other available indictment. Cullen was informed through admissions made to him by actual conspirators and through his own eyewitness recollections of events. John Hubbard is adamant about Ben Cullen's credibility. While in San Diego in 1976, Professor Hubbard visited the court records room and obtained microfilm of all the trial proceedings, affidavits, depositions, subpoena orders, court motions, demurs, most of the trial's paperwork, including all counter-proceeding documents. In an attempt to verify Cullen's account of AMA involvement in the demise of Rife's enterprise, a thorough examination of that enterprise is in order we will look for any corroborative or circumstantial evidence that supports Cullen's assertions. A history of the company called Beam Rays Incorporated. As gleaned from Hubbard's 1939 Beam Rays trial microfilm, a transcript of the trial, a variety of letters and other documents that have survived, and testimony from various recorded conversations Rife had a big, hulking contraption that filled one wall of his laboratory. It was his frequency instrument a souped-up, variable frequency oscillator that delivered its power to a helium-filled glass tube which served to re-radiate the signal coming from the contraption into a ray. It was found that this ray could destroy any microbe colony within range, depending on the frequency of energy put out by the device thus the variable part. Over the years, through painstaking experimentation, Rife had accumulated a long list of frequencies that, when applied through his frequency instrument, were found to kill many different germs responsible for diseases like leprosy, influenza, strep, tuberculosis, even cancer. After perfecting the technique and learning many frequencies that were mortal to microbes, it came time for Rife and a bunch of big-time doctors to set up an experimental clinic to try this method on people suffering from the diseases caused by the bugs on Rife's list. Rife had made some new machines that were more compact than the original contraption, though still quite bulky, 
One of these was sufficiently portable to allow for its relocation from Wright's lab to the clinic where the initial trials would be conducted. In the end, it was found that the Ray machine was 100% effective. Many terminal patients with cancer and tuberculosis were cured. This was in 1934. To get it into more experimental clinics and further analyze these effects they needed more machines. They also needed the device to be smaller and more compact to maximize portability. This is where Philip Oylen came in. One of Wright's most eminent colleagues, Dr. Milbank Johnson, a man spearheading this push to get the Ray device into clinics, knew a radio repairman in Pasadena Hoyland who might be up to the job of engineering the contraption into a portable device that could perform the same as the oversized original. Thus was born the Beam Ray machine, a Hoyland built miniaturist copy of a Wright built prototype. So off to the clinics the Beam Ray machine went, and it was a smash success. Cures right up and down the line. The thing was a bona fide cure-all, provided you tuned it to the correct prescribed pathogenic frequency using a precise methodology. This was 1935-36. This is where the rife story becomes a bit of a maze. There were many things happening at the same time, on several different fronts, with many situations overlapping each other. There were the original clinical trials conducted by the so-called Special Medical Research Committee, that work was being carried on by Dr. Johnson and a Dr. Kush at the Scripps Ranch in La Jolla where the clinical trials were first conducted in 1934. Also, Dr. Johnson had started another clinic in Pasadena using the first compact model of the instrument constructed by Philip Oyland. While this was taking place, Johnson was also trying to introduce Wright's work in cancer to other research facilities so they might take up and verify their new discoveries. Using supermicroscopes of his own invention, Reif had discovered a cancer virus that had a very complex life cycle. Attempting to understand these complexities was a task that consumed Reif and other associated scientists including Johnson for several years. Meanwhile, Reif was having a new laboratory built, Philip Whelan was making more beam ray machines, and Ben Cullen was trying to start a business of his own that had nothing to do with beam ray machines. Cullen was still working with Rife, helping out wherever he could, but he was also branching out. Cullen was dreaming about turning his know-how in aviation which was considerable into a business. He conceived of a correspondence school in aeronautics, a scholastic course for the aerospace industry that Cullen himself would write. To this end he approached a corporate promoter named C.R. Hutchinson for help. Of his association with Cullen, Hutchinson says this, about October of 1935, Mr. Cullen came to me with a contract for the organization of a correspondence school of aeronautics and asked me to either join us or advise him how he could put over and operate this school. At that time I was associated with Roscoe Turner in connection with an aero device. I was also associated with Amelia Earhart. I discussed this with them after many meetings. Mr. Fickerson stated that he was willing to go along as our legal advisor if I would accept the active management. We closed a contract for five western states for sales rights. We formed a California corporation through Fickerson of Los Angeles. He was our attorney and handled the legal details. The organization consisted of Olmsted, Colin and myself. The corporation was known as Aero Reserve School Western Division. The necessary permits were taken out and I made a trip east and contacted the then Virginia Corporation Aero Reserve School officers. I secured for Cullen an additional contract showing and advising the Virginia Corporation officials that it was to the best interest of all that the sales organization from the West Coast if divided up would be better if the six additional western states were included. They gave such a contract. A new company was formed called United Polytechnical Institute. So in 1935-1937, Cullen, Hutchinson, and John Olmsted were developing an aeronautics school and subsidiary corporations UPI. Rife was working with various doctors on his cancer etiology and building a lab. Hoyland was further developing the beam ray machine, making refinements and modifications. Johnson was working with Dr. Kush at the clinic in La Jolla and at his own clinic in Pasadena also with Philip Hoyland. Dr. Johnson was also helping Rife get his new lab operational. 
1938 was the year that the tangled knot known as Beam Rays Incorporated was formed. The knot began as a series of relationships concerning the beam ray machine. It started with a vacation. Dr. Kush took a break from his clinical work with the Rife Ray at La Jolla and traveled on vacation to his homeland, England. While there, Kush met some doctors who became very interested in his exhilarating accounts of the work with Rife back in San Diego. The apparent leader of these British doctors, and the most impressive, was Dr. Winter Gonin, the very wealthy and renowned personal physician to King George. Among his cadre of associates were physician Dr. Blewett and a specialist in electromedicine, one Dr. Parsons. Dr. Kush wooed these men with tales of advanced microscopes, a cancer virus, and ray machines that kill bugs and cure disease. Soon Gonan and his associates were making plans for a trip to America to meet Rife and to hopefully negotiate a purchase and or licensing agreement to take some of his stuff back to England with them. Kush returned to San Diego with news of this impending visit by wealthy British doctors seeking a contract. Now, as we well know, Rife was an inventive genius. He could do just about anything he wanted to when it came to tinkering, building, conceptualizing, formulating or configuring. But when it came to the art of people Rife was a bit of a dummy. Rife was the first one to admit that he was not a business person. It appears that he not only disliked and was inept at it, but he seems to have had a sort of psychological aversion to the worlds of finance, selling and promotion business in general made Rife shudder. So imagine his trepidation at having among his inventory of inventions a little box that demonstrably cures cancer and any infectious disease a thing that not only needs to be marketed, but demands it. So what did Rife do? He started giving away ownership and control of his invention in order to pass this business responsibility on to others. He signed over 55% ownership of the beam ray device to Philip Oiland. Rife gave him a controlling interest because he felt that would provide just enough incentive to make it work. Rife's attorney, Gordon Gray, the man responsible for notarizing the agreement, thought this was insanity and counseled Rife to substantially reduce Hoyland's percentage. But Rife was adamant. Hoyland had designed and built the version of the machine in question while working for Rife over the last few years for very little pay. It was fair. The deal was struck but not yet drawn up and signed. Then, Dr. Kush's news arrived. They needed to act fast as the British doctors were due in a matter of weeks. Hoyland and Rife knew they'd need a structured corporation to perform any business, purchase orders or licensing agreements the British had in mind. Neither knew how to deal with the problem of making the necessary arrangements with not enough time. Caught with the pants down, the word was put out, help. Re-enter Ben Cullen who introduced his business associate Sear Hutchinson to Rife and Hoyland. They asked for Hutchinson's help as corporate advisor and promoter. Hutchinson declined their offer. The plea was repeated several times in a week. Clearly Hutchinson could see exactly what was going on, the potential for huge earnings and a chance to be in on the dispensation of the cure for cancer. He was holding out for a better deal, which, several meetings later, he got. The pending ownership deal between Rife and Hoyland was then suddenly revamped. Ownership of the beam ray machine and all the inherent rights therein was split into roughly thirds, Rife 30 percent, Hoyland 36 and two thirds percent, Hutchinson 33 and one third percent. Rife would oversee science operations. Hoyland would be the chief technician, engineer and mechanic with regards to manufacturing the machines. Hutchinson would set up, manage and promote the business. This agreement was mitigated by an atmosphere of confusion brought on by a spontaneous side deal that Rife had made in a remunerative moment of generosity. Recall it was Ben Cullen who was presenting Hutchinson to Rife as a possible answer to their organizational problems. One evening in Rife's laboratory while they were trying to interest Hutchinson in joining the enterprise, Rife suddenly conferred onto Cullen certain rights to the beam ray machine. Maybe this was done to impress Hutchinson. Maybe it was done because Rife felt Cullen should have a stake in a project that he had helped with from its inception. Whatever the reason for it, Cullen was given an option on the beam ray machine, the right to arrange for its manufacture and distribution with the stipulation that any deals he made should provide the owners with a royalty. 
By this time Dr. Gonan and his associates were embarking on their trip across the Atlantic to meet and deal with them. Haste was essential, so Hutchinson proposed a plan. It was a bit complicated, but perfectly legal. Everyone signed on and off they went. The problems they had to surmount were twofold, one get their business identity status in order so that they'd have an actual position to present to the British doctors, and two raise some capital so they could build more machines and cover costs. All of this had to be done yesterday. Hutchinson's suggested course of action was this, take Colin, Olmsted and Hutchinson's pre-existing corporation, United Polytechnical Institute, and simply convert it to house the beam rays venture as a holding. UPI absorbs beam rays which hadn't actually been named yet. The plan was to later change the name to Beam Rays Incorporated and forget about developing a correspondence school for aviation in favor of manufacturing and marketing an actual device that cures disease. Of course, Hutchinson, Cullen, Olmsted and others had stock in this now converted company so they, as a result, had an interest in this new configuration. Cullen, therefore, suddenly owned a large amount of stock in what was soon to become Beam Rays Incorporated, by virtue of Hutchinson's corporate absorption maneuver. So did Olmsted and many other people who were shareholders and board members of the soon-to-be former UPI also, Cullen's option was folded into the deal and in consideration of this he was awarded another giant chunk of stock. So, the setup of Beam Rays Incorporated was implemented through a series of contracts, a. Reif made a deal with Hoyland for a 55-45 split in ownership of the Reif-conceived Hoyland build ray device. b. That deal was then revamped to include Hutchinson in a rough three-way split for ownership of the device. c. Then a side deal between Cullen and Reif where Cullen was given an option. d. Then the three owners of the device signed another contract with a company called UPI, formerly named United Aero Schools and slated to become Beam Rays Incorporated. This was a contract of the invention owners conferring rights to Beam Rays Incorporated to manufacture, sell, lease, license and otherwise control the device. E. Then, this company Aero Schools UPI slash Beam Rays Incorporated, signed yet another contract with the British group of doctors conferring to them exclusive territorial rights to manufacture and sell the device in the UK. This agreement included the delivery to the British of four beam ray machines for their use in developing their new license, prototypes for their R&D and manufacturing departments. F. Several deals were made with various investors for the purpose of acquiring capital to conduct the business of Beam Rays Incorporated. These deals were mostly quasi-legal stock transfers made by Hutchinson to other people. Some of these investors became directors on the board of the corporation as well as shareholders. G. Several individual deals between Beam Rays Incorporated and various doctors in the Western United States concerning the sale or lease of Beam Ray machines for use in their clinics. H. And finally, a completely separate deal between Rife and Dr. Gonan regarding the commission manufacture of a virus microscope that had nothing to do with Beam Rays Incorporated. By the time the British doctors arrived in San Diego for their first meeting with Rife and this new company, there was ample evidence that Beam Rays Incorporated had been busy. A flurry of extensive, detailed articles suddenly appeared in the local newspapers, the San Diego Tribune, the San Diego Union and the Evening Tribune. Coinciding with the arrival of the British doctors, and through the first week of their stay, the headlines read, Dread Disease Germs Killed by Radio Wave San Diego Claims. Specific Destroyer of All Deadly Microbes, Hope cancer organism isolated in San Diego doctors await rife ray medical tests. New principle in microscope of San Degan inventor and San Degan's microscope magnifies 30,000 times. Fly would look like monster under local scientists instrument and dread disease germs destroyed by rays, cancer blow seen after 18 year toil by rife. Apparatus seen as boon to medical world. Rife himself had embarked on a local lecture tour. He visited men's clubs, high society meetings, business association dinners and various other community groups regaling these respective gatherings with tales of his works in progress. Rife was dazzling when he was on stage, in charge, and the center of attention. If this was promotion then it was of the sort that Rife could handle. The Rife Beam Raid Supermicroscope paradigm was about to break out of the box. 
the whole operation was almost famous. When Dr. Gonan and company arrived from England they found that the act of having dinner in public with these people garnered their own headline, visiting doctors on our point Loma scientist at dinner. The Gonans the doctor and his wife stayed with the Hendersons while in San Diego. The Hendersons were an elderly couple that figure into the story as more than just hosts to the Gonans. Benjamin Henderson was a retired military man, possibly moderately wealthy, and a shareholder in the former UPI Corporation. As a result, Mr. Henderson was a shareholder in the current Beam Rays Incorporated incarnation and thus had an interest in the forthcoming Gonan Beam Rays deal. Henderson would be called as a witness in the ensuing Beam Rays trial. Mrs. Henderson's part in this is much less mundane. She had developed breast cancer. She was refusing treatment because that meant a mastectomy and she couldn't deal with permanently disfiguring the surgery. Apparently Mrs. Henderson, even for a woman her age, had a stunning figure. The idea of parting with her robust curves, even if to save her life, was not something she was prepared to do. It didn't look good for her. She was being eaten by cancer and she was dying. Her subsequent disfigurement was apparently well advanced when Ben Cullen heard about their plight and brought her to see Rife. Then, in a matter of months, Rife with Dr. Kush essentially cured her of breast cancer. Mrs. Henderson's breasts were almost fully restored to their former glory. She was still taking the last of her treatments with the beam ray machine when the doctor and MRS Gonan arrived as guests from England. Mrs. Henderson also became a shareholder in Beam Rays Incorporated and was also called as a witness in the Beam Rays trial. For the wealthy D.R. Gonan, this trip to San Diego to visit the mad scientist genius Royal R. Rife would turn out to be the one that filled his sails for the rest of his life. Unlike many other doctors and scientists who had visited Rife's laboratory and, for various reasons of their own, refused to see what was right in front of their eyes, Gonan saw. What Gonan saw was that everything in this wonderland of analytical science known as the Rife Research Laboratory was integral to the whole. If you wanted to take the work out of this lab and put it into another lab you could not do it simply by duplicating the technology in another place. There is an implicit exacting methodology by which the technology must be employed. The work or the hard part of any Rife research resides in the levels of exactitude one must employ in the application of this technology to obtain the desired results. This is true for every element of the Rife paradigm the optical light path in his microscope must be precisely aligned to within mere microns, or it won't work. The mortal oscillatory rate of a microorganism is of an exact frequency and the generation thereof must be from stable electronics, or it won't work. The pH level of a culture media must be adjusted to a defined parts per million ratio, or it won't work. To look at the cancer virus the illuminator of the Rife microscope must be aligned to 12 and 3 tenths degrees, or it won't work. And on and on. Gonan saw all of this and knew what to do. After his return to England he would ready a laboratory designed and built to Rife's suggested specifications. Rife would be commissioned to build a microscope for Gonan personally transport it to England, and stay at the new laboratory for as long as it would take to teach the British team the ins and outs of Rife's cancer research and bacteriology studies, a spare-no-expense effort to red carpet Rife into the heady and highly influential spectrum of Gonan's ilk, the British high science clitorati. And that was the plan for the microscopes, the cancer work the bacteriology studies and for Rife himself but when it came to the subject of that ray machine over there, Gonan was met with, well, you'll have to talk to Beam Rays Incorporated about that. And so, somewhat perturbed by the sudden corporate edge that emerged when the Beam Ray machine came up, Gonan and his compatriots went to deal with a Mr. Hoyland and a Mr. Hutchinson, over the matter of obtaining some machines to take home. The deal Gonan settled on with Beam Rays Incorporated was this, for $51,000 Gonan would receive delivery of four Beam Ray machines. Two of them would be the bulkier research models for laboratory research and development, and the other two would be the smaller, sleeker treatment models designed for clinical use, all with specific instructions for calibration, troubleshooting and other service requirements including MOR frequencies. As well, an exclusive license and territorial rights for the UK to manufacture and sell beam ray machines. 
the details of royalties and other financial considerations would be worked out upon delivery of the last operational machine. Gonan gave Beam Rays Inc. $15,000 to get the deal rolling and construction of the machine started. He returned to England to ready his laboratory and await their arrival. Meanwhile, the summer of 1938 was one of expansion for Beam Rays Inc. Perhaps it was the publicity from the recent articles in the newspaper and Rife's lecture circuit, word of mouth from doctor to doctor, or maybe it was the promotion work of Hutchinson paying off, whatever the cause, Beam Rays Inc. started to get orders for machines. Reports vary as to the number of frequency machines manufactured and made available to area clinics, the numbers cited range between 6 and 14. Hoyland got busy constructing them he employed a team of men to do the actual work, and Hutchinson got busy finding investors to help pay manufacturing costs. The board of directors and executive officers of Beam Rays Inc. Cullen, Olmsted, Hutchinson and others, worked out ways of providing equity to those with interest in the company. Within its bizarrely complex corporate structure, the titles of stockholder, director, executive officer and owner were often all shared by one person, Hutchinson for example was all of these. Hoyland was an owner and a shareholder at first and would become a director later in the fall of that year. Rife was an owner and a shareholder. Many of the directors were elected because they owned some stock. Not all of these transfers of stock and title were as formal as they ought to have been. The issue of the legality of these maneuvers would later become one of the premises for the lawsuit against the company. During the summer of 1938 Rife traveled to Philadelphia to visit an eye doctor who was treating him for advancing blindness brought on by the cumulative thousands of hours he spent over the last ten years focusing into his microscope eyepiece. While in the East, Rife also conferred with several colleagues and tried to get his official documentation passport and birth certificate in order in preparation for his upcoming trip to England. While Rife was away things began to unravel in San Diego. The manufacture of the four British beam ray machines was finished in August. They were crated and shipped to England. Significantly, this was done without Rife's final inspection and approval. This would come back to haunt them. It was Hoyland who packed and shipped the machines to England. Later. When the crates finally arrived in London, there would be trouble for Hoyland. However, by the time the problem arrived Hoyland would be immersed in other troubles. It seems that Beam Rays Inc. started to have problems with the machines that were already sold and being used in clinics. It wasn't long before it became apparent that Hoyland's revamped design for the Beam Ray machine was unstable. Hoyland was constantly called upon to go to the doctor's office and fix the machine recalibrate dial settings, service a leaky tube, solve overheating issues, solve frequency drift problems etc. As the summer of 1938 Wayne Beam Rays Inc. started to become unglued. In reading the letters, transcripts, depositions and such, there is a sense that a stark realization was slowly dawning upon them, both collectively and as individuals, that this hastily arranged business venture might be as inherently unstable as Hoyland's machines were turning out to be. Everyone started fighting. Arguments surfaced regarding issues of propriety. Consideration. The odd stock transfer arrangements that Hutchinson was setting up to acquire funds. What to do about machine instability. Who should and how to, deal with the British etc. The driving force behind the tension was the realization that the centerpiece of their burdening empire, the invention was practically worthless. The beam ray machine was unpatentable. It was a variable frequency generator hooked up to a helium tube, it couldn't do anything different enough or distinct from already existing equipment to be eligible for patent consideration. It was obvious to all that the only things of value in the process they were endorsing or selling were the MOR frequencies. And they only had value if they were secret. So secret were the frequencies that nobody knew them except Hoyland, Rife of course and a few others. The board of directors, the executive officers and the shareholders of Beam Rays Incorporated did not and were not allowed to know the frequencies. There was a panicked sense among them that it was only a matter of time before this whole thing spun out of their control. The British doctors finally received their four beam ray machines in mid-September after an inexplicably long transit time and shipping. 
to further frustrate them, the crates were held in British Customs for several weeks awaiting clearances. While the crates were in transit, prior to their delivery, Gonan and his associates were communicating with Hoyland and Beam Rays Incorporated via Hutchinson by way of constant Western Union telegraph messages. Hoyland was being difficult with regard to delivery of promised circuit and design information as stipulated in the British contract. This promised information included a list of the rife frequencies or the numerical MORs that were at the heart and the secret of the system. After much delay Hoyland finally sent the requested schematics, including the frequencies. To the British doctors, the delivered frequency information was unintelligible. They repeatedly asked for clarification. Hoyland replied repeatedly that the frequency information had been delivered to them but was unintelligible because it was in code. He insisted that they should be able to use the machines to figure out the code to determine the actual numerical frequency values. The British replied, saying essentially, that's ridiculous, we don't have the machines yet, give us the damn frequencies like you agreed. This went on for weeks until the beam ray machines finally arrived in London. Then a new, even bigger Hoyland wrinkle was revealed. The British doctors found the machines didn't work as specified. Two of them weren't even wired together properly, with open connections, loose, hanging wires and components not even hooked up. Two other machines bore obvious physical damage. The two that at least turned on when plugged and operated sporadically, both putting out radically different signals. The British found themselves with four unreliable machines that could not even be used to help decode Hoyland's bizarre frequency encryption. Needless to say, Gonan and Associates were quite perturbed and demanded immediate action by Beam Rays Incorporated to help correct the situation. But Hoyland's response to the British was to adopt a posture of stubbornness and intransigence. So the British tried to do an end run around him and contact other members of the board of Beam Rays Incorporated to find out what was going on. This of course brought the board of directors down on Hoyland with loud inquiries echoing the British as to what in hell was going on. The whole episode brought the question of the frequency list to a head within Beam Rays Incorporated. Hoyland's position was this, paraphrasing Hoyland using my oscilloscope I determined what the frequencies were from Wright's old machine and then transferred them to my new machine. The original correct frequencies that Rife had were derived from the dial settings on Wright's old machines. This is an inaccurate way to ascertain what the exact final output frequency will be. Better to read the applied frequency directly from my oscilloscope, like I have done. I therefore have an updated list of these new, more accurate frequencies. We all agree that this information must be kept secret, it being the only component of value from an unpatentable product. Because it is through my labor that we have this list, and because I am a majority owner of the invention, that I will be the bearer of the secret. It will be dispensed on a need-to-know basis only. The board of Beam Rays Incorporated does not need to know what the frequencies are. The effect here was that Hoyland was subtly discrediting Wright's frequency list while saying his newly derived list contained not only the real frequencies, but that they belonged to him alone. The board argued that maybe all of this was so, but the contract they have with the British clearly puts Gonan in a need-to-know position, so, why do you not send them the frequencies? Hoyland's repeated answer was, I already have sent them the frequencies, in code. The board further inquired as to what they were supposed to do about the frequencies in the event of Hoyland's untimely death. Hoyland said disingenuously that they could of course get the frequencies from Rife, but to protect against all-out catastrophe he enclosed copies of the new frequencies in two sealed envelopes. One he gave to his attorney and the other he gave to board director George Edwards to be open only in the event of his death. Where was Rife in all of this? He was keeping as far away from Beam Rays Incorporated as possible. His distance from the proceedings was aided by the fact that Hoyland and Hutchinson were not revealing important details of their contact with the British, either as individuals, or collectively as board members of Beam Rays Incorporated and co-owners of the invention. In fact they were shielding from Rife most of the company's business. Gonan was in constant contact with Rife but his dealings were concerned solely with the microscope and Gonan's new laboratory. 
Gonin, who knew of Rife's aversion to business, did not discuss with him via mail their trouble with Beam Rays Incorporated and Hoyland until months later when the situation became dire. By then it was too late. Meanwhile, Rife was having little progress building Gonin's commissioned microscope due to his recent trip east and other distractions, and Gonin was champing at the bit for a Rife microscope to begin work in his lab. Gonin made an offer to speed things up. There was a young microscope assistant in Rife's employ, 22-year-old Henry Siner. Well versed in Rife's laboratory techniques, microscope operation and bacteriological theory, Siner, a quick study, had been involved with Rife for only a few months prior to Gonin's first visit. Gonin proposed that Siner make preparations to leave for England as soon as possible. He would come to Gonin's lab in Kent and bring with him Rife's number 4 microscope. Gonin would return this borrowed microscope when Rife finished construction and delivery of his own Gonin's number 5 Rife microscope. In the meantime, with the lone number 4 microscope and his new wife in hand, Siner was to move to England to work in Gonin's lab in preparation for Rife's forthcoming visit. Siner was completely enthusiastic about the proposition and they began preparations for his departure. By this time Philip Whelan had deeply immersed himself into Beam Rays Incorporated's affairs. He had always attended their board meetings as a shareholder, owner and technical chief, but on September 6, 1938 he was elected a director of the board with a little help from Hutchinson. The timing of this was perfect. Hoyland was to be on hand in a power position when his packaged crates filled with broken beam ray machines arrived in England. As one of the directors, Hoyland was in a much more privileged position within the company for the ensuing months of heated negotiations or non-negotiations as it were with the British regarding coded frequencies and inoperable machines. It would seem that at this point, in September and October when both Hoyland and Hutchinson sat on the board of directors together, that certain conspiratorial activities began in earnest involving a confederacy between the two. Most of the other people involved with Beam Rays Incorporated including Rife were frozen out of the British deal as Hoyland and Hutchinson dominated. All negotiations amendments, adjustments and such concerning the British contract and most overseas communications with them were filtered by Hoyland and Hutchinson. Now, a new and very complicated element came into play. Hoyland sent a letter to the British as soon as he became a director which stated that the first party of their agreement appeared to be wrongly assumed by the Brits to be Beam Rays Incorporated when in fact it was the owners. On the face of it, this assertion seems to be upside down and illogical, the reason Beam Rays Incorporated had been formed in the first place was to create a first party to manage, manufacture, sell, lease and license the beam ray machine so that the technology could be conveyed to various second parties the British among them. This letter Hoyland sent to Gonin seemed to deny this. The position Hoyland was taking or had begun taking was that Beam Rays Incorporated was merely an intermediary between the two parties in the deal, the owner's first party and the British second party. Because of this, all monies paid by the British respective to the contract should be made payable to Philip Hoyland or other first party owners and not to Beam Rays Incorporated. In a literal way, Hoyland was right. But he was correct only in fact, not in principle. It appears that nowhere in the contract between Beam Rays Incorporated and the owners do the owners confer exclusive licensing rights to Beam Rays Incorporated or any right to sub-license the invention to other companies. It was. However, the intention of everyone involved with the contract to do this, indeed it was the reason the contract was created in the first place, but somehow it wasn't included in the actual final wording. Therefore, according to Hoyland, Beam Rays Incorporated signing a contract with the British that conferred licensing powers was clearly a case of a corporation selling rights that it did not itself possess. The contract between Beam Rays Incorporated and the British seemed to be inapplicable to the deal they were trying to make because the contract between Beam Rays Incorporated and the owners did not actually specify the conveyance of powers that would make such a contract legitimate. The oddity of the situation lies in the fact that the matter of the conveyance of licensing rights from the owners to Beam Rays Incorporated was fully hashed out between all involved parties. Indeed it was one of the most discussed elements of the whole contract negotiation, that and the question of dividing interests and powers within the group. Later, 
the absence of specific wording about licensing in the written contract was explained by confusion brought about by the numerous manifest drafts of the agreement and the unskilled labor that was employed in the legal offices where they were typed out. Also, several other related agreements were being drawn up simultaneously, a tangle of interrelated contracts, so this added to the confusion. During the upcoming trial, everyone, including Hutchinson, testified that in the early summer of 1938, after protracted and detailed discussion on the matter, Beam Rays Incorporated signed a contract with the owners of the Beam Ray machine that conferred exclusive, worldwide licensing rights onto the corporation including the right to sub-license, or at least this was the intention of everyone involved. The omission of that stipulation in the wording of the contract was inadvertent. The only person who disagreed with this position in court was Philip Oyland. He firmly held the position that there were no talks about exclusive licensing rights being given to Beam Rays Incorporated during the course of contract negotiations and such language is absent from the contract because such rights have never been discussed or conferred. Hutchinson of course in court denied any knowledge of the situation prior to Hoyle and having brought it up. He had to take the position the same as everyone else that the license situation was based on an unintentional contractual error. To admit to believing that Beam Rays Incorporated didn't have valid licensing rights was to admit to being in a conspiracy with Hoyland to exploit said situation, not something that Hutchinson was prepared to do on a witness stand. As it stood in the fall, it appears as if Hutchinson did know about this and conspired with Hoyland to marshal the British deal into this new interpretation of the situation, without informing Beam Rays Incorporated. In other words, Hutchinson and Hoyland went behind the back of their own corporation in which they were both sitting on the board to steal the contract out from under the company in favor of the owners. Rife, the third owner, was oblivious to these machinations. He put his complete trust in Hutchinson and Hoyland as managers and facilitators of their shared ownership of the invention and was not in the least suspicious of anything they told him of their affairs with Beam Rays Incorporated or anything they asked him to sign pertaining to those affairs. Thus, a pliable, vulnerable and somewhat inept Dr. Rife allowed himself to be manipulated by people he trusted. By the time he caught on to what was happening, it was too late. With greed being the apparent motivating factor for Hoyland and Hutchinson, it seems as if they were both of the belief that two owners are better than three, if the two are they. Deceitful action was not limited to marginalizing Wright's involvement in the enterprise by keeping him in the dark and using him as a document signing puppet. As time went on and different versions of the Beam Ray machine came out of Hoyland's workshop, it started to become something that was so technically far removed from Wright's original approach that it was from Hoyland's perspective debatable whether or not Wright had a stake in it anymore. Wright's old device was a big, clunky, modular contraption. Hoyland's new machines were smaller, sleeker, and portable. Hoyland combined recent advances in electronics with sophisticated circuit design, more advanced than the old-school circuitry Rife had employed. Further, on Wright's old device the dial settings indicated the frequency of the output signal and the device itself was simply a large, modular frequency generator that provided particularly high power ratings and certain high frequency bandwidths where the MORs resided. Hoyland's new machines took the MOR frequencies and hid them within the circuitry of the machine so that the dial settings would not give the true output frequency but an encoded numeric equivalent. The output signal on Hoyland's machines was generated by an indirect means within the machine, unlike Wright's original device whose output signal was generated directly. In other words, Wright's old machines were designed to mainly present the frequency in question and Hoyland's new machines were designed to mainly hide the frequency in question. This is what was behind the code confabulation with the British. Hoyland's machines were indeed coded to mask the frequencies while delivering them. And this brings us to the final point of difference in the two machine camps. Wright's original machines were high frequency devices. He found that the MRs for most bugs were in the radio range of frequencies, very high. So Wright's frequency instruments were designed to provide maximum power at these higher ranges. Hoyland changed all of that and in doing so he messed with the frequencies. Hoyland's idea was to convert Wright's discovered MOR frequencies by mathematically translating them down to a lower harmonic, like playing the same note on a piano but several octaves lower. 
Hoyland's machines used these harmonics to do the work of hiding the frequency. The result was a whole new set of numbers, a whole new set of frequencies, a whole new set of MORs, a whole new electronic encryption method to scramble these new numbers, a whole new waveform, a whole new power signature fundamentally different than the old one a whole new bandwidth, a whole new approach, a whole new machine. This, from Hoyland's point of view, was what they were dealing with now. This was his invention, and the only thing left to do was to get everyone else to see it this way. So, Hoyland was not only conspiring with Hutchinson in this power gambit against Beam Rays Incorporated using license irregularities in the owner company deal, but he was also simultaneously conspiring with Hutchinson to slowly freeze Rife out of their shared ownership deal. This, at least, is what attorney Bird Compare believed as evidenced by a close examination of their behavior at this time. It is amazing that Hutchinson didn't see it coming, but unbeknownst to him, Hoyland had another bit of underhandedness that he was preparing to unleash, this time on Hutchinson. Apparently Hoyland never told Hutchinson that he believed there was a better proposition than two owners are better than three. It seemed Hoyland's new inspiration was one owner is better than two or three. Hutchinson was about to be eliminated. In order to pull this off, Hoyland would need a patsy. He found one in the person of George Edwards, a director of the board for Beam Rays Incorporated. Hoyland laid the groundwork for his move against Hutchinson by protracted manipulation of George Edwards. Hoyland and Edwards had many meetings at Edwards' house, at restaurants, at the courthouse where Edwards worked as a clerk, all alone and all secretly until of course later when they both had to speak to it at the trial. The topic of their discussion was the horrible disarray in the affairs of Beam Rays Incorporated and what to do about it. Edwards was alarmed by Hoyland's arguments that Hutchinson was to blame for all the problems in the company, that Hutchinson had untangled the corporation in a labyrinth of weird stock transfers that nobody really understood and that were probably illegal, that Hutchinson is a disaster and must be dealt with. It should be noted here that Edwards was not a bright man. He is not a suspicious man. His mind works slowly, is one of the ways Judge Kelly from the Beam Rays trial phrased his condition. This is important only because it shows that it was likely that Hoyland dominated their conversations. It appears that Hoyland was using Edwards for several things. 1. To subvert Hutchinson's position within the board of Beam Rays Incorporated. 2. To set the stage for the presentation of a solution to the problems. 3 to supply rhetoric to Edwards by convincing him of things so that a board member of the company would back up oil and soon to be announced ownership claims on the contract, 4. to help smooth over the strained relations Hoyland was having with the board and stockholders of Beam Rays. Incorporated as a result of the trouble his unstable machines were causing the company as well as the trouble caused by his stalling on the British deal. The Brits had stopped payment on several checks as a result of the train wreck they received in the mail busted beam ray machines and Hoyland's dodgy behavior in response to it. Meanwhile, Hoyland was secretly preparing a legal challenge to Hutchinson in a document that renounced all contracts made with him and all right or title that Hutchinson may have in the beam ray machine as an owner, and in beam rays incorporated as a manager and shareholder based on various grounds to be examined later preparations were being made to kick out Hutchinson by buying him out. Hutchinson suspected nothing. Hoyland's conversations with Edwards were apparently meant to lubricate passage of this motion within the company Hutchinson's company when it was finally presented. But then, on Halloween, just before Hutchinson was to be approached and challenged, Dr. Gonan made a move. A cablegram arrived from England stating this, distress no reply to a recent cable. Can you send representative authorist to act to meet Gonin, New York? November 17th? Reply. When this got no response, like many cables leading up to it, the British then sent this cable on November 3rd, all convinced you do not get our cables or letters. Could you meet me in New York, November 17th with power of attorney to discuss situation? Fear losing funds offered us. Sign Gonin. From Gonin's perspective, he was getting the runaround from Beam Rays Incorporated. He was funding the microscope deal and his arrangement with Rife out of his own pocket, but for the Beam Rays deal there were investors. Gonan was having trouble stalling these men, 
unable to show them a working investment and afraid they would feel he had led them and their money into a con, he wanted a meeting with Beam Rays Incorporated to resolve all the troubles and uncertainties. There were amendments to their contract with Beam Rays Incorporated that Gonan wanted to discuss and to sign. He also wanted answers to the technical questions that plagued them ever since receiving the broken Beam Ray machines. When retrospectively observing the machinations of Philip Hoyland during this time like we are doing here it is difficult to determine exactly what Hoyland's endgame was with respect to his activities with the British. Did he wait for a situation to develop, or did he engineer the situation's development? Did he, by being unresponsive to important cables at a critical time, force Gonan to call a meeting in New York, or did Gonan's call for a meeting in New York upset plans that he already had in motion? It is difficult to say. As it was, Hoyland and Hutchinson would meet Gonan in New York as owners and convince him to make all checks payable to them as individuals and owners instead of Beam Rays Incorporated. The Company The malfunctioning owner's Beam Rays deal was basically a contract that Hutchinson signed with himself. His interpretation of what was truly represented in the arrangement would be the most credible. With Hutchinson at his side, Hoyland had someone with him who was sympathetic to the idea of sneakily reinterpreting the British deal in light of his hitherto reinterpretation of the owner-company deal. Together, Hoyland and Hutchinson would carry the argument better than any one of them singly. They would tell Gonan he is making incorrect assumptions regarding the nature of the Beam Ray's owner contract and is therefore confused about who gets the checks in the Beam Ray's British contract. It appears their plan was to baffle Gonan with Blarney. It was perfect for Hoyland to have Hutchinson there in New York in a simple matter to forestall his planned blindside attack on him until a more opportune time. Both of them resigned from the board at the beginning of November, just days after receiving Gonan's final plea to meet on the 17th. There is a document signed by the remaining board that gives Hoyland and Hutchinson the power to speak for the company at the New York meeting in light of their new non-director status. It is certain that Hoyland leaned on his puppet George Edwards to help sell this very suspicious-looking arrangement to the rest of the board so as to be able to extract a signed power of attorney deferral out of them. Having signed such a document implies the board accepted whatever explanation was provided which justified two board members quitting just prior to crossing the country to represent the board they just resigned from. They both testified that at their meeting in New York, Gonan never asked to see the power of attorney document which implies they didn't tell him that they were no longer on the board. This would further enhance their position because Gonan would perceive their interpretation of the contracts as endorsed by Beam Rays Incorporated indeed as originating from the company. Hoyland and Hutchinson returned from New York having successfully caught Gonan out of several thousand dollars in checks. This was money still owed from previous stop payments new checks made out to owners Philip Hoyland and Sierra Hutchinson. However it wasn't long before Gonan, after conference with his investors upon his return to England, immediately put a stop payment order on these new checks and sent this cable, without prejudice must not pay checks since payment under original contract is to company not individuals. The reasoning that Hoyland and Hutchinson used to convince Gonan of their rights as owners regarding the contract between Beam Rays Incorporated and the British did not convince Gonan's legal counsel back in England. The invalid checks to the owners were stopped. To replace the cancelled checks, Gonan made out corresponding checks to Beam Rays Incorporated and immediately sent them. In light of Gonan's apparent rejection of this attempt to insert the owners as a first party entity into the British contract with Beam Rays Incorporated, Philip Hoyland reverted back to his former multi-tiered plot, get rid of Hutchinson, get rid of Beam Rays Incorporated marginalist rife. To do this, it appears that Hoyland had a new element laying in wait. To lubricate the landscape for the introduction of this new element into the affairs of Beam Rays Incorporated, Hoyland utilized George Edwards. Hoyland's plan for bringing this new element into play was to have it appear as if said introduction was not Hoyland's idea, but Edwards. Unimagined conversation based on the admitted details and dynamics of the situation Hoyland, George, if there was only something we could do to get this wonderful cure away from the clutches of Hutchinson and safely back to the original plan introduced by dear Dr. Rife, a sympathetic group dedicated to putting the machine into as many clinics as possible and with the know-how and ability to do it. Edwards, I agree. That's what's needed. Hoyland, OK George, 
Since you think we need to find another group that can handle this task, do you happen to know anybody up to the job? Edwards, no. Do you? Hoyland, I may know somebody who might be up to this job that you say needs to be done. There are some friends of mine from Los Angeles. This kind of thing might be right up their alley. Do you think I should contact them and see if they are interested in your proposal? Edwards, absolutely. And so that or something like it is how Philip Oyland introduced the mysterious Khan brothers into this affair. Recall that these Khan brothers or Mr. Khan, or just Khan, are alleged to be, according to Ben Cullen's repeated testimony and interview, not at the trial, agents of Morris Fishbein, supreme dictator of the American Medical Association. Recall also that this is an allegation that stands alone it has never been alleged by anyone other than Cullen and has never been proven. Cullen gave eyewitness testimony to Philip Oyland's admission that he was bribed by Khan with $10,000 to scuttle the whole beam rays operation. Cullen said this admission took place afterward, when the smoke had cleared from the trial, adding that Hoyland was very sorry and wished to God he'd never accepted it. It should be noted that even if it is true that Khan bribed Hoyland with $10,000 to scuttle Beam Rays Incorporated, this in no way proves or even implies an AMA connection to Khan, that he or they were working as an agency of the AMA. Leaving aside the specter of the AMA for a moment we will be back, the question does remain that if Hoyland truly did receive a bribe from Khan, then when did it happen? Did Hoyland meet Khan like he says around the same time that he prompted George Edwards to ask for their introduction or, was it several months prior, before Hoyland created and shipped four suspiciously inoperative machines to England? Or, might it have been even before that? What little Hoyland says of Khan appears to be deliberately vague, in early December he indicated to George Edwards that at that time the Khans were friends. On the other hand, Hutchinson indicates in his deposition an early acquaintance between Hoyland and Khan going back to the inception of Beam Rays Incorporated in the spring. He characterizes this acquaintance as a conspiracy which culminated when Hoyland sought an opportunity to make a more favorable agreement with said Khan and others for the right to manufacture and distribute the Rife Ray machine. The general testimony among most participants was that Khan was there with $100,000 to inject into the enterprise and a business plan that put Beam Rays Incorporated to shame. In effect Khan wanted to buy out Beam Rays Incorporated and take over completely with a new contract with whatever owners were still standing when the dust settled e. Philip Oyland. Khan was Philip Oyland's attempt at a coup to eliminate all obstacles to maximum profits in one fell swoop, Rife, Hutchinson and Beam Rays Incorporated. In mid-December the Kong brothers were presumably waiting in Los Angeles for Philip Oylin to soften up George Edwards in preparation for their introduction to Beam Rays Incorporated. Their arrival in San Diego was preceded by the arrival of another character who is identified by Ben Cullen of being yet another agent of the AMA, one Aaron Sapiro, a high-priced and famous Los Angeles attorney. Sapiro came with a colorful bio. At the time he was officially retained by Philip Oyland on December 20, 1938, Sapiro was languishing in the twilight of his highly controversial career. Sapiro came to the Beam Rays trial as the famous lawyer. More than a decade previous he successfully sued Henry Ford yes, that Henry Ford on charges of defamation and libel in a widely publicist show trial, Sapiro vs. Ford. Industrialist Henry Ford believed that the infamous track The Protocols of the Elders of Zion was a true statement authored by agents of an international Zionist conspiracy. He also believed that this conspiracy had infiltrated and was infiltrating into the echelons of power in all sectors of society. Ford used his small holdings in the publishing industry to print long indictments speaking out against this perceived threat, promoting the notion that the protocols speak to an actual conspiracy and group. Detailed within these articles were the activities of one Aaron Sapiro, proclaiming him to be a change agent provocateur whose work was on behalf of this Jewish conspiracy. Sapiro had been active in many parts of the United States and Canada promoting and organizing farming collectives to help small farms unify in the face of encroaching governmental regulations. Ford saw this as communism, and he saw communism as merely a political control matrix wielded by the international Jewish threat. Ford published his opinions on this matter, or rather, he had his opinions published. 
This was a big mistake for Ford because Sapir was not the kind of guy to just let that go. He came back at Henry Ford with a $1 million libel lawsuit. Ford had gone too far and was about to become the world's most famous anti-Semite. Henry Ford sued in $1 million libel suit makes an enduring headline. By the time Sapira was finished with him, Ford was forced to retract all of his crazy talk about Jewish conspiracies and apologize in print to all Jews everywhere for being such an offensive fool. Five years after this affair, Aaron Sapira was himself indicted on racketeering charges, busted while working for Al Capone and the infamous Chicago Racket in 1929. His subsequent connections to Meyer Lansky and the nefarious group known as Murder Incorporated of the so-called Jewish Mafia finally got him disbarred in New York State and put him on the FBI watch list. He was still under suspicion and possibly also under surveillance when Hoyland came knocking. At that time he was languishing in Los Angeles as an entertainment lawyer with clients such as composer Igor Stravinsky and actor John Barrymore. Though not in his prime, Sapiro did not come cheap. Most people, including the judge in the imminent trial, wondered how Hoyland could afford such an expensive attorney as Aaron Sapiro. Back to San Diego in December of 1938, Hoyland and Hutchinson returned from their New York meeting with personal checks obtained through the bizarre contractual rejuxtaposition of their first party status as owners within the British Beam Rays Incorporated contract. It is impossible to know what endgame either of them had in mind with regard to how all of this was going to play out when they returned to San Diego. Wouldn't personal checks instead of company checks raise some questions from the board of directors? The whole situation is confused by lies told in the retelling. Hutchinson denies ever talking about, knowing about, or even thinking about the idea that Beam Rays Incorporated, his company, did not have a worldwide exclusive license on the machine. But Hutchinson, also an owner of the machine, is the guy who signed a contract with himself containing the significant omission that set up the situation. Hoyland testifies that Hutchinson was constantly talking about his plans to license the machines to other manufacturers to compete with Beam Rays Incorporated, thereby implying that he knew and believed that the company didn't have an exclusive license. It is possible that both of them were lying for their own reasons and that their lies cancel each other out. Hoyland might be lying about what he knew of Hutchinson's knowledge and Hutchinson might be lying about his own knowledge. In other words, Hoyland may be lying, but that doesn't mean Hutchinson was not doing what Hoyland disingenuously said he did, and himself lying about it. This looks to be the case, with the caveat that Hoyland's lies were probably closer to the truth. When they returned, there was no inquisition. The board appears to have been asleep at the wheel. It is unclear what anybody was doing at the time with the exception of George Edwards. Already a director of the board, he was also recently elected secretary. As well as being under Hoyland's influence, Edwards was reportedly also under Hutchinson's domination. The only reason he was there to begin with was because Hutchinson brought him in. Edwards was one of Hutchinson's investors who joined the company when he supplied Hutchinson with cash in exchange for stock and title. Since such transfers of stock must be registered with and approved by the Corporate Securities Commissioner and since that process takes time and money he didn't have, Hutchinson found another way around the situation. There was provision in his title that he could give away portions of his own stock as a gift. So he gave Edwards a gift in the form of a large chunk of stock in his company. And Edwards gave Hutchinson a gift of a roll of bills. Edwards was then elected to the board of directors. Then he was elected secretary. Hutchinson performed this stock transfer gift maneuver with several people, most of whom were currently sitting on the board, or had so in the past. In mid-December then, after the return from New York, after the British cancelled their checks to the owners, and after constant cables from Gonan trying to get straight answers on the situation, Hoyland was again conferring with Edwards to find fault with Hutchinson and blame him for all the current woes of the company. It was suggested that Hoyland should engage the help of some friends in Los Angeles who may be interested in helping to reorganize the company should they successfully oust Hutchinson. In response to this, Hoyland brought Aaron Sapiro to meet George Edwards. Sapiro would drive home the nails that Hoyland had set to prepare the way for the Kahn brothers. They met in an empty courtroom at the courthouse where Edwards worked as a clerk. 
it may have been the very courtroom where the beam race trial would take place. Edwards, the secretary of the board, brought the ledgers and minutes from all past board meetings of Beam Rays Incorporated. Sapiro was presented as Hoyland's new attorney. The three of them talked for hours about the problems in the company. Sapiro then sat down with the company's books and for several more hours examined all the previous affairs of Beam Rays Incorporated their contracts, their stock records, the minutes from all meetings going back several years prior to Beam Rays Incorporated back into the history and development of UPI and Collins Aero Reserve School, the fledgling companies that gave birth to the present form. After his inspection of the book Sapiro reported finding many improprieties, irregularities and what looked like outright illegal maneuvers within the company's current and previous business affairs. Upon hearing Sapiro's conclusions, Edwards panicked. He said he had no idea the company was doing anything illegal and wished to resign immediately. As mentioned above, Edwards was apparently not a bright man. The wilting putty he became in the hands of these two characters evidences this. Sapiro advised him not to leave but to stay and help put things right in the company. The attorney offered a plan. He would go to the corporate commissioner's office in Los Angeles with Philip Oyland and cross-reference Hutchinson's suspected stock improprieties against the official record. Assuming they would find the expected evidence of illegality, they wanted to formally present the case against Hutchinson to the board of Beam Rays Incorporated as soon as possible. Edwards agreed to gather such a meeting. Also, Sapiro wanted to meet Rife and talk with him about his position as an owner in this situation the following week they convened an informal meeting at Rife's laboratory. Rife was there of course, as were Ben Cullen and a few shareholders in the company. The only person present from the board was George Edwards. The rest of the board of directors and Hutchinson were conspicuously absent. They didn't know this meeting was taking place and everyone at the meeting knew they didn't know this was to be a conspiracy against them. Hoyland had brought his attorney Sapiro to lay out his position to the others. They had brought the Kahn brothers with them. After the litany of problems in the company was revealed, the Kahn brothers would be offered as a solution. The meeting began with Sapiro reporting on their findings at the corporate commissioner's office in Los Angeles. It looked indeed like Hutchinson's stock transfers within the company were illegal. Sapiro laid out the case against Hutchinson. In the end, the message delivered was, everybody is in trouble because Hutchinson has involved the company in illegal activities. Now that you are aware of it, if you don't do something about it immediately then you are a criminal. The case laid before him was news to Rife. Rife trusted Hutchinson to manage the company and he trusted Hoyland to make sure that he did it honestly and with alacrity. Rife didn't want anything to do with business so all he had was his faith that he made the right decision when he handed it over to Hutchinson and Hoyland. Hoyland was now saying they both had been conned, that Hutchinson's behavior in the company was predatory, abusive and criminal. Rife was shocked by this news and immediately sided with Sapiro and Hoyland in condemnation of Hutchinson. As for George Edwards, horrified and embarrassed to hear that his presence in the company was a product of Hutchinson's criminal business practice, he repeated his offer to quit. Again he was assured by Sapiro that the best move was to stay and help with the dissolution of Beam Rays Incorporated. Sapiro argued that Hutchinson had involved the company in too many improper activities and irreparably problematic contracts. It appeared as if the British group were preparing litigation against Beam Rays Incorporated. The only way to deal with this, argued Sapiro, was to dissolve all legal association with Hutchinson followed by dissolution of the company. Then, a new corporation would be formed. Contracts with the owners minus Hutchinson and the British would be renegotiated. The spin on this plan as Sapiro presented it was, if you don't do exactly as I tell you and implement this plan to the letter, then you are a criminal. With that, the Kahn brothers were presented as the new corporation along with a detailed plan for transferring the business of Beam Rays Incorporated into their own. Ben Cullen reported in his interview that the president of the Kahn Realty Company tried to buy into Beam Rays Incorporated. That may have been a misinterpretation because, as delineated in the subsequent paperwork most of which was preserved as exhibits in the trial, clearly, Kahn did not try to buy into the company but instead intended to outright buy the company. 
Part of the Con restructuring plan included paying off Hutchinson as well as settling any consideration due on all interests affected by the takeover. To the Con Corporation would be deferred all licenses, rights and contracts formally intended for Beam Rays Incorporated. To this arrangement, they also introduced the sum of $100,000 as the amount they would invest in the new company to jumpstart its stock portfolio. What did everybody think about this? Rife, bristling from the suggestion that he might be involved in illegal activities was willing to do anything to correct the situation. His position was, whatever you think is necessary to fix this, I'll support it, apparently unaware that he was again making the same mistake that he made with Hutchinson in the first place. It appears that the Kahn brothers were not in this for Hoyland's benefit but for their own. From their perspective, getting rid of Rife was insanity. They didn't want to marginalize him as was Hoyland's approach. It is evident that Kahn saw Rife as a gold mine and sought to exploit him. Sapiro's strategy put Rife right on their side. It appears that nobody wanted to disagree with Rife. Edwards was in an awkward position as the man who would facilitate the demise of his company. His job was to go to the remaining board of directors and prepare them for a special board meeting with Sapiro wherein the attorney would inform them of what was expected of them as a response to current events. Sapiro Hoyland Rife would draw up a legal document, addressed to Hutchinson, that would be provided to the board. The board would deliver the challenge to Hutchinson. The document would serve notice to Hutchinson of the intent to oust him, the reasons for it, and the demands upon him to facilitate his own ouster. It was Edward's job to make all of this happen smoothly. It was Ben Cullen's job to just stand there with his mouth shut while strangers from Los Angeles invaded Rife's laboratory and quietly explained to everyone in the most pernicious way that they were taking over. Cullen wasn't buying it, but he didn't say so at first. There was the implicate understanding through all of this that Sapiro was acting as Hoyland's attorney. This notion was supported at the end of their initial laboratory meeting when Sapiro brought up the question of his compensation. In retrospect this appears like a deliberate ploy by Sapiro to set up the situation where he could act with their sanction as their collective attorney while not being officially named as such. This distinction would be important later. Everyone knew Sapiro was a high-priced famous Jewish lawyer from Los Angeles and they were probably all quietly wondering how Hoyland could afford him. They themselves wanted no part of an invoice for this meeting or responsibility for the legal paperwork Sapiro proposed to generate on their behalf. It was finally agreed that Sapiro was working as Hoyland's attorney to manage his interests in the machine and in Beam Rays Incorporated and as such he was acting as an agent but not lawyer for the corporation on Hoyland's behalf. However, the corporation would pay him for his related work on their behalf only if in the end his plan and all his labors and service of it came to fruition. In other words, Sapiro got them to agree to pay him to manage the demise of their company but only if they were successfully destroyed in the process and only if he was not considered their lawyer while he was doing it. The effectiveness of Aaron Sapiro's shock and awe performance at that initial meeting in Rife's laboratory was immediate. Everybody was ostensibly on board for what must happen next, get the board of directors behind the plan for a broadside surprise attack on C.R. Hutchinson. They were at least momentarily convinced by Sapiro's spin that to N.O.T. eviscerate Hutchinson would be illegal. But in the days after the laboratory meeting, doubt began to set in. Cullen was dubious about Hoyland's part in all of this and saw the company's troubles stemming mostly from the engineer's faulty machines and his inexplicable behavior toward the British. The positioning to demonize Hutchinson looked to Cullen like a diversionary ploy. George Edwards was having trouble with the idea that he was required to deliver to his friend, C.R. Hutchinson, a Shakespearean denunciation and devastating betrayal of loyalty. He had to also convince the remaining board of directors that they should take Sapiro's advice and slit their own throats while stabbing their manager in the back. Tempering Edwards' trepidation were the constant assurances by Sapiro that the secretary director was a victim of Hutchinson's greed, that indeed the whole enterprise had been corrupted by their manager's illegal activities. According to Sapiro, they were all victims. Then, as if in a further effort to quell any swelling doubt, Khan went into action. There was a week of whining and dining. The benefits of a new corporation were dangled. Cash flowed. There was a lot of talk. 
the perils of not going along with the plan were emphasized. Ray Williams, John Ernsting, Ray Reynolds, and Charles Winter, the standing board of directors of Beam Rays Incorporated, were suitably informed by Edwards of the situation so that when they finally sat with Sapiro and Hoyland on January 5, 1939, everybody in the room knew what was going on and why they were there absent their manager. For their benefit Sapiro again laid out the plan with emphasis on the consequences of not following it. It was back to the demonization of Hutchinson in an attempt to get the plan on track and the board online with it. According to Sapiro's audit of the company's books, the entire enterprise was illegal and must be fixed. Then out came the document that the board was to present to Hutchinson. This was a several-page indictment against Hutchinson and a list of demands that included his resignation and the complete reversal of all that he had done in the company. Included was an outline of the new corporation proposed by Kahn and the procedural list of all Hutchinson must do to help implement it. The document seems to be an expanded version of what Hoyland was going to present to Hutchinson in early November, before its presentation was postponed by their trip to New York to meet Gonin. It was also clearly a blueprint for the termination of Beam Rays Incorporated. The board of directors, seeing the plan set before them and now fully aware of the extent of Hoyland's intentions and the implications thereof, told Sapiro Hoyland the obvious, Hutchinson will never agree with, or sign, this document, ever. Sapiro told them that he knew it would be tough. Hutchinson wouldn't just roll over, he needed to be prodded. It was the board's job, being victims of Hutchinson's stock shenanigans, to do the prodding. Four days later the letter to Hutchinson was delivered. Then, a new development surfaced. Recently, the British doctors declared that they had been forced into the position where they must sue Beam Rays Incorporated because of the outright breaches of their deal and the company's steadfast refusal to correct the matter, all incidentally Hoyland's doing. Incredibly, as the overseas deal disintegrated, the company allowed Hoyland to conduct their faltering affairs with the British through Sapiro. Sapiro was directly counseling on the British question and his advice was that if they kept Hutchinson and his company intact then the British had a good chance at successful litigation, however if they all just followed the plan then drive Gonan would see reason, forget all about this lawsuit nonsense, and renegotiate a new contract with the new corporation as per the plan. The British were saying that Beam Rays Incorporated hadn't kept up their end of the bargain. All along Hoyland sought to convince everyone that this was untrue as far as technical matters were concerned. He believed the British were stalling for time so as to delay payments and argued that their company was not in breach on the technical matters that Gonan was complaining about. But now, a new development had arisen from the smoking ruins of the British deal. This development complicated the implementation of Sapiro's plan, indeed it threatened to upset it entirely. Gonan has sent a new contract in a last-ditch effort to avoid proceeding with a threatened lawsuit against Beam Ray Incorporated. Because the company appeared to be unwilling to honor their previous contract and unwilling to coherently discuss why, then a new contract was dispatched addressing all previous concerns in the form of amendments to the old contract. This was to be signed and honored by Beam Ray Incorporated and then they could continue doing business as if all the unpleasantness hadn't happened. Gonan was supremely embarrassed by all of this upset because of the other side of the coin, his microscope deal with the Rife. By now, Henry Siner and his wife were settling into life in England. He had arrived with Rife's number 4 microscope, on loan to Gonan until Rife finished manufacturing his own scope the number 5. Gonan and Siner were working together every day tooling up the British doctor's new lab in preparation for Rife's imminent arrival. Gonan had to juggle his exhilaration with Rife and Siner against his exasperation with Beam Rays Incorporated and Philip Oyland. In sending his new proposal when he did, Gonan probably didn't know how perfect his timing was for upsetting Aaron Sapiro's plan to smoothly replace one company with another back in San Diego. Gonan gave those who doubted Hoyland something to latch onto as an alternative to self-destruction. As it was, a new contract had arrived from England that promised to solve most problems in the company. Wouldn't it be better to sign the deal to avoid a lawsuit rather than commit suicide to manage a lawsuit? Sapiro was adamant that they not sign the new British deal. Hoyland was adamant that they not sign the new British deal. 
everybody else wanted to sign the new British deal. This was a problem for those supporting the plan. It is difficult to know what Hoyland's true position was on the British deal. Were all the problems accidental, or were they by design? Did he, as attorney Bird Comparat describes it, sabotage the machines he sent to England, or were the broken machines just an accidental mistake? Was all the confusion about coded frequencies a deliberate ploy, or was it Hoyland strictly and perhaps unfairly adhering to the letter of the agreement? Was Hoyland deliberately trying to compel the British to sue them so the threatened lawsuit could appear to be the legitimate impetus for his action against Beam Ray Incorporated and Hutchinson, or not? It is possible that Hoyland was planning to compel Gonan to sue them for a while, maybe right back to before he shipped the broken machines to England. This might have been Hoyland's endgame all along. His reasoning behind this alleged sabotage may have involved Gonan it may not have. Exactly when they became involved is unknown. We have reason to doubt the accuracy of Hoyland's version of these events which implies a Hoyland Con association just prior to the middle of December, but we also have reason to doubt Hutchinson's version which specifies a Hoyland Con association as far back as April. They are both demonstrably liars especially on matters of suspected conspiracy. Con may have had nothing to do with Hoyland back at the beginning, instead, the engineer's own greed may have been behind the disaster the British deal had become. He may have seen a way he could manipulate the British situation so as to personally get a better deal in the end. As it was in January of 1939, impending British litigation was the perfect catalyst for Hoyland's takeover bid. The scrambled affairs of their company urgently needed to be sorted out to properly deal with the British suit. Now it looked like the British situation might work itself out if everybody behaved reasonably. But Hoyland was having none of that so it was time for a tantrum. He argued, regardless of the situation with the British contract not because of it Hutchinson must be eliminated. Because of a supposed illegal stock activity the company's very existence was rooted in confusion, deception and unfairness. Hutchinson must be dealt with and the company restructured. Sapiro, tag-teamed with Hoyland, argued that signing under Doris a new and, for them, bad British deal would solve nothing while remaining embroiled in Hutchinson's other bad business. Hoyland warned that if they didn't act immediately against Hutchinson he was going to sue them. He was going to hit the company hard if Hutchinson didn't sign off on his demands. The company reiterated that Hutchinson would never concede the things outlined in Hoyland's demands and would therefore never sign the document. With that, Sapiro suggested that they all, individually and simultaneously, file lawsuits against Hutchinson. If all shareholders, executive officers, directors, and owners teamed up for a collective assault, then Hutchinson would just want to run. Sapiro argued that doing this would compel Hutchinson to sign the document and adhere to the order for his dismissal. Hoyland demanded and Sapiro advised that they all get legal counsel so they may proceed with this strategy. Then, Colin and Edwards and others began to denounce the beloved plan. None of them were going to follow Sapiro's advice to collectively sue Hutchinson. The whole thing was looking more and more like a naked bid for power by Hoyland. This is when Hoyland, sensing a mounting stall, decided to stay true to his word. Sapiro drew up documents that Hoyland delivered to the board of Beam Rays Incorporated that essentially said if you do not denounce Hutchinson and then dissolve the company so as to allow for its restructuring in the face of this impending British litigation, then, as an owner of the invention and shareholder in the company, I will sue you for mismanaging my affairs. This document, which also dissolves Hutchinson's ownership claim on the machine, became known as Exhibit C in the trial. This was mailed to the board on January 13, 1939. Aaron Sapiro because he was involved in these events, was required to give a deposition for the upcoming Beam Rays trial. In that deposition he describes what happened immediately after Hoyland's letter was delivered to the board. Sapiro's deposition that thereafter, about January 16, 1939 Sapiro met with four defendants, 
as the board of defendant corporation after Hoyland had mailed to them on January 13, 1939. The notice attached to the complaint is Exhibit C and Sapiro then explained the said notice to the said directors and advised them expressly to retain to counsel because he had been instructed by Hoyland to start legal action against them and the defendant corporation if they failed to act properly thereon and Sapir answered many questions from the said defendant directors thereon and told them in detail the kind of action that would be filed against them if they failed to follow in substance the legal demands that had been made upon them, and Sapiro prepared an answer to the threatening cable which had been received from the British lawyers and sent it over to Edwards for his use as secretary of the corporation, and throughout all the discussions there was not one word to suggest that all the defendants present did not know that Sapiro represented Hoyland and had prepared the very notice which had been sent to them, Exhibit C of the complaint. Beam Ray Incorporated, who by now were all individually and collectively sick of Hoyland, Sapiro and Khan, decided to ignore them. It was concluded that this was Hoyland's game and if he really wanted to play then it was up to him to make the next move. Hutchinson was also ignoring Hoyland and his gang. They got no response to their demands. Unable to take being ignored for more than a few days, a sanctimonious Philip Oilen officially filed his lawsuit. Finally then, Beam Rays Incorporated engaged its attorney, Eugene Glenn, who prepared to answer Hoyland's litigation. Hoyland gave them about a week before he filed a complaint regarding the company's choice of lawyer. With Sapiro arguing for him, Hoyland charged that attorney Glenn be disqualified as Beam Rays lawyer. Apparently Glenn had an attorney for Beam Rays Incorporated while Hoyland was a director and was thus subject to a conflict of interest. Hoyland charged that retaining Glenn as counsel gave the company an unfair advantage in the suit. Judge Mundo of the Superior Court of Southern California agreed. Beam Rays Incorporated was ordered to find a different attorney to handle the case for them. This is when trial lawyer Bertrand L. Comparat entered the story. To be continued next. Deconstructing the Beam Rays trial, searching for the AMA copyright 2007 Sean Montgomery is a freelance writer, researcher and producer. His video documentary series The Rise and Fall of a Scientific Genius, The Forgotten Story of Royal Raymond Rife can be found at www.zerosmartwa.org. All information posted on this website is the opinion of the author and is provided for educational purposes only. It is not to be construed as medical advice. Only a licensed medical doctor can legally offer medical advice in the United States. Consult the healer of your choice for medical care and advice. The end thank you for listening.